What is up, guys, and welcome to Stop One here in Bakersfield, California, of the LZ World Tour. We're going all around the world once again with the biggest names in automotive, from content creators to pro drivers to Grammy Award winners. We've got them all this weekend. We're here in this beautiful facility. My name is Dave from Drift Games. I'm joined by my good friend Jacob here. We're going to be talking you through all of the action, and the action is going to come thick and fast, Jacob, because this track is technical, fast, and we got a bunch of drivers that want to take home the whole, the first set of skate boards from LZ this year. That's, that's what it's all about. It's about the skateboards, really. That's why we're all here. We're all here to, we got to get those skateboards in. But this list is incredible. We have horsepowers ranging from 300 to nearly 1,000. We have pro-level drivers. We got up-and-comers. We've got the whole gambit. It's it's insane that we were able to just get everybody in one spot together at the same time. And it wouldn't happen anywhere else in the world no. because these guys are all different, varying experiences. I'd say pro-level to amateur level. Builds that shouldn't work, but sometimes do work. We got it all here this week for your entertainment. And you know what? I'm excited because it's the first big event of the year. And a lot of guys from Formula Drift shaking down their builds this weekend as well, alongside some of our favorite content creators. You guys will know them as we get through it. And today is all about that build-up to the main event tomorrow. Today we go to qualifying, then we go to the last chance top 16. And how that works? Well, it's simple. The top 13 drivers who score in qualifying go automatically through to the main event top 16, leaving three remaining spaces where we have another last chance top 16 today, and the three guys or girls that hit the podium get back in the mix. That's why we call it the last chance top 16. The drivers have been practicing over the last two days, a lot of dialing in, getting used to this track. It's a custom circuit. It's never been run by anybody before, so it's all fresh. It's all even playing field, and thanks to tire streets, everybody's on the same tire as well. So it's a really unique event. You guys are going to absolutely love it. It's going to be a lot of fun from here on out. So I guess Jacob and I will get ready for qualifying. Stop the talking, start the driving, because here we go. Well, we're about to head to qualifying here. And you know what? I'm excited because we don't know what's going to happen from this point on, Jacob. It's going to be an interesting one. And what's interesting also is I'm double jobbing. I'm not only doing announcing with you, and you're going to be lead announcer this weekend, which I'm really excited about. Moving up. I'm going to also be judging as well. So what we thought, because it's a fun event. Yeah. I'm going to do a little bit of judging alongside my good friend, Sean and Jason, beside me. And we're going to be talking to you guys through, if you're new to the sport, if you're not a, you know, an avid drift fan, we're going to give you guys a little bit of an insight on how the judging works, how we think, how our thought processes go. Because it's a more relaxed event, it's all about fun. Even though it's a competitive event, these guys are here to have a good time. Here to party. Everyone in attendance is here to party. That's what it's all about. Jacob, I'm excited for this because we don't know who's going to... We're going to see some surprises here because yeah. we're going to see guys that we wouldn't expect to be high up the mix, maybe up there. Some big names from Formula Drift here that are sometimes in a practice car, kind of taking this not so seriously, but then they don't know how to turn it off either. They're going to want to put a good score on the board. Well, and we, we saw it in qualifying. I mean, first of all, there are a bunch of drivers here who didn't roll in until today, so they missed practice yesterday. And a lot of those were the FD drivers. So a lot of these guys, you know, that uh, maybe don't have as much experience as the FD level guys, they're, you know, they're, they've got more practice time and they put in more laps. And we did see a lot of drivers struggle to adapt to this layout. Not that it is an incredibly difficult layout, but it is different. We, we've got elevation changes. We have banking in some strange areas. We've got slowdowns and speed ups and, and different radiuses in these two turns. So it's, it's interesting. It's a very equalization type of track. Yeah, everyone's new to the track. Everyone's got the same tire. So this has never really happened in drifting before. And again, the beauty of an LZ World Tour event is you get to experiment with things just because it's fun. Let's see how it goes. Let's have a judge be the announcer. Let's have everybody on the same tires. Let's have you know interesting initiations. Let's have some banking where there shouldn't be banking. And this track is pretty challenging. It's technical. It, you know, um, By many, it's a, like a figure eight, right? But the initiation is a little bit different. We've put some lines on the track there where the lead car should be above. Everybody's got to be very fluid. That's what we're looking for as judges. We want that lead car, which is when we get to the tandem battles. That's why we do qualifying, by the way. It's not just for getting people in their grid positions, which it is. But it's also to show us who are the best lead drivers. Who are the guys that are going to go out there, be fluid, put the car exactly where we want them to be. And then the chase car has every opportunity to put on an exciting show in the chase position. And then a lot of people forget why we do qualifying. That's why. We want to find the best lead drivers so we can put them in against guys that are maybe struggling a little bit, giving them a better show from the start that they have a very good lead driver to follow. And then, of course, as we go through the competition, we're going to see guys stack up that are equally good, and then it's getting really exciting. So we're on this track, we've got eight zones. They're all those little white boxes towards the edge of the track. You guys are going to see them. They're pretty obvious. They're all outer zones, so everything is on the outer. We want to see rear wheels through those outer white boxes. You can see here on your screens, 
Dylan Hughes doing a great job in practice of just being fluid throughout the whole course. We don't want to see people checking up too much. Look at that, right to the edge of the circuit, running those rear wheels on that white line. And that's kind of going to get you up in the high 80s or 90s if you do that perfect outer line. What's going to get you from 90 to 100? Well, that's a bit of flair. That's just putting on a bit of a show, coming in with bigger angle, taking a bit of a risk that you may go off the track, but you pull it off. So what we're going to expect here is a lot of these guys and girls to go out there and do a pretty safe, solid first run. And then the second run, they're going to know where they're stacking up. So if you get a 90 on your first run, you can go out there and do whatever you want on the second because you know that's going to be enough for a top 13 position. And that, again, is the reminder. 13 positions go straight to the main event. The remaining three podium finishers from our last chance, top 16 later today, will be the ones going back in the mix. So, it's, again, you get a second chance. Even if you lose, you can still you know, get back in the mix. If you, even if you lose third place in the mm -hmm. final, you're still in the game tomorrow. You can still win it. Well, and there's a bit of a benefit, too, to that, that bracket. You're going to get more seat time. You're going to get more tandem time you're going to have more experience on the tires as well so you're going to you're going to kind of get all of that knowledge and then obviously you have to get to the top three to make it into the next day but if you do that you now have all this experience that you're going to go and take into the next set of battles with guys that are, that are kind of sitting cold for a good portion of the weekend yeah and of course the guys that are going to get through in that top 13 are going to sit and watch the competition and those guys you say get more battle practice yeah. they're going to start getting a little nervous how everybody good everyone's getting towards those podium positions later today and that's what makes this event so fun is that everybody gets an equal opportunity, everyone gets an equal chance, and from a judging perspective, we're a little bit more relaxed. We still want to judge it as accurately as we can to give fair scores. We're also going to let you guys know how the judging process works, because at the top level, whether it's Formula Drift, whether it's Drift Masters, Formula Drift Japan, it's very technical. These guys take it super serious, so you've got to be super serious in your judging. Here, we're going to have some fun with you guys. This is what this event is all about. It's a showcase for the sport from the top to the bottom of experience, and the same with the bills. This is just mixing it all up. This is pressing the random button on your character selection on Street Fighter over and over again and then just fighting it out and seeing who wins. I well, love it. It's, it's, like, it's almost like Forza where you've downloaded all of the characters and you put them in and you're like, all right, let's just, you're going to see what happens. You get the, you know, the ultra rare unlocked T-Pain and now you're, you're going to put them up against an Adam LZ or whoever, a TJ Hunt. And it's, that's the craziest part about this event is like, it's just fantasy battles, all of it. It's, it's what ifs, right? The entire weekend is just what ifs. And it's also headlines because you sit yeah. there and you go, T-Pain is driving in his first ever competition. Hurt is driving in a Pontiac GTO for he, some reason. He stepped in for the first time today. Exactly. We got guys full FD level cars and yeah. some of them in their practice cars. We got guys in street cars that can still road legally drive around everywhere, but they're now here in competition. We got guys who might be the mechanic of the pro driver now taking place, you know, taking his part in the event, which is even more fun to watch. And it gives everybody a great showcase for the sport of how you can do it from the bottom to the top, big money to small money, big experience to less experience, and mix it all up together. So that's why the track doesn't run the big bank here because because then that's all seven, 800 horsepower cars. Not everyone has that. This is all about technicality. And we've watched stock 370Zs push around Formula Drift 370Zs in practice, which I absolutely love. It's a real equalizer. So I'm excited. We're getting to the first driver on the start line. It is going to be um, Lil Webby. Lil yeah. Webby on the start line. Yeah, Lil Webby. I mean, I, I, I can't wait till that album drops. That's, that's for sure. Uh, it, just an incredible car, incredible build. Uh, I got a really good chance to, to kind of walk around it. I'm, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about it uh, as we get in but let's just jump right into the action yeah here we go it is our first driver dustin farrell off the line nice initiation dropping some wheels over those white lines and i'm putting three wheels off track on the transition you guys will see those outer white zones he's got to just get himself he's clawing from the back now from a judging perspective he's made some errors at the start of the track can't afford to make any more and he was killing it in practice but the thing is once you put that scoreboard up it gets a little bit more stressful and sometimes you overdrive the car but Dustin Farrell in this S14.9 looks like an S15, isn't yeah. an S15 with a 1.5 JZ. Doing a good solid run. He's got 550 horsepower. It's the right mix for this track, but a couple of big errors at the start. Yeah, I think it's important you, you hit that note that five to 600 horsepower is basically perfect here. Having more horsepower is not going to necessarily mean you're going to drive better. So let's see. A little bit of a feint doesn't really get the initiation. The front tires scrub a little bit. And you can see left of that white line, the, the judges really want the rear tires on that white line all the way through. Gives up a little bit in that zone, gets up to the wall, and then right here, this section right here is what we need to pay attention to all weekend. If you flub there, the rest of the run is basically done. He is able to get things dialed in a little bit more, kind of tight coming around that last outside zone, but 
Tons of, I mean, tons of great sounds. Yeah. I'm a big 1.5 kg And from a judging fan. perspective, the big mistake was the initiation. He drops wheels inside that dotted white line where we want the lead car above, and then he almost puts three wheels off the circuit as he transitions. He's in the wrong space. Yeah. So regardless of what he did for the rest of the course, that's going to be a huge deduction, which means his scores have dropped right down. Yeah. A great driver, though. I mean, um, a huge shouts out to him because uh, he actually won Hot Pit Auto Fest this year. So it's, it's not like, you know, this is a driver that's coming out of nowhere. And, ah, okay, we're never going to see him again. I guarantee... You are gonna you're gonna see Mr. Farrell or, or I, I mean Little Web Little Webby uh, again because yes we got a score dropping in here Jacob sorry to cut it yeah. it is a 58 so okay. right in the middle uh, not you know those three wheels off it not really doing him any favors there as we move on to our next driver it's going to be uh, Zach in this Nissan 370Z VQ37 so this is stock powered. VQ in the mix, 315 horsepower, and he's going to need every one of them. Those it starts. You start counting 13, 14, 15 on a VQ. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what though? He's been driving great the whole time. I mean, really fluid, and um, yeah. Let's just see what he's able to do with that fluidity. Yeah, nice initiation, nice and wide. Does what we want him to do. Stays out wide. Look at this. Not going over that white line. The line is so perfect right now. Of course, you're not going to get massive impact from a VQ as you go around here, but he's doing his best to impress us with trying to be fluid, trying to get exactly what we've asked for him in the driver briefing. Out to the edge. Oh, a little bit wide there, but he is flirting with danger, keeping it together. This is a fantastic run in a stock 370Z. That is a beautiful run, just dropping a little bit over the white line at the end. But that's impressive because all he can do to impress us as judges is is do the line. He's not going to have all the smoke, all the angle, because the car doesn't have it, but that is as good as he could do there. Yeah, and, and this is what we were seeing in practice all day. So let's take a look here at the initiation. Just a little, little e-bit grab. That's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything too crazy, but gets on that white line through the first and into the second outer zone. Has to scrub a little bit of angle out so he can push up to the third outside zone, back down that bank, and, and it doesn't show it as well here with the, this angle, but it's a decent bank coming down there. You will pick up speed, but is able to wrangle everything back in and then watch this outside tire just pushes a little bit wide, couple tires off. Yeah, we're being, we're being a little lenient on that because that last zone kind of tightens up a little bit. We're not being too... Uh, so that score drops in. It is going to be an 82.6. So almost perfect on line, just not a whole lot of impact, but does a great job. I don't think there's much more he could do in that car no. and chassis on this track. So it goes to show you don't need all the horsepower. You just need that little bit of technique, and he really did well there. Now, here's a very interesting oh. vehicle. What would happen if you put a Monte Carlo on top of a JZX? Well, you don't have to ask because it's right here in front of you. Now, this is one of the wildest cars we've seen on the grid, Jacob, because I don't even know how it exists. Yeah. We, we were chatting a little bit in the pits, and it's it's a heavy car. There's a lot of steel on top of that chassis, but, uh, I mean, he's using it to his advantage. Watch him to use a lot of weight transfer here to get this car around. Yeah, Timo, Timofey is doing a, a good job all weekend. This is a big, heavy car. The whole little bit of a wobble on the transition. You can see just how much weight he has to transfer in this car. He gets back out onto the line. He's tidying things up. But it looks like the car is kind of wavering. It doesn't want to get out to everywhere he wants it to be. And i got to say, a lot of bravery here to even try it. But, oh, oh it's a spin on the inside of the course. And that's an easy decision for our judges because it is a zero. But you know what? He's put some great runs in. I expect he'll come back out swinging for the second run and do a great job. But I just love seeing something so different. <laughs> out there yeah i mean don't get me wrong I, I love seeing these pro level cars but after a while you start seeing them over and over again and then someone shows up with a monte carlo on a jzx body and you're like oh wait a minute you have my attention he almost took two valuable cars and made, made each less valuable right. because he's, he's basically chopped up a monte carlo <laughs> and a jzx but that's what drifting is all about yeah. it doesn't if you try and make sense of any of it you're going to fail miserably so why not go to the extreme unfortunately takes a spin in the middle of the course and we move on to our next driver which is going to be RJ in this BMW E46 M50 Turbo, 560 horsepower. Doing some good stuff in practice. Enjoyed yeah. his, his line was pretty impeccable. I always say this, and then I commentator curse everybody, and they do terrible when I say they're going to do well. But I'm expecting big things here. Ooh, look at that. Big swing out. Lots of initiation through as he comes through into that first section. Locks it up a little bit as he comes to the first outside zone. Gets on a good line for the second outside zone. Coming up the bank, can he hold it into the third? Okay, let's watch for the transition as he comes through. A little bit of weight transfer as he gets into the fourth. Holding on to it. I mean, if you exit there too soon, you're going to see it, but is able to get the car back in. Man, this this might be one of the best runs he's put together today. Great timing. It was an impressive run from start to finish. There was a lot of angle on yeah. the initiation. Actually, not what we wanted to see. It was more <laughs> more for show, which I'm all about. But uh, he lost a lot of speed on the run-up, which he had to kind of push through. But from my perspective, still a very solid lap, where he lost a couple 
of points for us in terms of line, mm. he gained in a lot of style. He had a lot of angle. He took risks. Very easily can go off the track when you're pushing that hard and going on so much angle. But what I loved it. The initiation was wild. His transition was wild. Everything was wild. He misses a couple of zones. It's not perfect everywhere. But he makes up for it in style. So he's kind of gone for all the style and angle. The line, again, it's almost an opposite run to what we saw the 370Z do. 370Z was low angle, beautifully precise. That was wild and aggressive. And it's probably going to balance off pretty similar. And they have OrJ scoring a 79 as his average. So, yeah, it could have been a little bit more precise. It was a little bit wild. But I enjoy wild. I mean, I'm not yeah, going to complain. Wild. But as a judging criteria, you got to base them all on the same criteria. And again, missing a couple of zones there. We move it on to our next driver. It is going to be... Um, Jason Bostrom, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, and uh, in your favorite engine. Love this thing. This, yes. this thing sounds great here. And Jason coming in hot, real styly boy car, as you can see. Um, not a huge amount of power, so he's got to make it work as he goes to the edge of the circuit. Um, a nice job here. Just, you, know, you can see him kicking the clutch. This thing does not want to go to those outer zones. He's making it work right now as he transitions back. This is very fluid, very smooth so far. Not a huge amount of speed or angle, but he's getting the job done. And this is very nice into that last corner. Very precise. This is very easy to chase if you're a chase driver because it's very predictable. He's not doing anything too crazy and a very solid run. Yeah, it's, uh, I love seeing the style out of it. I mean, you could almost say an animal level of style. That was terrible. Uh, but <laughs> able to really get the car moving around, not a ton of horsepower. As much as Dave does love the SRs, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about 800 horsepower in some of these. The SR is definitely not making that. But able to use the if car it does, in the right it's, way. It's gonna, you're going to get your umbrellas out it, for the pistons flying f through the air. But it's, it does a good job. Again, it's a, you can see the good driver in it there. Right, right. You can, a great driver can overcome a, a, a not amazing engine. Um, but the SR in this C case. Careful, Jim, I know, careful. I know. I'm ready. Uh, but he's, he's able to drive the car correctly and able to get through it. I mean, clutch kicking, using a lot of weight transfer, and just keeping it in the rev range. What we would say back home is he's working that thing. He's working he, he has to. He doesn't just put the foot down and it goes right. He has to actually kick it, clutch it, make it wash a little bit, which is actually a difficult technique in some of those zones. So we rewarded him with a pretty decent score there. He scores an 84.3, so a good score. And that's because we know how much work he's putting in to not go where the car wants to go, but where we want him to go. And that's what we're respecting on that run. Well, and there's not that there's a lot of room for interpretation to where you need to be, but how you get to those zones is what the drivers are able to utilize to, to get out there. A hundred percent. Yeah, chassis, engine, power, style, all of that is, is the interpretation. Yeah, well, that next goes up, into this. we got uh, Margaritas in this BMW E46 LS powered 775 horsepower. This thing has all the noise, it has all the torque. It is a showpiece when it's on track. But again, got to be precise. He's got all the power, it's not going to be an issue, but can he, can he restrain himself from going off track? Let's see what happens. All right, lots of power going into that initiation. Lots of angle. Good job getting the car transitioned back around. Comes off throttle so he doesn't shoot off the track as it comes into the second outside zone. Back on throttle into the third. You can see the smoke rolling off that LS Doctor logo as he comes through and basically misses the fourth zone, which now you can see how much that's going to make you struggle through five, six, and seven. And that's, that's what we saw. A little bit shallow. Uh, through four, and, and that just kind of ruins the line for the rest of the Yeah, line. from the start on initiation, he just sort of came a little, went a little too early, went on too much angle, and then had to kind of really stall up to get to the first clipping zone. From there, it almost looked like he, you know, he was on a mule, and he just, he'd, he'd give it a hit, and it was just trying to hold on. Missing that inner zone, though, that's a big mistake for me. Um, I'm going to be pushing him back down to like a low 70 or so on my scoring. But it's like that is a big part of the track that separates drivers. We're not looking for the, the, the two big corners should be, if you're settled, should be quite easy. It's how you're getting to them. And that's the center section and the initiation. And those are the two points that you're really going to have to watch when you're watching along like we are. And judges were saying they're the difficult points. We want to see people doing a good job there. So scores dropping in. It is a 70, a 70 on the board. So missing that inner zone, a big uh, catastrophe for, for him there. Next up, we got Nick Collier in the Nissan 240SX, 1.5 JZ, 500 horsepower. But boy, does he make it look like it has 800 horsepower because he really pedals this thing. Nick has a, been really good in practice. I'm hoping we're going to see some of that form translate now into his first qualifying run. All right, Nick coming down the bank and getting that faint entry and lots of angle as he comes down. Gets the car a little bit more settled as he gets back on throttle. Watching those front wheels to see how many corrections. I'm not seeing, as I say that, we see that kind of correction coming into that last outside zone of the first section. Able to get the car drifted out and using the momentum so he doesn't shoot over, but a little bit too much angle, gets back on the brakes to sort the car out, and that pushes him wide there. It, any mistake at this track, just, yeah. it, doesn't, it almost doesn't make itself known in the moment. 
it makes itself known in the next zone. Yeah, he's really flirting with disaster towards the end, pushing way too wide. Now, we're being a little lenient there because it is tough for the drivers to see that last section with so much uh, tire laid down, but it's a big error. He misses the inside zone, or the, uh, the inner zone. Uh, it's not inner zone, it's an outer zone, but on the <laughs> inner part of the track. I'm trying to get ahead of myself here. And then on the last section, just lost the car a little bit towards the end, so it's going to knock him down into scoring quite a bit. Yeah, it's it's really tough. I mean, it's, it's easy for you and I to sit up here and talk about, oh, you got to do this and do that, but just watching some of the drivers adapt to it. I mean, the highest level of drivers were, were having to work through things and, and try different techniques. We saw Michael Essa even trying to, you know, put his hood over over his windshield just to see if that would help. Yeah, and it didn't. It did, he thought it might get some style points, but I, I had to reiterate to Michael that that does not get you more style. Yeah. Well, maybe it will. Maybe it will. I, maybe I wouldn't it will. try it. I wouldn't suggest the rest of the grid no. try to dry around with the hood on the, on the windscreen. But um, on that particular run, we've got a 63. So the big mistake at the end and missing that zone and the center section of the track really knocking Nick down there. I think he's got a much better run in the second half, though. But, um, you know, I think that maybe the pressure of qualifying can really change a driver's style. They start overthinking how they're driving. They start overdriving to those zones, and then they make mistakes that they weren't making in practice when the pressure's off. But we're only human. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. Next up, we go to the line, and it's going to be Randy Trong. And Randy, in a very new livery and very fancy OR34 four-door here, but he's had some trouble with it in practice. It's not working 100%, so let's hope they've got some of those issues knocked out of this thing so we can get a good solid run in here. Let's check for that initiation. Kind of a straight line initiation. Grabs the e-brake to get the car to come to angle, and ooh, a little too much angle. So yeah, this is a very untested car. So yes. he said he, he said that this thing was just buttoned together for the event, and Randy is struggling a little bit with it. And it happens because, you know yourself, we try and get cars to just drive to the local shop. They can fall apart. Imagine bringing them here and trying to put them under this stress on a fresh build. So Randy going to have a little rethink about that one, unfortunately, just spinning out on the transition. But it happens quite a bit. It's an unusual uh, first corner, very slight initiation, and then you almost whap the car onto lock. So that a lot of time you can see guys struggling to keep the car from spinning out. So unfortunately for Randy, that is exactly what happened. Yeah, it looked like the front wheels just didn't want to come around in time, and then by the time he had to manually adjust it, it, yeah. it was too late. Next up, we got uh, we got Trevor Jameson in the S14 to JZ, 500 horsepower. That's kind of the mix. You want that mix, that S14, yeah. S chassis. With the, so this car should be pretty balanced, pretty stable. Trevor's been putting in some great laps in practice, uh, but practice means nothing. It's all about your couple of runs in qualifying. So let's see if Trevor can make this work. Great initiation there by Trevor. He's been doing that pretty much all uh, all weekend. Back on the throttle, getting in those outside zones, and I, he's going to be able to hold this smooth all the way through. We see a bit of a correction there in the last section as he gets back on throttle. Transitioning maybe a touch early, but able to extend it out, and that is bringing him a little bit wide here. Can he cut in? He does. He's able to get the car a bit more manageable but does miss an extra outside zone and almost trains in the last one. This is what we're talking about. Yeah, it's a very fluid run, yes. so he's got everywhere he needs to be. The only thing is he could have been a little wider on the zones, and then, of course, he had that little stall up in the center. So it's a good run, not a great run. That's how we would describe it. And, you know, he's starting to get himself into situations where he's like, you know, it's kind of in the 70s or so. There's nothing really impactful about it. He started very well, but as you said, correction coming up onto the bank, missing a zone, and then checking up at the end is going to knock that score back. Yeah, it's, it's super tough. There's so many areas in this. I mean, th this is a great track that kind of represents maybe a little bit more of European drifting as well with for all sure. the zones. And it's a 73.6 for Trevor Jameson. But I think if he tidies that lineup, he should go much higher on the second run. But it's not easy. It's easy to talk it. It's yeah. hard to walk it. That's the problem. We're up here giving everybody a stick over the runs, and I'm going, it's a lot different down there <laughs> in the sunshine when you're boiling in the car all day here in California. We move up to Zandara Kennedy, 350Z, LS3, 500 horsepower. So, again, a Z with a V8, a very good, balanced car. Let's see... Uh, you see how the run goes. From my perspective right now, we're not seeing someone grab the track and just do a monster run right now. So let's hope we can see some in the next. Yeah, and Zendara, fellow Canadian, so I'm going to a little bit of bias there, right? Yeah, you, you Canadians stick together. We do. We definitely do. And a little bit of a faint initiation there from Zendara. Able to get the car manageable. Bit shallow there through that zone as she pushes the car a bit wider. Gets on the throttle to get up the wall and onto the bank. Flirting with a disaster a little bit getting near the wall. And you can see there the car just, just struggling a little bit. It's almost like she just needs to get a bit more wheel speed out of the car to get it around. But through this last outside zone, there it is, putting the pedal down, seeing a little bit more of the smoke coming out. And not, 
not too bad. Little, no, little hesitant there in the beginning. To be honest, I think looking at a run, I think what I would say is it was precise but very tentative. There was no area of risk. There was no area of I'm not going to make it around this corner. We want to see a little bit more impact in that, a little bit more risk, uh, a reward. So not a bad run, but not exactly going to set the scoreboard line. We're probably going to hit mid-pack here with this score. But, I mean, it's your first qualifying run, right? So, like, let's get the nerves out. Let's get the jitters out. Let's get a run on the board and then see what the score is and then figure out where we improve from there. Yeah, for me, that just to give you an idea, it was a 77 for me. So it's you know it's it's right in the middle. It's it's not terrible. It's not great. It's just a really solid run. But I think the confidence that that can build, that you can work from in the second run, should prove perfect for her because she'll come out and say, "Well, a 77 is my safe run. Let's go for a higher score." And uh, scores dropping in is oh, it's a 77.6. So all the judges averaging off around about the same point on that. Move back to the well. This is the man that traded your position, the commentary <sighs> box. The announcer's role for the track, and he's done many things. Officer Dan, Dan Brockett, mm -hmm. my partner in crime last year, decided he wanted to go. He was sick of watching. Sick yeah. of watching drifting. And said, I, want drifting. Done. I want to go drifting myself. So Dan, he's been a stuntman. He's been a track owner. He's been There's probably a CV out there that there's not enough ink in the printer. But he is uh, taking it to that second corner pretty flat out here. Yeah, and, and this is a car that has not seen competition in almost 10 years. It's been out driving, but not quite at this level. Dan doing a great job, though. I mean... Able to use the momentum of the car, getting on and off throttle. A little bit of a hesitation there before he gets into the last big bank of outside zones, but not a bad run. Like, really good run. And you know what I love about it? You can tell he's an old pro because that's the best run he's done today. So he <laughs> saved it. A lot, of, a lot of the newcomers, they do really good practice and they fall apart when it comes to the qualifying. He did the opposite. He was taking it easy in practice and then turned it up for the qualifying. Good solid run from Dan there. I think it was a misdirection. I think it's just getting everybody like, ah, it's just Dan. And then you see him come out of the gate at, at qualifying. He's just... You know, little little juke to one side. Yeah, again, a, another fairly safe run. That's how we would look at it from a judging perspective. He got around the track. He wasn't super deep in the zones. We want to see those rear wheels right on that exterior white line. He was kind of there or thereabouts. Room to improve, but a solid score all the same. And remember, everybody qualifies anyway. So this is kind of like a mute point. Some of these guys might even want to do bad, so they can do more battles later today. Who knows? They're crazy like that. We move back up to the start line. we got Lee Yearwood. This is maybe this is the only ORB on the grid, right? So this is an ORB 30 BMW E92, uh, which shouldn't make sense, but here we are. Um, he's taken two very different uh, philosophies of, of uh, engine and chassis, but he puts on a smoke show every time he comes out here, Lee, and I'm looking forward to seeing this run. He's been going hard in practice. He is a wild man. Just, just getting to see him drive uh, for the first time in person in Toronto, I was like, oh, this, this guy's coming to party. So see what Lee's got in that BMW, getting the car way out, getting the smoke going right away. As he comes through that first set of outside zones, getting the car pointed, and we can see him pour on a little bit more angle as he comes up to the bank. Can he get the car transition in time? Holding on to that lock for a really long time, but able to slow down going a touch wide. I'm just getting picky at this point, though, because Lee's putting down such a great run. And gets the car planted, puts the power back down, points the wheels, and across the line. Yeah, that was a much more impactful run than the last few we've seen. And, and you can see it straight from the off. He's on the edge of the white line. He's on tr throttle much earlier going into those outer zones than anyone else. Put on a bit of smoke show. Could have been a little wider in some areas, but I enjoyed it. I thought he was uh, taking a risk, especially in the center section of the track. He was very close that he could have you know, thrown it all away, but he took the risk. And his transition into the last corner was one of the cleanest and nicest we've seen so far today. So a really solid score from Lee. He's going to get an 82.6 for that one so a really good nice. score no great great run there from lee and and for anybody watching at home a couple of things you we're watching for uh watch what the front wheels do if you see him back and forth a whole bunch and it looks like those wheels are kind of going everywhere that's not a great sign exactly and then we're going to move on to the start line this is a guy i'm expecting big things from it's mika diaz he was putting in some crazy runs in practice now that doesn't mean anything because nobody was watching practice the same way they're watching qualifying and nobody's judging practice so you have all the pressure off but mika you know we remember him from all of those uh Hoonigan videos, the man line back in the day, he definitely goes in hot. And that's a big angle from the off from Mika. And you can see flirting right up onto Ooh. the edge of the track. That is as much aggression as you can put into that first corner. And he is super precise right now. This is a clinic for Mika Diaz here. And you can see, look at this, pushing almost too far, but he gets absolutely away with it. This is a risky run, and it's cost him towards the end. He has thrown it away, and up till then, he was definitely up there in the 90s. And then right at the end, threw it all away. So that goes to show that, you know, you might think, why doesn't everyone drive crazy? That's what can happen. Yeah, there's a very specific point that I'm going to bring up here where I went, oh, this is not going to go well. But initiation, great job. Getting on the power early. Transition yeah. here. Everything looks good. Sets it. Basically riding the line the entire time. As he gets up onto the bank, you'll hear him throttle down and really start to push the car out and doesn't come off throttle soon enough. And just that spot right there, over-rotating the car, 
completely ruins the rest of the run. Well, yeah, he spun the car, right? It's an over-rotation. And what happened was is he actually ran so much pace through the center section, yeah. he could not lose the pace. So <laughs> he threw everything, angle, front brake, handbrake. You know, he threw an anchor out the window, but he couldn't stop that car from going off the track. So trying to go for top stop or top step on qualifying, and he ends up with a zero. So that is the, the cruel nature of the sport. Now we're moving back to Nima Voss. This is a BMW F22 Eurofighter, much more familiar for us in Europe, these HGK Eurofighters. We see them all the time. They're, They're a great car, but this one has a 454 small block, and it's got 700 horsepower. That's a little bit more unusual. It's got all the Murica put into oh. the Latvian uh, body right now. This thing sings. It's a really, really gripped up car. It looks like it's ready to kill anyone who steps behind the wheel. So if you can manage it and keep it under control, this is going to be a very good run. But it's a tough car to drive with this amount of go in a quite a small light chassis. Yeah, it does look like they've dialed some grip out throughout the day. I know they were fighting some steering issues today. Um, we are. This is a pro-level FD Driftmasters. Wherever you go in the world, this is a pro-level car. This so. thing does not mess about. No. It no. is ready to go. So let's see how he gets on. It is going to be Nima Voss off the start line, running through the gears. Big flick in. Line's good so far. Big angle. Transitions back. Oh, a little bit of a wobble. Had to reinitiate and just put him on big angle, but he made it work. That was a very, very nice save there. But you can see the car is just on and off throttle, just wavering a little bit. This thing is wild. It's a tamed beast right now. But it's looking pretty good for Nima as they transition back. One more corner to go. This is where Mika made a big mistake. Not so much of an error from Nima Voss and just about keeps control across the finish line. That's good stuff. I like to that see good. it. Yeah, it just, the progression of his driving and the car development just over this weekend alone has been phenomenal to see. Um, you know, we, we watched in early practice just him struggling with the car. It was way too gripped up. It was it was basically at, at, at level 10 the whole time. And like we talked about, you can't have that here with well, this track line. You can see it clear as day if you're if you're not a big drift fan. He transitioned to the car just went, no. Yeah. So it's so much grip <laughs> in the car when it changed direction, it just stopped in the middle of the transition and went, no, I'm just going to stop here. I've got too much grip. So that car, and this is how weird it is in drifting, does not want to drift. Yeah. You have to make it drift. It's not an easy loose chassis. It's trying to be super fast. So the score drops in. It's a 79.6. So a couple of little waivers and errors there costing him some scores. And we move back to the start line. It is the man putting together many L Z cars over the last couple of years is Sean Booth in this Nissan S15 Orbi 25 arrived here yesterday absolutely pristine 15 minutes later it was wrecked yeah. and that is Sean Booth in a nutshell there, there was nothing to hit but he found it mm -hmm. he will find things to hit throughout the course and expect this run to be 110 percent and he's away off the blocks already I can imagine an exciting entry coming here from Sean Booth as he fires in big big swing entry there Sean He's a wild man, but he can definitely be a precision driver, and we're starting to see that now as he gets the rear end of the car right on the line. Takes a little bit of angle out to push the car up to the wall. You're going to see that quite a bit with cars less than 500 horsepower. Able to get out to that transitioning zone, and then a little bit of an e-brake there to get the car set up. It does push it a little bit wide. Maybe if you would have kept off the e-brake, you would have been a little bit better off. But, I mean, first set of zones, everything looked good. Transition, then... What? I'm going to tell you what happened there. Right. He got three quarters of the way track and said, I haven't destroyed anything on the car yet. Uh, this is not me. No. And then he found some cones. He took the bumper off. And that's Sean Booth. You'll, you'll never find a more entertaining driver to watch. It, it's, an, it's amazing. But it's going to cost him some scores. That's the only downside. Well, the, the upside is, you know, we've got the, the, the last chance qualifying sessions. We've got those battles coming up. And, and Sean's the, the kind of guy who's here to battle. So, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, Qualifying is fine, but I want to go door to door. I want to take off some more paint. I want to leave some red marks on other cars. Yeah, it was a good run. So he did a great job. He was probably sitting in the high 80s uh, until that last corner when he drops two wheels off the track. That knocks the score back down to a 72. So you can see how it works here in the judging. You're, you're hoping. You're, you're not trying to be negative. All judges were trying to give them good scores, and it's their fault. <laughs> yeah. But they get to the, to the last moment, and they make a mess. So we've, we've seen some runs where I think we could have jumped into the 90s at this point. Mika Diaz being a standout. But just that last corner starts to you know, you, you almost get too excited. You're, you're pushing the car too far. And eventually, as you get around that course, it bites you somewhere and you lose a lot of score. So at the moment, we have got a Zach in the 370Z, if I'm not mistaken, with the highest score right now. So a stock VQ is now the leader in qualifying. So just, you know, we talked about it. Anything can happen, <laughs> yeah. right? But a man who doesn't have a stock uh, VQ, definitely the opposite is the brand new GRD6 of Nate Hamilton, 3.4 stroke 2JZ, and he was sensational in practice. Everybody was looking at Nate saying, this is the guy that seems to have this figured out. But it is a first debut weekend for this competitive chassis, so let's see how he gets on. 
Nate, big initiation getting that car out there. This is a man who basically set this track out. He was one of the first ones to run it, so he might have the most experience here. And we're already seeing that with Nate. Coming from the V8, going to the 2J, it doesn't even matter to him. He is so smooth and so soft on the pedal, it's, it's, it's almost relaxing to watch him drive. And, and for a car that is so aggressive, like, look at it. Just, just makes it look like butter. Goes a little bit wide there. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost perfect from yeah. start to finish. And I'll tell you one thing about Nate for me. It's like, if the judges had a school, he'd be the first. In he'd be right up the front. He's, he's like right up the front with the hand up, asking questions. He does everything you want him to do as a judge. He doesn't, uh, basically, you can give him any set of criteria, and he's thinking, how do I impress those judges? And that's a phenomenal run from Nate there. I've got to say, that's probably my favorite run of the event so far. Yeah, he is an early on favorite. I mean, if you watched and if you get a chance when this is over, go back and watch all the LZ World Tour events because Nate was crushing. Like every single event, he'd go in and do something nuts. And uh, now that he's got his own car and a fresh build, it's wild. Yeah, I mean, there's still room there for a little bit of flair in the run. This was definitely, you could tell Nate was doing the safe run the, to get the score on the board. But uh, from perspective of, this is going to go first. Yes, first place in qualifying, 90.3 for Nate Hamilton. Jumps into the 90s and, again, still has some of the tank there. Just That was a safe run for him. So yeah. if the safe run is 90, be prepared for a second. We go back to the start line. we got a Formula Drift driver, Dmitry Brutsky, in the E46 S54 Turbo, 750 horsepower. This is a guy who's won multiple Pro Spec Championships, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And he's a guy that this is going to suit him. The car, the setup, the style, all is going to be right in his hands here. So expect a big entry, which he gives us as he comes through that first corner. Plenty of angle, got to get to that out to the white line early. Gets a little there late, could have been a bit uh, closer, but very solid, you know, you can see the experience being able to pull himself back onto that correct judging line. As he transitions back, picks up a lot of pace here. He's got to manage that. You can see off throttle, a little left foot break. Very, very nicely done. You can see, look at the smoothness as he comes through that last section. Maybe not as smooth as Nate Hamilton on the first half of the course, but definitely impressive on the second. Impressive stuff from Dimitri. I love to watch him drive. You can see how even when he messes up, he makes two or three inputs to the car, and he's right back on track. Yeah, the expert level driver. I mean, this, this car is definitely gripped up pretty heavily. You can kind of tell, too, with some of the uh, e-brake pulls in transition. But Dimitri kind of setting the car up and, and able to find those zones. A little bit of left foot brake here and there. Where, and you're going to see that in, in the, the higher horsepower, higher grip cars. Just to get the car settled and able to get them around. But Dimitri very smooth through the transitions. You can see that, yeah, that this, transitioning zone is, is this great. part. This part of the track was probably one of the best that anyone's done. Just in terms of angle and speed. Yeah. But the initiation, it's almost like he ran out of gearing as he came through. He started to put on a big angle and the car sort of revved out. So he didn't have as much forward momentum. But he made it work. He, yeah. he instantly corrected it. So an 88 on the board for Dmitry Bruski as we now go to another Formula Drift driver. I feel like I'm uh, on the other team this weekend. <laughs> and it's uh, a lot of Formula Drift drivers, which is fun for me. To, to, I've never announced for any of these guys before. Ah. So it's, you know, a little bit of a fanboy moment for me jumping into this position. Dylan Hughes, e BMW E36, Turbo M50, 500 horsepower. He makes it look like it's got 1,000 horsepower. He pedals this thing. It, I, I was shocked it was just 500 horsepower. Super professional line driver. So let's see if Dylan Hughes can impress us here. Looks us really wide on the initiation. It's the widest anybody's been. And look at that, really early to the outer zone, settles himself perfectly in there. That is as good as you can do that first section. As Dylan Hughes now pushing, you can see he's sitting on that left foot brake because he doesn't have all the horsepower of his Formula Drift car to get himself <laughs> up there. But it's really smooth so far. This is excellent. Look at that white line painting. He's almost removing that white line the whole way around the track with a tire smoke. I think that is probably as good a lap as you're going to see here in qualifying. And that's his first. Yeah, it's D Dylan's incredible. I mean, this is a name that if you're really into drifting, you know it. If you don't know it, you should learn it because Dylan is going to be a champion in the coming years. Well, to me, I'm looking at trying to find as a judge, and this is just giving you the insight, I'm trying to find where to deduct him. And the mm. only thing I can see is that he was a little slow in some areas on the left foot brake, could have committed a little bit more. And I'm talking micros, <laughs> micro mistakes. Other than that, it was absolutely perfect. And it shows in the scoring as we all go for a 95.3 for Dylan Hughes, 95.3. That is probably everything that track has out there. And Dylan, even with the width that he came in on the first corner, he pushed further than everyone else, which in any other case would have been a mistake, but he's clever because what it does is it allows him to transition early, which means he can get on the outer si outside of the track much earlier, and he will never miss clipping zone one because he's so set up for it. And he's picking up way more pace than everybody else because he's on the power way earlier. And that's a little technical, but he's basically being able to get up the bank easier than everyone else because he's building that momentum far earlier. So uh, impressive stuff from Dylan Hughes' early days. And then next up, 
fellow countrymen of mm -hmm. me from Ireland. It's Dean Carney. We don't have a lot of Dodge Vipers. Here's an interesting fact. Ke Dean Carney has more De uh, Dodge Vipers in L.A. than has ever been in Ireland. Wow. So that is an interesting... He's got all of them. So he's, he's the most Dodge Viper person from Ireland ever. Um, and in drifting, the only one competing. This is the practice car, 520 horsepower. Still got the V10, though. But uh, he looks like he struggles a little bit through that first corner. Yeah, Dean, this is just such a strange car to drive, the dynamics of it, but Dean's stuck with it, and he has figured it out in a lot of cases. He might have the least amount of practice here today. Rolled in a bit late. LA traffic, who'd have guessed? And, you know, it, it, it's showing a little bit here where he's not fluent in the track yet. He doesn't know all the words. He doesn't know all the nuances. He's still learning. Yeah, so. it was, it was, he was holding back a little bit. This was definitely a score on the board run. It wasn't something to set the scoreboard light. It was just to get a safe run in there. For me, it's probably going to, you know, score... You know, in the 70s, there was a couple of wobbles, and again, very on and off the throttle. That's something we don't really want to see. If someone kind of, you'll see the car lurch forward and back, a big puff of smoke from the tires, then no smoke. That's kind of not what we want to see. The fluidity means that they're kind of an instant smoke trail the whole way around the track. Well, but, I mean, you got that V10 in there, right? <laughs> and <it's laughs> he used the torque. I sat in this car two days ago, and I don't know how he drives it. It's like looking out of a post box. It doesn't make any sense. Half of his body is outside the car in the door, which mm. is even, he's a big guy in a very small cabin but he makes it work and of course this is the party car the practice car not the full you know full full cream uh, FD car and uh, Dean Carney scores a 73 so a little bit of improvement needed from Dean Carney in that respect and I'm just looking at the, the, the line of drivers here and in, in your lifetime did you ever you see you know these guys all stacked up together it doesn't even make sense feels like we're gonna wake up at some point and go I had this weird dream yeah the T-Pain was on track and then Dean Carney was there and Jeff Jones was there and Dylan Hughes was killing it but not in his former D car in his practice car and it's so much fun to watch and that is very much it is El Jefe Jeff Jones or Jeffrey Jones as I've started calling yeah. him I think he's getting formal enough he's getting important enough in drifting we can call him Jeffrey yes Jeffrey, Jeffrey Jones, Jones. And uh, Jeffrey Jones is in the 370Z. This is the uh, the old FD car, right? Am I not, am I not mistaken? I think so, yeah. LS3, 400 horsepower, firing into that first corner. Oh, a little bit of a left foot brake uh, to steady that machine as it goes into the outer zone. And uh, once he gets there, though, it looks pretty fluid. Just could have been a little wider on that, on the bank. Coming back through, though. Oh, gets it all wrong. No. And it's a spin out from Jeff Jones and you can see he just hung in there going please don't spin please don't <laughs> spin and the car was like yeah I'm just I'm, I'm done I'm out it could be possible that we forgot to tell him this isn't bowling uh, because he did take one pin out right off the bat and then yeah. just decided to take out a few more well it's so. been well documented his hatred of cones ah, yes, and, uh, yes. and every time he sees them he's just taking them down yeah, uh, he's working on it though I mean yeah. it's uh, years of therapy will, will help with that but yeah Jeff just coming through here I mean we get up on the bank you can see a little bit better with this angle just how much it's it's kind of ramping up there. You see the tire hop a little bit in the front there, but it just it pushes him wide. So. Well, I can tell you what happened. He went wide, and then <laughs> and, and the thing is, he went in the marbles. So when oh, you go out, when you call. go outside the track, all of that rubber that's been left from all the other drivers, he just got in that, and there was no grip. He was off throttle, still picking up pace. So I'd imagine no grip there, and you can see the scores dropping in on your screens right now. And if you're in attendance, you've got to have like, I don't know, Captain America vision to see it. But we're, we'll remind you of those scores as we go. Um, but at the moment, it is definitely Dylan Hughes sitting top, followed by Nate Hamilton. So they're the two big 90 runs we've seen so far. But here's a man that, you know, he said he's taking it relaxed today, yeah, not taking it. it too seriously. Nope. But he was listening to every word in the driver briefing, and there was notes being made. He doesn't know how not to be competitive. It is Odie Bocci, he's the ever pro. And uh, this is in his, this is a practice car, demo car, right? But it looks very similar and drives very similar. And he is taking this just as similar as a former drift event. Odie Bocci leaves the line. In the field suspension, 180, as we would call it, or S13, as you guys would call it. Fires through. Nice. Look at this little on-off throw, a little left of brake. So effortless in how he performs that move. Wow. Just, if you didn't know, Odie is one of these suspension gods within drifting, and you can see it with this car of, like, how stable it looks and how he's able to just effort, effortlessly put it wherever it needs to go, and that's what you're seeing here with Odie. Looks at the zone, goes, that's where I'm going, tells the car, and the car goes, yes, sir. And yeah, it goes there. incredible driving. I think for me, though, from a judging perspective, the lockup into Clippers 1 almost showed that he was going a little too fast in there. Right. He had to adjust a little bit like Dimitri Bruschi did earlier. He actually was carrying too much pace. So was it as fluid as a Dylan Hughes run? I don't think so. But still a very solid run. A good, you know, points on the board run.
Yes, yeah, it's it's got to be tough for a lot of these drivers, uh, especially coming out of you know the big leagues, to to dial the car back. And yep. Odie is is a very calm, gentle man until he gets in the car. Yeah, and and he's again, a demon. Re remember, these cars are running so much like such less grip than the Formula Drift car would be. So that's why you see these guys go really fast in. They expect the car just to hook up and go. And because they're in the practice car, the party car, it's just staying washing. It's just kind of going off the track. So their driver experience is getting them out of trouble, but the car may be not the same. So they're trying to drive to their 110%, but the car is probably at about 70. So they have to balance that as they go through. Next up, we've got Michael Essa. Great to see Michael Essa back on a competitive grid. I don't think he's drifted competitively for maybe a year and a half. And of course, all the success now with Daily Driven Exotics. He's still in the old FD champion winning car. So this thing is still going. And he was driving around in practice with the hood on the windscreen. So yep. he's that confident. He said, I'd like to do this blindfold, please, if possible. He's in his uh, S54 Turbo, 600 horsepower. Far into that. This is a really nice line into that first corner for Michael S as he transitions back. Hits that left foot brake. And you can see just slamming the brakes to steady the car into that outer zone. Really nice so far, Jacob. This is uh, a very smooth run. Yeah, Michael Essa was one of the good drivers that uh, helped develop this layout as well. So a little bit of an advantage there, but you can see how he gets the car rotated around super smooth there. That's how you want to deal with a little bit too much speed. Michael Essa did that perfectly. Had just a touch of speed coming out, but rotated the car around it. Yeah, and again, a lot of these guys struggling, I think, a little bit with the, tr the first initiation transition and then into the first zone. Just kind of steady in the car, a couple of inputs in the car. We didn't see that from Dylan Hughes, so it's going to be a little less than that, but all the same, a very, very solid run from Michael Essa. And again, we see the experience of making an error which would almost be uh, harsh to say, but being able to adjust back onto that, that qualifying line was exceptional. I, I loved it, I thought it was pretty cool, but um, scoring-wise, I went with an 88, and then it was an average of an 88 from the judges, but that's just because a little bit of errors on that, at the end of the first corner could have been a little bit more angle going in there, and that's really, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs at this point when it comes to those top runs, you know, so we're trying to find uh, a little bit more fluidity. Will we find it from Matt Field, who definitely said this weekend he's not taking it as seriously, and he <laughs> wants to just put on a show. I don't know how much they've him but I will say that he uh, you know he gets behind the wheel of that Corvette and he doesn't seem to uh, do you want to do anything but top qualifying I don't know based on the launch out of the line I think he's taking something seriously great faint initiation there from uh, Mr. Speed Racer he's able to get the car back in gets the tires lit up as he comes through that first set of outside zones car a little pointed maybe could add a bit more angle as he comes through throws a bit more angle into uh, three before he gets to the wall floats the car to that transition and gets back on let's see how it sets him up for the rest of the run Touch, bit too much angle, but able to get the car through. Kind of a different line, a different use of speed and transition than we've seen with a lot of other drivers. Yeah, it was a weird way of driving the track. A good way, but yeah. a weird way. So zone five, which is that outer zone right in the middle of the circuit, he kind of missed that. He kind of mistimed his, his transitions there, but he recovered really, really well from it. The initiation was wild. I enjoyed the fact that he, he threw the car a lot earlier than everybody else. He was definitely confident. Um, quite a similar run to, to Michael Essa for me, um, but again, a little bit too much angle coming into that last corner and missing a zone, just dropping him a point from Essa for me. So both those runs, excellent but an 87 overall from that field. But again, we're going to see these guys figure that out for the second run later on. Yeah, it was it was a great run, and, and Matt's a, an incredible driver, and it's 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 cool to see them in this this space as well. Yeah, and of course I've said this many times in my drift career. We we finished with Matt Field, and now we move to T Pain. This is a normal yeah, sentence that yeah. I've said many times before, and uh, yeah, Matt Field has zero Grammys. We've we've checked that. We went on Wikipedia, no Grammys. So that's the, I don't know if that's an advantage or I've a heard disadvantage. Him sing. We did karaoke together, yeah, and, I, yeah, I, I, and that's why he's, done, he's got no <laughs> Grammys because I heard him. So basically, T Pain this is his first time ever competing at a drift event ever so this is a big step yeah a lot of pressure he said he was feeling the pressure today going look i can sing pretty good i can do all that that's my domain this is your domain so let's see how t-pain gets on here on his first run thrown into that first corner in his rtr mustang oh it's a big snappy transition he's not oh. going to hold on to that you can Almost. see he tries to do that whip uh, like left to right and it, it catches you but it's caught a lot of drivers already yeah. who have much more experience than t-pain so this is a, uh, yeah, <laughs> we have Sean, uh, one of our judges saying he went for the big JTP flick there. And uh, even JTP gets caught out with that every now and again. So yeah. uh, T-Pain just putting in an extra couple of uh, corners here just to get used to it. He had some really good runs in practice. and uh, But this, you know, I was explaining to him earlier on, this is quite a technical circuit where, you know, there's a lot of transitions. You're going up a bank. you got to go into, you know, this first corner where you come in at so much slight angle and then have to put big angle in. That's not quite natural. There's not many circuits I've ever watched in drifting over my 10 years that are quite like that. So it catches people out. <laughs> Well, just just imagine for a moment that you've, you've been drifting for a couple of years, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to have my first competition. 
And this is the lineup yeah. that I'm going against. Half a Formula yeah. Drift yeah. will be there. <laughs> uh, it'll be fine. Yeah, Everything it'll be, be fine. great. On a layout no one's ever seen at yeah. the track that like really is big first drifting event. Exactly. Like, from from, yeah. from from the other side of Napa Boy Automotive, we've got Pert on the start line in this Pontiac GTO, which we would call a Monaro or if we're in Europe. Oh, I like that uh, better. Yeah, so it's uh, I, I haven't seen one of these in a very long time, but this one has been thrown at it, thrown into competition this morning. Hurt not getting his car ready just in time. So he says, I'm going to give it a go. He said, what's the party line? He said, never mind the judging line. So maybe Hurt's out here for a little bit of entertainment. But doing a good job carrying some good pace into that first corner. Yeah, typical Hurt style, just lighten the tires up right off the line, get the angle in the car. That GTO is tangling, like it's hanging in there. I mean, th these are notoriously not the best drift cars in the world, but this thing is incredibly well built and Hurt taken to it like a fish, like a fish to water. Wow, like, phenomenal job from Hurt for a guy that stepped in this car for the first time this morning. I saw four practice runs, maybe you saw more, but. He, that's a great job. Yeah, wow. Give it up for Hurt, everybody here in Bakersfield in a borrowed car, doing a great job on track. I gotta say, um, you know, Smoky Bakery. I like the yeah, name too. I know. Donuts. I get it. It's donuts. Good. Yeah, and the tires. Very clever. The real Enjoy question it. is, what is he? What shoes does he have? What Johnny Z rocking today? It's got to be some Crocs, I think. Yeah, I think so. I did, but they're FIA approved. For uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. seen. I've seen many professional drivers in Crocs. I think it's a. It's you know, especially when you got the the, the strap at the back, the yeah, speed strap. Speed strap. It's totally safe. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, if you didn't have the strap on, I'd be worried. But. Yeah. Uh, Lewis Hamilton. We got, yeah, we got to put a score in for me. It's going to be somewhere in the, the low 70s, a little bit wayward towards some of the areas uh, on the track. But a good effort in a car that he's borrowed for this weekend. He gets a 71.3 on the board. And we now move on to Colette Davis. Colette in the Corvette C6. And, of course, you can't miss it because it's the brightest car here. Looks very, very cool. She's putting some great laps in practice. Yeah. Looking really comfortable on the circuit. 580 horsepower. Texas Speed 440 V8 in this. And Colette takes to the track for her first run. Jacob, and uh, expect a smooth style here, I think. Yeah, Colette's been just dialing in this track over the weekend. A little hesitant to start, but able to really get to all the zones as she continued on in practice. And that is what we are starting to see here. She puts this run together. Now let's see if she can hold everything together through the transitioning section, throwing a bit more angle in. Should get back on throttle soon to get through the, wow. Wow, great job there. That that could have gone really badly. That was actually a really good run. Yeah. While, while we you know we could have been a little wider on the first corner, but I, what I loved about it was so much fluidity. There was no major lift of throttle. It was smooth the whole way around. So even though it wasn't absolutely precise, it would be very easy to chase because there was no surprises from the lead car if she was in a battle. I, I like that one a lot. Um, and I think what we're looking for as judges is sometimes you like these extreme, you know, spicy runs, but they would be a nightmare to chase because they're on big angle and breaking all over the place randomly on and off throttle. Something like that is kind of more attractive to us because we can say that someone could chase that on the door the whole way around with no issue. And Colette puts an 82 on the board. 82 for Colette there. Great run. As we move on to our last three drivers in the first half of qualifying, it's a guy that's always very reserved, never really pushes the car that much. He's not outspoken. No. He, he's a very Super quiet. quiet. Yeah. It, it, you know, really quiet. You barely, know he, you barely know he was here. Um, it is the Australian, Luke Fink, of course, and, and everybody just take two steps back from the guardrail because we're not sure what's going to happen next. As he comes through, big flick from Luke Fink into the first corner. Are you Huge. surprised? Huge. I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, Luke Fink, yeah, doing what we thought he would do. I mean, didn't get a back in, but I'm sure it's coming. As he gets through those three outside zones, still on throttle, transitions the car out, floats it back on throttle again, Points the car at that line, and that's where we want him to be on that outside edge, but a little bit. I mean, it's a, it's got to be a Luke run if he hits something. So good job there from Luke. Obviously going a little bit wide there uh, in zone six, but... Yeah, pulling the big oh, 360 there, there after the finish line for no reason. No. It'll get him no more scores, but it will get him the fans' hearts, which is sometimes just as important. And it's a good run from Luke. It's going to be, it's a solid one. But, you know, there's some areas he could have been a little wider. You know, outer zone five again, just almost dipping a wheel in there. So I quite liked it, but not, I would say, a perfection of a run from my perspective. There was some, some, uh, some room for improvement out there. And I think Luke will know that himself. If there's one thing that Luke thinks, he judges everybody the same way he judges himself. He'll know in the car that I, was, I could have been a little better here and there. And again, that's what the first run is all, all about, getting out there and doing your best. And you build from that. So a score dropping in for Luke Fink. It is a 78, 78 for Luke Fink. So a couple of little errors in there. But um, I'm sure he'll tidy those up or not and just do 14 360s through the track. You just don't know which way it'll go. We move on next to TJ Hunt. Was supposed to be in the Super. I just couldn't quite get it dialed in. So he's in his, what he calls his fun car, which is a 370Z. But at the moment, 
they seem to be doing pretty well yeah. on this track, to be honest. You can still get a very high score. As I said, high 80s, 90s possible in a stock VQ, which is what the beauty of the LZ World Tour is about, especially when everyone's on the same tire. Power isn't always the, you know, the best medicine out there. And you can see a lot of guys with huge horsepower struggling with the tight nature of the track. Yeah, so let's see what TJ does. He's been smooth all weekend so far. Good initiation, nice and safe. Not a tire, tire smoke yet. He will get it a little bit later on in the run, but a big left foot break correction there as he's shot off a little bit too far through outside zone one, but gets a dial in for two and three. Through this transition is where TJ's done really well. Not over committing, not under committing, but getting the car around, getting the tires lit up as he gets into five, six, and across the line at seven. Just that's that's what we've seen TJ do, other than the one correction. There's yeah. a, there was a big left foot break. Yeah, the car and again, the problem, and this is going to be a tough thing to say when you're driving a stock VQ. Right. you got to be perfect because yeah. you're not going to have the impact. You're not going to have the wheel speed. You're not going to have the noise, the smoke, and all that stuff and the style. So you're all your reliance is on the line. And TJ, unfortunately, coming away from that line a couple of times. So it is much harsher. And it's also when you're in a 370Z, you don't have the power to get back on the line if you're off it. You're going where the car is going at times. Um, so it is going to be a 74 for TJ Hunt, a 74. And then our last driver on the first half of qualifying was going to be Adam LZ. It's the man with the name on the board. Right. And this is tough for Adam. You always talk about this, that it's his event, so he always feels more pressure than if he's at somebody else's event because everybody here is expecting him to do great things. But he's in the new revamped, refreshed E36. He loves this thing. He's been putting in great runs in practice. And again, this is the first qualifying run to see if he can light up the scoreboard as he comes off the line. Very aggressive. Spinning wheels early is Adam LZ as he fires through the track. And you can see this big angle and no major slowing down from LZ there as he puts it right to the edge of the white line. This is a very solid run so far, going right out to the edge cones. Can he tidy up? This is where people have been struggling. He's carrying a lot of speed, left foot braking, got to bring it back on. Big angle, and it's just messed him up ever so slightly into that last corner. Everything up to there was pretty exceptional. That was not a safe run. That was no. a full steam, full beans run, <laughs> which we respect. But again, it's like some of the runs we've watched earlier. It can catch you out when you're going that fast through the center section. And, and I believe this is the highest horsepower car we've got on grid. This is another, you know, pro. This is an actual, another pro car. And, and this is the car they spring into Long Beach as well, which is crazy. Everybody asked for it. LZ delivers. Yeah. Let's bring the BMW to uh, to Long Beach. Which is going to be exciting to see, but then he, as he said, he's brought a bit of a, a gun to a knife fight here. And yes. he said it's tough for him because the car is so hooked up and he's against stock 370Cs. <laughs> so it's not going to be as easy as you would think. So scores are going to drop in from Adam LZ. His first run is an 85.3. So 85.3 for Adam LZ. Look to me, and I, I think the judges would agree with me, it was looking high in the 90s, but then just that last corner overcooked it, lost a couple of scores there. So we're trying to give you guys a little bit of feedback of how we're judging through this. It might seem quite random, but we set our bars of what we expect these guys to do. You know what? A really solid. We got a couple of zeros in there, a couple of spins. Hope you guys can sort those things out. Remember, everybody qualifies in the top 13. We'll go through to the main event. We're halfway through qualifying here in Bakersfield. It's been fun so far. We hope you guys in attendance and at home are having some fun. We're back with the second half of qualifying in a couple of moments' time after these words from our partners.
top of an ECU, internal wire band, ethyl control, all the motorsport functions, you can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer. Which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those features I have thanks to Link ECU. That's all I need. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely big shout out to Link ECU. Tire Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tires, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here in California, LZ World Tour. First time on the West Coast. We're halfway through qualifying, and the action has been coming thick and fast. Some good runs, some bad runs, and everything in between. And we got to go all back at it again. Everyone's got their first score on the board, but this is what really matters is the second score. Remember, the top 13 drivers will go automatically through to the main event tomorrow, but the remaining three places up for grabs in our last chance top 16 later today, where 16 drivers will go for those podium positions to get back in the mix. We start with Nima Voss in the BMW F22 Eurofighter. And Nima is waiting for, uh, you know, to try to jump up the order a little bit. We're going to try and give you guys as much information as we go on the scoring, but yeah. Bit of a tentative kind of on-off run the first time. Jacob hoping this one is a little bit more fluid. Yeah, Nima coming in real hot there. Getting the car to, wow, a just ton of speed. Sorry, it kind of caught me off guard just how quick he got this car going. But it doesn't seem like it's it's too aggressive yet. He's able to get the car around to where it needs to be through this transitioning zone. Scrubs a lot of speed out, not a bad idea, but kind of gets into angle a bit early. Could have held on a little bit longer to get through those last three zones, but... Coming in aggressive, coming in strong. He's got a decent, you know, he's got a decent score in already. Yeah, Why I not? mean, that's an improvement on the first run from my standpoint. He looked a lot more comfortable in the car. You could definitely tell that car is trying to kill him at every moment. Yeah. Every time he goes on the throttle, it jumps to another area of the track. But it was really impressive for me. I quite enjoyed the uh, the fact that he'd, he'd learned from the first run and said, you know, I, I need to wind off a little bit. And because that car is so fast. Yeah. You end up in another part of the track quicker than you think you, know, you can react to it. So he did a good job of adapting. And that, again, it, to me, is exactly what drifting is. You know, you learn from one lap to the next and everybody's improving so Nima waiting on that score to drop in it is a 79 so that on and off throttle though that's the fluidity that we talk about it's very you know it's almost like a very aggressive on off the whole way through the course missing a couple of zones but still remember everybody qualifies doesn't really matter it's the battles yeah. that matter you got to win something in the battles so it doesn't really matter next up we got Dustin Farrell Dustin is in this S14.9 which you have to take a second look at because the 2F performance kit looks exactly oh, looks like an S15 and uh, the headlights, yeah, the yeah. headlight setup is so gorgeous in that car. Yeah, th this part of the world, S15s are very rare, not so much back home, which is strange why people convert them, but <laughs> it is a very cool car, all the same. Uh, 1.5 JZ, uh, this was a big mistake on the first run, so he's trying to clean that up for the second. This looks much better so far. Yeah, big left foot brake there as he tries to get the car settled into the third zone essentially, but able to push the car a lot more coming through the fourth and then getting the car set up there for five, six, and seven. He's, he's got this dialed back in. He's realized his mistakes, maybe a little bit deep there uh, into six, but just a, just a much better. Hey, there we go. Is this, the, is this what this is going to turn into real quick? 360 comp? I'm not saying it should. I'm not saying it shouldn't. 
Okay. I'm, I'm saying that I, I'm not against it. Right. Um, a far better run. I mean, obviously, the first run for me was a 52 on the board, but this one, I think, is going to sit much higher. Um, yeah, I think the thing about that run for me was there was still some wavering here and there. It wasn't perfect. Um, a lot of on and off throttle, but a much bigger improvement for me on how uh, he handled the first. And again, that's what we want to see, people coming back out and learning from their mistakes. And again, the pressure drops off a little bit on the second run because you've already done that stressful first run. Yeah. You get into that mode of like, okay, now I'm in business mode. It's, I'm not going to fall apart here. I've done it the first run. Um, and scores dropping in for Dustin Farrell. It's at 82, 82 on nice. the board. No, so great, a big great. jump up from mid 50s to 82 over the two runs that we want to see. Now here's what I'm looking forward to. It's Zach in the 370Z. He got an 86 in this car uh, on the first run. So like this is crazy stuff for a stock 370Z. But where does he find any more score? Because there definitely is no more horsepower. There definitely is no more angle. So I'm not sure what he's got to do to do better. But hey, I've been corrected many times. Minute by minute, I'm usually corrected in drifting. So I'm not uh, you've read the comment section, I see. Yes. <laughs> I'm here to make you feel like you have a point to prove because I'm generally wrong, <laughs> so it's fine. And uh, so this car, to me, the line he knows he has, but he's got to probably do something crazier on the initiation, just go a little bit wilder. And other than that, I'm not sure where he's going to grab some more points, but that, I'm, I'm as fascinated as everybody else to see what happens. Yeah, let's see as this run-up comes in, does he go for a big feint? No, I'm still kind of a, I wouldn't say hesitant initiation, but definitely a safe one. So may just understand the amount of points he's got. Let's just run through it, get a practice run done. That's kind of what it feels like here. But you can you can just tell it's only got so much horsepower. And and really, these accelerators, they've, they've got a ton of grip. We've seen it with a lot of these cars. So he is struggling with the grip of the tire, it looks like. Uh, but not having 600 horsepower, I mean, that doesn't help the situation. But good, solid run. I mean, very chaseable. And could definitely chase with what he's got there. He's got consistency, but I don't think that was as good a run as his first, in my, in my personal opinion. I think he, he missed a couple of zones on that one that he didn't on the first. Um, so I think it's... it's uh, I'm just writing my scores in here. My handwriting <laughs> is so bad that Sean is like, is this the same language that we speak? Um, so yeah, not as good as the first. He, he, he tried to overdrive a little bit and a big handbrake lock up at clipping zone one, which is something he didn't do the first time. So for me on that one, I think it was just, yeah, it was a pretty okay run. But again, put the two of them together. And this is a guy that you, you know, could upset a lot of people here today because he's not making any major errors. I mean, great, you can get a 90 run and the next is a zero, but he's just doing that steady 70 to 85 run every time, really impressive. The guy though, Timofey in the Chevrolet Monte Carlo, which I've never said in drifting as a car chassis before. Yeah, with the two JZ on the JZX chassis, all of which doesn't make sense. And he got a zero on the first, so he spun out. This is going to have to be, you know, now he's in, in trouble land because he can't go too tentative because if he goes too tentative, he doesn't score in the top 13. And he can't go too aggressive because he can't put two double zeros down. So let's see what he does. Much better on that initiation there. You just got to keep the car together through the rest of this run, get some points on the board, see what he can do. There's a, there's a chance we could get, see some double zeros out of this, but you don't want to be the person on the other end of that. And you can really see how soft the springs are, how this car is moving around and rolling. This, this reminds me of such like grassroots drifting. I don't know about you, but like my first car, that's what they did. This is this what it car like. looks <laughs> like it's in a 1970s car chase movie. It just wobbles around all over the place, up on the curbs. So um, we're getting some word from the marshals. A little bit of rain starting to fall on the track. Not a lot, but it's going to make things a little bit more difficult. Yeah, it was a bit of a sketchy run from start to finish, but he does put a score on the board. I love it. I love it. any any strange chassis, any weird build. I'm I'm here for it. The, the stranger, the better. Like the, the guy who built the boat. I, I'm assuming you saw that. I, I can't remember what chassis was underneath of it, but like, let's put a boat on top. Why not, right? But only in America. Yeah. Would you put a boat on a drift car? Yeah. And, and I'm all I'm all about it. Yeah, it's well, in Europe. We we just someone would just ask the question why, and that would be the first stumbling block. But nobody ever went. Yeah. Put, no. put a boat on a car. Why wouldn't you? No, no point did anybody ask one. No one even. It's it's um, just toxic positivity. Yes. That's what America has. Just nobody's telling someone not to do something because it's silly. But that's what we got. We got a, a score on the board. It's a, a 75 for uh, Timofey in the uh, Monte Carlo. And it's going to be moving on to Andre or Orge Contreras. Am I right in saying that? Is that impressive? I don't know, but I did see a, a phenomenal video of him playing Dance Dance Evolution. With, uh, I think it was Jeff Jones. It was incredible. Yeah, well, it might score. Let's hope he can dance on the pedals here today as he gets around the track. E46 M50 Turbo firing in. This is nice through the first corner. The grip levels are going to start to drop a little bit on the track with the, the little sprinkle of rain. It looks like he's handling that perfectly so far. He gets to the outside of the track. We're still seeing all the smoke clouds here. And even if it is rain, it's going to be very brief as he transitions back. Just letting off the throttle a little bit, but it's the right line. It's what we want to see. He's taking an aggressive approach. And there is where he's just having to 
just stay on the track barely as he kind of gets a little bit lost towards the end of the corner. There's still a very good run, very solid. I enjoyed that. I think it was uh, it was not too bad. Just wobbling and wavering a little bit. But again, remember, this is qualifying. It's a fun event. Qualifying is the most boring part of drifting. So we're just if you're, if you're excited by this, you should be sticking around later on because it's going to get the two cars. Two cars. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, double the action. Double, double the, the action. fun. More, you more excitement than well, double the excitement if yeah. anything. Yeah. So for me, that's just going to be. It's not the perfect run. Uh, it's not a. Yeah, it's a kind of an okay run. So we have got uh, the score dropping in 77 for Orj there. 77, uh, not too bad. I'm not sure where it is. We're going to see at the end where it sits us all in this. But uh, we can move on to our next driver. It is going to be Jason Bostrom. He's got an SR20, so that's an immediate 92 points from me. Uh, I, I joke, I joke. He's got God's <laughs> engine, so the rain will definitely stop. The rain actually probably uh, came from God for this, this run. This work, this Just to run give him a little bit more power in that SR. Jason firing in through. Oh, you can see that just perfectly oh, timed it onto the outside line. And I think the, tr the track temperature dropping has actually helped Jason a lot here. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, a little bit of drift loop. That's all it is, just to get you around the track. I mean, you've got less less horsepower. It's going to help out just a little bit. And uh, no, it looks good. Still seeing smoke coming off the tires. We don't have a wet track by any means. No, and for sure. Yeah. Nice run. Again, you know, you're going to lose a little bit on angle. You're going to. It's almost a mirror image of his first run, to be honest. There wasn't much difference between them. Um, but a nice smooth run. Nice. Uh, it looks like a guy that's very in control of his car, and I can imagine he's done a lot of laps in this car. I don't know him personally, but it looks like he's very—he knows every movement that car is going to make, and it doesn't catch him out. There's a lot of guys here this weekend that are in borrowed cars. You can see all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, didn't know I was going to do that," but he's very in control, and with you know a 400 horsepower SR, he's out there with the best of them. Yeah. So uh, you know, he, will, together. he might get his own medal for that. I, I, I feel like you need to just bring an SR medal to all it. the events. Yeah, but the problem is the medal would probably still break, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So uh, we're going to move on to our next driver. It's Maritza's in the BMW E46 LS. 71 on his first run. So there was a lot of it was a lot of noise. It was a lot of the theater, but it just wasn't that precise. So let's hope we can tidy that up on the second run. I mean, if you've ever chatted with him, he's a lot of noise and a lot of theater in the best possible way. Yeah. So it fits. It fits. Into that first corner, they go with a lot of smoke, and this is a good line so far. But you can see he comes on the throttle a little too early, missing that outer zone. Now getting back on it as they go up the bank. This is the bit where the car just kind of behaves a little differently, but he's kind of on the inside of the track the whole way around here. Oh, very wide here. Sends the cone flying, but this is good at the end of the circuit. Really nice at the end of the circuit. So tidying this lap up expertly towards the end. So first half of the course, but a little bit to be desired. The second was spot on, and that's going to probably balance out the scoring. And a big 360, why wouldn't you? What do you give the 360? On its own, by itself. That 360 was probably the best one we've seen today. The lap, Ooh. I would question, wasn't I, perfect, I but it was good. Six years just perked up. I, I guarantee it. He went, oh, I'm sorry. What Excuse did you say? Someone out of 360? <laughs> oh, yeah. I would like to lodge a protest. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to pull a double. I guarantee it. will be a 720 that's coming out of him next. But, yeah, uh, the Greek doctor. I mean, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have gone the way that it did. Uh, just being shallow where he's at, you could definitely pull the car, grab the e-brake, push it out a little bit further. But, I mean, very easy for me to say up here in the booth and, you know, I guarantee I couldn't yeah. get one of these cars around the track. No, tried. no, we both struggle. Yeah. We'll talk like we're great, yeah, but we, we, we can do that because we don't have to prove it. Because we're up it's here. Great. Exactly. <laughs> they can't hear us. 75 on the board for Margarita as we move on to Nick Collier, who is in Sean Booth's car. So basically, Nick Collier's car has blown up on the first lap, and he did a pretty good solid run, to be honest. But now he was struggling, and we wondered why he was struggling. The car was letting go. Right. So now it's Sean Booth, who's still in the competition, ladies and gentlemen, and still has another qualifying run. This S15 will do three qualifying laps with two different drivers. Welcome to the LZ World Tour. It doesn't have to make sense. Yep. We're just here for entertainment. Exactly. So let's see how Nick gets on. He's never driven this car before. So <laughs> Perfect. It, yeah, you can see straight away. He's like, what is it? Where's that? And Why is everything on the left? Man, you get in a rental car <laughs> at the airport, it takes you half, half just, an hour to get familiar. Never mind doing this. If the wipers go on, we know exactly what happened here. So, I mean, he's putting it together for a car he's never driven. I don't think I could have done any better. But, hey. Score on the board, possibly. I don't know. Is it a zero yet? I couldn't tell you. No, I, I'm think, not I, think, I think the thing about it is, oh, the hand out the window. There we go. How very Sean Booth of him. Right. <laughs> Shown off to the crowd. So I'll tell you what, what I like about this is that if there's a situation where he knows everyone's going to qualify, then he's probably trying to say, I might get a couple of laps in this car just if I have to go to battle. I don't want to go in there with no laps. So he got around. It was 
interesting is probably the per polite word I would use for that lap. There was a lot of off the track, a lot of here and there, but from that perspective, he puts a 65 on the board. So 65 on the board for Nick in Sean Booth's car. There might be a bit of that today, and you're going to have to keep an eye on it because it's a bit like that game where they put the ball in the cup. Sometimes okay. yeah. you don't know where the what driver Where's is in what car. Where's he gone? He's over here. He's back in that car again. Um, so we go to the line. It's Randy Trong, and Randy has a zero spinning out on the first uh, transition on the last run. Again, new build, new car, everything just buttoned up last minute. He, you know Randy. He's smiling. He's laughing. Yeah. Only having a good time. This is like his third competition of all time, so it's not like he's a huge amount of experience, but he's out here smiling. Can he get a score on the board? Fire into that first corner. Seems like this car is kind of geared very awkwardly. Oh, reinitiation there as he comes to the first outside zone. Going to be shallow through two. Clutch kick, clutch kick, clutch kick. Eh, almost gets to three. This is this is this is what my driving would look like. He's definitely struggling with the car a little bit. We know he can drive better than this. So yeah, it looks like the car doesn't have a power to be in a higher gear. Yeah. And it's stuck in the lower gear, which gives it very little wheel speed. So he's working that car. That's not easy to do. No. But it does put a run on the board, and it's not the perfect run on the board. But it is one of those where he gets a score. And you definitely don't want to be double zeroing when in the Aussie World Tour. That's always like the little rib we give everyone at the end of the day. Uh. And you know what's happened to some of the best? Overdriving the car, getting double zeros. Yeah, you, you don't want to be that guy. I mean, they, they come over, they got a necklace for you, you know, you got to pay everybody's bar bill. It's just, it's it's embarrassing. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if you guys are in attendance at the end of qualifying, we really don't want anyone to go anywhere from your seats because we got a little surprise for everybody in attendance. Uh, we got Adam coming out here doing some giveaways. We've got, uh, you know, maybe see a little appearance from Daily Driven Exotics. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not giving too much away. But we're moving on to our next driver. It's going to be Trevor Jameson. Trevor Jameson scoring a pretty uh, mid-pack, mid-70 score on his first run of the 2JZ 240, 500 horsepower. Let's see if Trevor can up. I think he's, you know what? He had the makings of a brilliant run the last time. Just made an error into the last corner. Let's hope he can uh, tidy that up and put a good score on the board here. Trevor, uh, you know, this, this is a really smooth driver, and I like, the, I like his style, the way he doesn't over push the car. He's very much at one with the car, but a flick onto the first corner, in he goes. Yeah, I love, I love seeing the flick initiation. It really gets the car unsettled, and then you can kind of point it when you come around. It's a lot harder to do, but Trevor's natural, loves the flick, able to get to one, two, and three. Lots of angle in that transition, back on throttle again. Interesting way to run this line. We'll see how it plays out for him. Going a little bit wide there, backfire. Uh, uh, that's an extra point in my book. <laughs> then we get into the last set of zones, a little bit wide. Just another interesting way to run this track. Yeah, that's what again, I love. It, well, it's in, you get a lot of different characters, a lot of different styles, a lot, a lot of different builds, right? Yeah. And even in this track, which we've given them one line, they still find 10 different ways to do it. So <laughs> it's, a, it's another impressive thing about these guys. And I, I like the way the style sh shines true. Mm. Um, it was kind of a similar run to me that as his first run, smooth, uh, no major aggression anywhere. Um, so a score on the board of 79 for Trevor Jameson. Yeah, it was a little, I mean, it, it got some kind of herky jerky moments. When you throw a ton of angle like that, it scrubs yeah. speed. And then to try and get out of it, you either have to come off throttle or see if you can power around or over commit. Yeah. yeah. And hope it works out. Yeah. You got so, two options, and neither one's really all that great. Exactly. We want to Zandara Kennedy. Uh, she's got an LS3 in this 350Z, 500 horsepower. Pretty good score on the first one, as we said. Very precise on the line, but very tentative on and off throttle a lot. We want to see a little bit more aggression um, from our drivers, just to make sure that we know that they're not in their comfort zone. We want them a little outside of the comfort zone. That's what drifting is all about. Let's see how she can take to this second run. Not a lot to lose here. Score on the board. Should be able to uh, be a bit more expressive with this one. Very light faint there for Zendara Kennedy, getting the car transitioned back around through the first outside zone. A little bit shallow. Second outside zone, putting the car for the third. Not giving up on the second, but definitely compromising that to make sure she can get to the third. Floats the car out to fourth, going really wide there, scrubbing a bunch of speed, getting the car, you know, weight transferred back over into five, holding it into six, keeping the wheels in a great zone. A little bit wide on, on our last zone, but it was, that was good. good. It, was it was a, a good, good run. run. Again, it's kind of everything we want, yeah. but nothing more. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's kind of a solid run. It's for like me. a decent Caesar yeah. salad. It's just it's everything that I want, but like that's it. Yeah, there's not much more. Uh, there's not much more in it. But I mean, it's to me, it's a good run. There's no. I look at it from was it easy to chase? Yes. I yeah. mean, there's no major checkups. There's no major problems. But from that perspective, is it going to be as wild um, as a Mika Diaz run? That you know, is it going to be as precise as a Dylan Hughes run? Maybe not quite there. But uh, we move on to our next driver, Officer Dan. Do we have a score for that one? Yeah, we got a score. We got a 78.6. 78.6. My mistake. I was getting too excited. It's all good. On. Yeah. Trying to do, trying to read things. Every uh, time I see Dan, Officer Dan, I get excited. A little nervous too. I, I, just, I remember that he he did get buried alive in Stranger Things. 
um, and right. told him that he had previous experience when he did not. So that's the kind of guy that is behind the wheel of the car on track right now. Uh, well, the experience he does have is in drifting, yes. and Officer Dan knows how to party, knows how to throw down. We're seeing it here, like I said earlier, this car's been sitting cold for a little bit, hasn't seen competition, but Dan's not rusty, that's for sure. White seats, bold choice in this car, super stylish, love the high vis on it, and he's just having fun. Like, you can tell he is enjoying this run. Not perfect, definitely, you know, some commitment issues here and there. There it is. This, this is very quickly turning into a 360 comp with drifting warm-up. Yeah, I'm all for it. Not here, yeah. I mean, oh, stop it. Yeah, no, no, we, we uh, specifically yes, said no 360s. Please. Don't do it. Oh, no. no. <laughs> the, yeah, so Officer Dan putting in a great, uh, a great run. That, to me, that was better than his first run. It looked a lot better to me. Um, and I think from that perspective, you know, it, look, he, he's a pro, right? Ex-pro. Yeah. Um, and he's a pro at many things, but he is a... Uh, he's been buried alive, Yeah, he's been buried alive. <laughs> he's been a stunt driver for Breaking Bad. Have you seen his show? He's got, a, he's got a show. It's phenomenal. They just, like, they'll take old beaten down drift cars, get them running again. It's great. He, he does everything. He casually says things. You know when you say, any news to someone? He has news. Yeah. He'll give you back something that you're not expecting. That's that's <laughs> Officer Dan. So we move on to Lee Yearwood. Lee had a great first run. And what we liked about it was big impact from that RB, plenty of tire smoke, lots of commitment. Still in some areas he could tidy up, but he's you know sitting in the mid-80s right now. So this is a, one of those where he could take a risk on it. Go for the big run. And Lee Yearwood, for me, has it, has it in the tank. Yeah, it's there. It's there. He's got all the pieces. Got to put them together. And you're going to get one crazy puzzle. And there goes Lee initiating before anybody else has. And then gets the car to that first outside zone. Tons of smoke. He's, he's putting on a show at this point in time. But the nice thing is, because he's having fun, he's driving well. Could have been a little bit deeper on three. Pushing real hard out to four. A little bit wide. Lots of smoke, though. Lee's, Lee's here for the party in the line a second. Yeah, he, he's dri he's overdriving. <laughs> he, <laughs> is he's, sure. he is on a huge angle everywhere. He's trying to, and you know, I like the show. I think it's not. A, he's not trying to drive the track tentatively. He's trying yeah. to. He's trying to impress us. Not that we need much impressing when someone's got an RB and an E92, but it was a little bit probably more of a spicy run than we've seen from some of the drivers. Good stuff, um, but I think more mistakes than his first run. He, he kind of overdrove a little bit. I mean, you, you've got a decent score on your first run. You know, you know, you, yeah. there's a good chance you're making it to tomorrow, and maybe, maybe you get to drive more today. Who knows? Who knows? So why not? Why not overdrive? I would. I'll take someone overdriving over someone underdriving. The LZ the World Tour is the only place that if you don't perform in qualifying, you do more driving. So I think that's <laughs> quite. That's kind of like a, a roundabout way of saying that's what drifting should be all about. Yeah. Oh, no, I did bad in qualifying. I got so many more battles to do. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really happen in many uh, yeah, competitive series. You go home. Your punishment is more driving. Yeah, your punishment yeah. is you better yeah. go out there and drive more. Yeah, I had a rough weekend. I only put in 90 yeah. laps. Get some more seat time. <laughs> Come back to me at the end of the day. We'll see how you get on. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for the next run. And this is a guy I've been talking about, Mika Diaz. I thought he Ooh, had the stuff. Chili. He had the stuff to go top, but he messed up the last corner, so... It could happen again. You could just don't know. Again. He's probably the guy that has the most potential to either top qualifying or get a double zero. It's 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 both because they flip the coin here. Big Diaz comes off the start line in this BMW E46. Wild fires into that first initiation. Big angle. Transitions back. Gets onto outer zone one. Nice so far. Oh, pushing a little bit too wide. Flirting with disaster, but he stays on the track somehow to the center section. This is where he made the big error on the first run as he transitions back a lot more tentative this time. <laughs> Definitely not making the same mistake twice. And again, just a little waver towards the end of the run. A solid run from Mika Diaz as he comes across the line and, uh, and a, a sterling effort at a 360. Uh. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, yeah. It was definitely. You could. You could almost feel him tense up through that transition. You could also <laughs> feel the tension in all of our media staff when they come across you in that 360. Yeah, like, everybody yeah. in that far box <laughs> yeah. is like, uh, it's like, oh, this is this is fun. Yeah, that's being media though. I mean, you, you gotta you gotta take some risks and uh, make ideas. I mean, definitely took some risks early on, but uh, he got cautious. He got cautious. He learned. He he doesn't want to be a double zero kind of guy. Yeah. There was some errors in that, but I did like the style. He yeah. went with the big angle on the entry. Right, right there. Yeah. Though you could feel the hesitation as he transitioned. There was some mistakes. There was some wheels dropped. He went really wide up on the bank and stuff like that. But I, I enjoyed the style. Yeah. But I can see where we're, we're looking across the scores. I can see that if you're looking at it from a technical lead, there definitely was some errors across the board. Then we move back to uh, Sean Booth in the uh, rental S15 that everybody's just taking a go of uh, this, you know. It's Sean Booth it just loves drifting so much and other people drifting that he gives this car out almost every time we do this. But he's now in his own car. 
the S15 or B singing into that first corner. Sean firing in, nice line as he comes through there. You can see he's just a little bit out of gear as they come through there. Has to oh, and he's lost some uh, some stuff. Yeah, I think some napkins or some paper out of the car. And really wide line as he comes through. You can see he's just about geared enough for this track and it, not much more. This is good angle though as he comes towards that last section. Sean Booth taking down some cones. There's not going to be a tail light or bumper left on this car by the end of the season. It's just every time he cleans it up, I think you should just leave it. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. It doesn't even last to the event. Sean doing a 360 and then just kind of lighting it on a standstill. <laughs> um, yeah, expect wildness every time. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's Sean's it's it's the way of Sean. It's he's got to have fun. He's got to put on the show. You know, he's he's here for the lulls, right? And you might as well do it in an S15, which I know in Europe not a huge deal, but here seeing somebody just even break a tail like it's half the internet crazy. But Sean, I mean, a little bit of hesitation as he comes through that initiation through the transition part. You can see the car kind of waver. He's like, "There's one cone." knock that one down and I'm fairly certain we saw his insurance waiver fly out the window earlier <laughs> through the transition though back on throttle great drone shots there too bit of a left foot break to get the car settled another set of cones and then at this point in time he's just like yeah it's yeah, getting yeah, across I mean, the line look to explain the scoring on this one um, Sean Boot scoring a 78 so there's a lot of hesitations in there and it looked to me like his gearing he just didn't have enough speed to get out to the outer zones at some point so we had to kind of straighten up a little bit at times but still a very good run and very entertaining move on to Nate Hamilton Nate Hamilton was our top qualifier for a while with a 91 but he's been ousted by Dylan Hughes so back ball back in the court of Nate Hamilton now yeah. can he Your go move. a little wilder he's got a 91 so without a doubt I would imagine looking from experience he's going to sit in that top 13 either way with a 91 so he can go for broke here he can go to try and top qualify just for the pride just for you know uh, bragging rights in the new build just to show how good this thing is so Nate with the leash off let's see what he can do Big initiation there from Nate going wide, transitioning in the middle of the track there, but able to get back on the power through outer zone one and just sits it on the line. He's like, yeah, might as well trace this with the tires. Holds the car around. You can hear the two, like the stroke there, 2J popping off. Maybe a touch wide through the transition. Comes off throttle. A little more hesitation, a little smoother, a little quieter, a little softer. He gets through five, six. And way wide. That's a really good run again. Yeah. I mean, both. That's a dangerous man to be going up against this weekend if he's putting in run back to back to back yeah. like that. Um, another very very impressive run from from Nate Hamilton. Um, you know, we've, we've watched the, and the other thing is I don't know how he sees in the car because it gets so filled with smoke. I was just watching him coming through and I was like, it was pretty full of smoke in there. But a really good run again. Solid uh, performance from Nate Hamilton. And again, if that's the starting point with that car, right? Like, if that's the first event, the first qualifying runs, I'd be concerned for everybody in the game this year with Nate Hamilton driving like that. But I mean, he's always been a very good line. Yeah. Uh, as I said, always pleases the judges, does exactly what we want him to do. We say, go there, don't do this, and he does exactly that. Um, was it as perfect as Dylan's run? I don't think so, but it'll be very close. An 89 in the second run for Nate Hamilton. 91 from his first run, still his highest score. As you move to Dmitry Brutsky on the start line, Dmitry is... Uh, on an 88 from the first run, so a very good run all the same. And he only had one big error, which was at uh, Clipping Zone 1, which is after the initiate, then transition, he kind of locked all four just to adjust the car. Did a great job of it, but it is a little deduction. You shouldn't need to do it because you've yeah. gone there a little too fast. So from that perspective, I think there's only a couple of areas that Dimitri can improve on, and he could go top here. So exciting times. I hope uh, everyone here in California is having a good time during qualifying. And we are moving towards the business end and wrapping things up. We got a little surprise for everybody in attendance at the end of qualifying, so don't leave your seats because, you know, we're bringing the show this weekend. We can do whatever we want. That's the great thing. This is no series. This is just nonsense. We can do what we want, and we're going to do it. Dimitri Brutsky throwing it in in that first corner, going nice and wide. Watch this on the transition back. Settles the car nicely onto that outer zone. This is good stuff. Yeah, yeah Dimitri he knows what he needs to do now. He is a very competitive person, so he's going to look at his pass score and go, yeah, I'm going to do a lot better. I don't know where that cone came from. I think he brought it with him. But as we get through the last sets of zones there, you're, you can see the left foot brake to hold the car back. Like, there is, yeah. there is a lot of grip you know, in this car, I, I say, a lot of grip yeah, in the that tires. That car looks like it struggles because the track is smaller. It's yeah. just struggling to actually maintain angle at times. It wants to grip up, and he's doing a great job of it. Another great run from Dimitri for me. Um, I'm going to say probably a little better than his first run, to be honest. Okay. All right. I think I'll take little, that. A little bit better than his first run. There's less inputs. You know, he wasn't, yeah. he wasn't he fighting. Has, he has the pace. He has the impact. He's definitely doing the line. And it's a 90.6 for Dimitri Bruski. 90.6. Really good stuff. Not bad. Not bad from Dimitri. Mr. Never Settle. 
I haven't, no. I haven't heard if he's confirmed 100% that he's driving pro. He's, I think he's on both lists, pro, like really? pro spec and pro. Yeah. He should drive it because he never settles. He does not settle. No, he, and yeah. he'll be settling for pro spec again, I think. We won, yeah, so don't won, settle. Go won to pro. pro spec three times. That's, yeah, that's, that's how a lot. little settling that's a lot. he's done. Yeah. That's a lot of pro spec. <laughs> that's a lot of pro spec. Okay, we get it. You've done yeah. it. Like, I've done the math. <laughs> yeah, you've won. So here's the man <laughs> sitting at the moment with a 95 on the board. Dylan Hughes has only himself to beat right now as he is the top qualifier as it stands. He's definitely going to make top 13 with that score, 100%. So basically, he can do whatever he wants now, and this could be a bit more of a flare run. Not well, that it will be. I think he can kind of, you know, say whatever he wants to do now. He can do whatever he wants to do. 360s through the middle of the course and get a zero. It's not going to really affect him in the overall scoring. So let's see what Dylan could do as he comes off the line firing. Big angle. You can see perfect line again. This is where he does it so well. He goes to this line super early, on throttle early before the line. Again, a little bit more of an error than on his first run there. Kind of tried to push a little bit too fast maybe, but look how much control he has over this car as he fires through. He doesn't have any major corrections. A little handbrake there as he goes through. Um, maybe not as perfect as his first run, but it goes to show that it's definitely, it's almost, you know, enough for a second or third or fourth place qualifying yeah. run. Dylan Hughes really enjoying, I think, this tight technical circuit in this chassis. Yeah, he's he's selected phenomenal gearing for this. And I think that's one of the, the most important parts. I don't know if this has a quick change in it, but if it does, he's picked the gear. If not, he's gotten really, really lucky. And uh, I, I do think that's a huge reason as to why he's able to get through the course the way he is. He's got the right wheel speed, he's in the RPM range, he's got the turbo spooled up the whole time. Um, yeah, just... His score is still in the 90s, but not as good as his first run, so it's a 91. Okay. He has a 90. Oh, no, 91. Yeah. Uh, terrible. Yeah. Awful run from Dylan Hughes there. Only a 91. <laughs> Too terrible. Bad. Yeah. You know who he should be more like? Dylan Hughes from the first run. That, yeah. That's a good driver. Be you, you want to be that 30 guy. minutes ago. Yeah, be you in the past. Learn from that's, yourself. <laughs> learn from yourself. Go have a word with Dylan Hughes. He'll tell you what to sort out, Dylan yeah. Hughes. So we move on to our next driver. It's going to be Dean Carnage Carney, representing Hyper NFT. He you know, has struggled on the first run. It's got to be said, um, this is a practice car. It was in many Lego pieces when I saw it two days ago in the workshop. So I think they threw this thing together for the weekend. But um, it's a tough car to drive smooth, the Viper. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Formula Drift, the corners are so big, the power is so big that you can get a lot of that. It's not as tight technical transitions. And that's where this chassis doesn't excel. But Dean's given it a good fun uh, weekend this weekend. He doesn't really care too much. But this is a, a better initiation as Carney throws it into that second. Oh, and he's overcooked it. He's overcooked it. You can see the car has no forgiveness no. at all. The minute you go over a point, it goes, get out. You're basically driving it from the back seat. You're that far back. It's 90% hood. Re it's sitting on the rear tire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm sure, you know, the, just the pendulum effect of, of how that car swings around. If it rotate, over rotates even slightly, it's it's gone. Exactly. So yeah. th that's the thing about all, all of these runs is that you got to remember the chassis does have quite a bit to do with it. And I think Dean has dialed the pro car in so much that it's, it's probably knife edge but the practice car goes to show that that's why you don't see 45 dodge vipers out here drifting around because it's a tough car to drive yeah yeah it's yeah I, I, I do i still don't know why he sticks with it because he's irish and he's stubborn that's ah, the problem that's we, what it is? yeah someone said that's a, that's not a good idea Dean. he's like I'll, I'll tell you what's not a good idea and then 15 years of driving the car do, he do figured you, it out do you think he's gonna win a championship and be like yep we're done he's, he's gonna, gonna go to like, that man's house oh, and be like i told you currently win the championship in a dodge viper that's like winning it on the hardest difficulty you can in drifting so it's an impressive feat that he's still right in the mix and podiums in that car numerous times in formula drift so next up we've got jeff jones he got a zero on his first run jeff right. come on now a zero on the first run. He tried to overcook it. He got out on the marbles. He's going to be a little... I think that's Jeff Jones, though. He probably won't. He'll just go crazy again. So let's see what happens as he comes off the line. Yo, Jeff going, going early. Yeah. He started his initiation sometime last week, but he made it work, and he's getting back on the throttle. So we just need to see, can Jeff hold it together? Can he stay out of the double zero? Can he get away from not having to pay everybody's bar bill? And this is, this is where it is. And he gets it. He gets through. Perfect. Keeps the car. Yeah, no, yeah. this is actually a great looking run. Oh, Little one. Yeah. I, announcer's curse, man. You shouldn't have said anything. I shouldn't have said anything. Well, we, I, I always wonder if we just say everyone's terrible, will we get the best day of drifting? Because right? every time we commend someone, they immediately make a mistake. We could try that. We could. We could do a run where it all we do is talk about how bad it is. No one would speak to us again. No. But it would be very entertaining. We'd have no friends. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff did a good job. Early initiation, I liked that. I thought the early initiation was good. It was precise up to that point, but it was a bit of an error towards the end of the run. It's got to be said. Um, and, and like from that perspective, you know, you could do so much right on this circuit and then one moment and all of a sudden you've knocked over some cones. The cones are there just to exaggerate the mistake. So it, they are, they've given you enough overhang. You're probably like 
six feet over that clipping zone when you hit them. So you're way off the track. And we always say back in Europe, if we put a concrete wall around the whole track, you would be dead. So right. that's how big a mistake that is. You know, you can't go that deep into a corner. So that's sometimes you'll see there's not a huge amount of danger on this track, but then if you put those cones there, realistically, if we brush a cone, fine. If you're smashing through them all, you're way off track, and that's that's going to be a big deduction. Meaning that Jeff sits with a 73 as his best of the two scores right now. But Jeff is a bit of a tandem man. Mm. He will not. He could win the whole thing from there. It doesn't really matter. He's a chasey boy. He is, and, he, he, and I think that's where he's going to shine later on. We move on next to Odie Bacis. Odie with a very Solid first run. Yes. Did everything right. Now we want to see a little bit of a pickup and flair, a little bit of pickup and risk, and we know he's got the stuff to do that. Odie's going to throw this one down for sure. Nice initiation there from Odie. Big angle, holding it through, setting those rear wheels on that line as it comes to the first outside zone. I know. It's it's like watching art, watching Odie drive sometimes. Through two, through three. Could have been a little bit deeper in three. Very long, smooth transition into four, and then back on throttle. Scrub speed with angle well on throttle. Not an easy thing to do. Through five, through six. <sighs> Dylan Hughes better be worried. Yeah, I mean, he, he figured it out. He, he, he figured out that he early did. transition, come on, the, on, on the, a lot earlier. Um, from that perspective, though, compared to Hughes and Hamilton, he wasn't as deep in some of the zones as we would have liked to see. Okay. It was super smooth. Yeah. Probably the smoothest run of any driver today. But just that little bit of flair and aggression when it comes to like edge of the bank there, getting up into the zone, you know, flirting with the edge of the track. It was a very safe, precise run from Odie. And I think he, he would have been, uh, he'd know himself. There was no point in that run that Odie was uncomfortable. No. It was perfectly. But I think I want to see a little bit of uncomfortable. A bit like, I've gone too fast. What am I <laughs> going to do now? And they get away with it. And that's what we saw a little bit with Dylan Hughes, with Nate Hamilton some of those guys that they were right on the edge of a disaster and that's what makes us excited as fans as judges and that's what we want to see that, that's what gets you into like the deep 90s right oh is for that, sure is, is that that 10 you that gotta last have 10%. A, as a judge you have a moment where you're like he is definitely going to just crash here and he doesn't that goes way up in the 90s if he can pull that off that's that's an emotional response from a judge right. where you go that's I haven't seen somebody do that before and get away with it. My guess is on the start line, he's got a very good score. Again, he's in the high 80s as it is. It was a safe, solid, perfect run. But will Michael Essa, who was the man who designed this track a couple of weeks ago, well, now he's got to uh, go out there and try and be the best on it. So let's see what Michael Essa can do. Boys from DDE here this weekend. Mike Nasser throws into that first corner. Big angle transition, but early transition. This is what we want to see. A little waver, but he makes it work. A lot for breaking from Mike Nasser as he takes it now up to this bank section. Stay on it. Not super deep in the zones, but very consistent again. No major errors. Dials on the angle late to outer zone five as he transitions back. This is very smooth, very beautiful. Absolutely, again, similar to the run from Odie. No mistakes, solid pro driving. Absolutely no fear at any point was he going to make a major error there. I really like how Essa kind of adds a little bit more throttle right before he transitions. You know, a lot of guys are, are off throttle, can get the car, yeah. can snap back around. But if you watch Essa, he'll actually throw a little bit more throttle in just before he comes off. So. And the thing, I've, I've actually scored both his runs without looking down the exact same. No it way. was almost like he was on a scale electric track, just doing the same thing. That is a skill in itself. Yeah. And that's a guy that you might go, oh, he's not winning qualifying. Remember, nobody ever remembers who wins qualifying. You remember who wins the event. And those guys don't make mistakes, which is, makes them so dangerous when they get into the tandems later on they just don't make mistakes and that's a very hard thing to do when you look at how many variables are happening in a drift lap how many inputs how many things you're doing and they still got there Matt Field now lines up he has the stuff to do it to go out he took a pretty risky first run he didn't make it perfect but he did have the flair yeah and that flair is something we're looking for we want to see someone do something crazy Matt's coming at the blocks flying here with a lot of aggression very early initiation and fires in a pretty big angle into that first corner yeah very very quick coming out of the blocks as you said big left foot break through the first outside zone i'm expecting some red line here by the end of this run Almost, yeah, you can see he's holding that car back. He's using all of his right foot, using the left foot on the brake just to hold it back. See how Matt transitions through here. Oh, that looked like it could have been bad. He's using all the angle kit to hold it back, though. That was... Yeah, and you see, we, we would look at that. I mean, it's a really good run. I'm yeah. just going to pre preface that by saying very good run. But yes. here's where we would deduct. 
off throttle at some point means he's gone too fast and he's got to let it grip. Right. A little a lot of left foot braking almost to a standstill at points just to steady the car. They're what's going to get you a good score but not an amazing score because you want that, you know, constant speed throughout the track. With Matt, it was like a burst of speed and then a big left foot brake burst of speed and a left foot brake. And that, you know, is tough to chase when you're in the chase position because you're not expecting the lead car to stall up like that. That would cause us issues if we were at a chase car, hit him towards that last corner. We'd be starting, you know, oh, what happened? Did he go too fast, too slow? Right. So you're not seeing a lot of that from some of the, you know, the 90 runs we're seeing here. But a really good run all the same. Matt Field scoring an 85 on that. So I'm only explaining the tiniest of deductions here when that was a very, very good run. We move on to the star line. It's T-Pain, zero on the first run. Everybody here in California has got to give a cheer for T-Pain. This is a big step up for him. He's following in four to five Formula Drift drivers in his first ever competition. This is not something a normal human being would do. And in my first competition, there was about four people and a dog watching, which is what happens to most drifters. But for T-Pain's situation, he's got all of you guys here in attendance, so give him some words of encouragement. We want to hear you from the grandstands, giving him a big shout out if you can pull this off. It's a tough one though. This is a tough track to just set in straight away. In, in what is essentially like a stock setup with angle kit Mustang, like, let's go. Let, let's, I'm, I'm just pumped for him. I mean, I'm so stoked to see that he's doing this. Look at that. Could jump through outside zone one, could have been a little deeper and through up into the bank. Still hitting the zone though. Get the tire smoke out. Transition, the hardest part, I mean, an interesting part of that line, because you get the car back around, still touching the zone. I think he's going to make this yeah, work. I think he's going to do it. No double zero. Oh, there you, you got go. the pay room bar bill, Dave. California makes some noise Good for the job, one and only T-Pain in his first ever qualifying session ever. That's not bad at all. That's not bad, not at, bad all. at all. And you know what? There's going to be some people on that grid that are going to be really annoyed with the scoreboard <laughs> when the man who never drifted before on a competitive <laughs> level does a better score than them. I'm, I'm not naming names, but you'll see them on the scoreboard. Give it up for T-Pain one time, everybody. Really impressive stuff. And he's all smiles. You can imagine, you oh. know, this is... He looked calm at the yeah. line, too. I you mean, know? He looked relaxed. He looked nervous this morning, and I yes. was going... You being nervous of this yeah. makes me frightened for how unnervous you are of what you do yeah. in front of a hundred thousand people, Standing a million in front people. Of a stadium. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I guess it's it's comfort zones, right? It's all about comfort zones. T Pain getting a seventy, a seventy dead for T Pain on the board gets a score, and we move back to the start line. It's going to be Hurt now. If Hurt gets out qualified by T Pain, Ooh. we may have a big, big problem in Nappy Boy <laughs> Automotive because. Hurt has that little bit more experience, but he's driving a car he's never driven before today. So the boys are out here having fun, all smiles all around. They said it's just a party, it's a good time, they want to hang out. And they said, oh, we'll give the competition a go too. But hey, look at that, he's, he's dancing the in the car. Yeah. You know the worst thing is? There's probably no music. He's just got that much <laughs> entertainment. He is just, he's remembering a song. It's how he, it's how he travels. He <laughs> just, he dances everywhere. He dances everywhere. Let's see what Hurt can do as he throws in. Oh, a lot of aggression in the GTO as he fires through the big angle, but can he slow it down? It's gonna to be tough to slow that car down. Oh, he gets away he with it. it. Nice job from Hurt, and this is a much better run than his first run. A little shy of that outer zone, but we'll, we'll um, as he transitions back, look at that, you can see him working the wheel. That thing doesn't look like it self-corrects very well as he transitions back again. Oh, just gotta stretch it out, give it a kick. Oh, oh, no! It looks like he's blown an axle, I think, in that car. It looked like one wheel just stopped moving, and I mean, this is so rare because Hart's never broken a car never before. Never once. This must be the first time he's ever had any mechanical difficulty at an event. Unprecedented things. And you know what? That's going to be a zero, but he's still going to out-qualify T-Pain. But, <laughs> but, but Jacob, it's not a great amount. It's, no. it's only two points, so I'm just saying. Yeah. I presume he came in as the number one driver in Nappy Boy Automotive. Not but so could, much. It could change. It yeah. could change. You don't want to go anywhere. No. History in the making. Ooh. Next up, we have Colette Davis warming up. She got a you know mid 80 score for the first one, a very smooth run, and she's been killing it all day. Great runs. She hasn't made very many mistakes. I hate saying it because then they always make a mistake when I say it. But what I, I think she has got the confidence now to go and put a big run in here. Yeah, I loves agree. this car. Seems to gel really well with the Corvette, and uh, definitely a car that we don't miss on track. We see every bit of it because it's that bright. Do you see the uh, chandelier in her trailer? I did. There's not one, but three. Oh, three, three chandeliers yeah. in her trailer. And uh, definitely a first. I've never seen that before. I think we need more of that. Well, Donnie was like, that's how she rolls. Yeah, like, no, I'm, we need, I'm we, all for it. No, we need more of that. I mean, we, very, we It made, made every trailer look very boring, after Yeah, that. exactly. Like, a, a great looking livery is one thing, but a great looking trailer yeah. livery. I don't Interior. know if I, so you got to walk into a shop and say, I need some chandeliers. And what room are you putting in? Not a room. Trailer. <laughs> 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 Here we go. Colette Davis comes off the start line. 
Nice pace into the first corner, big angle. And she throws it in and gets early to that outside white line. That is the correct line that we want to see. Early transition, lots of pace. Just dropping a little shallow of some of those zones, just coming off thrall and missing some of those zones. And the line was pretty solid up to that point. But she does this expertly. Look at this, dialing the angle into that Corvette, slows it right down, not over committing. And another very smooth run. I can see when we come to tandem action later on today. She's going to be tough to beat, making very few errors, but just a little bit more precision on that run would have done a lot. But hey, 360 for the win at the end. There we go. Even just the way she came across the line at the very end, like lots of angles, still carrying the momentum of the car. And and just throughout the entire day, first couple runs, very hesitant and just getting into it very slowly, very calculated until she gets to the point where, where she's driving like this. So not the best run that we've seen from her so far, but definitely a, a phenomenal run from Colette Davis. It just, yeah, it's just great to see the progression that she's made, not only today, but in the sport in general. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just been cool to, to watch her throughout the entire time. Yeah, and again, such an inspiration for so many females wanting to get into the sport yeah. that she's out here and she's ripping with everybody. And again, all smiles, all, yeah. no matter what happens, all smiles. So we move on to our last three drivers. We move up next to the Australian. Mm. The man that could shake things up definitely in the tandems later on. It is Luke Fink. He's on his second qualifying run. His first run had a couple of errors. It wasn't perfect. wasn't bad at all, though, either. And Luke doesn't care about qualifying other than it being top. Nothing else matters. It's going for that big run. So he should probably go for a safe one, put himself in the top 13. But he's not going to do that, is he? No. So here we go. It is Luke Fink off the line. Fires in that first corner very wide. Big ankle again. Oh, definitely throwing that car to the max. This is pretty much a jumped up street car, by the way. So he is getting everything out of it. This is a big run so far. Luke Fink putting on a show right now. As he transitions back, this is where he made a mistake the last time. Not so much this time. Late on the throttle, exactly what we want to see. This is almost inch perfect from Luke Fink as he fires to the outer zones on the track. That is a monstrous run in a car wow. that he has taken across the country on the street. There it is. One-handed 360. Still has an app. And the wipers speakers. go on. <laughs> yeah. That's a big one. That is a big run. Uh, this is... This, I, I, I don't know how many people caught this, but in the Ben Hobson RTR announcement, Luke Fink was mentioned as one of the options. Yeah, but you see, they don't have, there's bumper budgets and then there's Luke That's, Fink's That was it, budget. that was all it was. Yeah. They just, they there were like, we can't no, afford him. There may be no Mustangs left. Yeah, we that can't be, afford they, Luke Fink. Yeah. <laughs> they were <laughs> like, oh, was it the electric car that stopped the Mustang? I was like, no, it was Luke Fink. He just crashed all of them. Every in, single in, in one. In one yeah. season. Yeah. Yeah. Ford, Ford had to call yeah. down. Ford had, were producing more uh, <laughs> chassis than Vaughn at that point to keep him going. <laughs> but it's fun all the way and it's a big score. It comes in at a 93 no. for Luke Fink. What? 93 on the board for Luke Fink in what is a jumped up streetcar. Impressive stuff. And we move on to our last two drivers, which are TJ Hunt and Adam LZ. TJ Hunt in the party car, the 370Z, the Supra, having some steering issues. They didn't get quite worked out. He said, oh, I'm not going to be competitive. Well, you know what? He did a pretty good first run, and he's been pretty solid throughout practice, and you never know. At these LZ World Tour events, we've had SORs on the podium. We've had stock VQs on the podium. Stranger things have happened. TJ Hunt hoping for a little bit more of a precise run than his first as he fires into that corner. Nice so far. A lot of momentum. you got to do it, though, with the 370Zs. You've got to fire with a lot of momentum. A good line so far. Just dropping a little bit off the edge of the track, but doing a good job. This is a much better run than his first run so far. As he goes, so this is a tricky part of the track. You got to stay committed, stay out wide. Does a good job though, and then into the last corner. This is a very nice line, taking out a couple of cones, but we won't uh, dock him too much for that. Just dropping out of an outer zone as well. TJ doing a good job. He's up against it. I mean, these guys with very low horsepower have very little room for maneuvering. And that for break for them means they just stop. Yeah, pretty much. He, used, he basically opened up the toolbox of, of drifting things you can do and just used all of them. So, you know, we see weight transfer here. We see the same thing, a left foot brake dive to get the car to lean forward to get the back end to come around. Bunch of clutch kicks here to keep the car going. Holds onto the throttle as much as he can, holding that steering input. Great transition. Like, TJ is, TJ is as pro level as anybody else that's on the track right now, and he's using everything available, including yeah. sending one of the cones to space. 100%. That leaves us that's a 78 on the board for TJ Hunt, leaving us with one run remaining, which is Adam LZ. Now, guys, don't go anywhere if you're in attendance, because Adam's going to come down. I'm going to go down. We're going to have a chat with everybody. And we got some surprises for you. So we got to finish qualifying with a more exciting send-off than any qualifying session before. But before we get there, Adam's got to do his second run. This is going to be a good run. I mean, obviously, he's got a lot of things that uh, that Adam's got to look forward to. You know, it's, it's the most powerful car here. As we said, this is basically a pro-level car that Adam has brought out, and uh, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what he's able to do with it. it. It's a lot of horsepower, it's a lot of grip, it's a lot of craziness, 
you know, on four wheels. So see what Adam is able to do here. Love the camera. Look at the intensity. I mean, for a guy that's so fun loving, he definitely gets real intense when it comes to race time. Let's grab the e-brake and you're off. See Adam coming out of the line, lighting them up nice and early. Big initiation, floating the car out. Good line there, early transition to get the car settled through the first outside zone, going into the second outside zone and just absolutely destroying this accelerator right off the bat and getting the car out. Oh, a little too wide. Can he save it? He does save it somehow. Adam LZ able to put it all together. So many drivers would have given up at that point. They would have throttled down and come off and spun the car around, but... Adam able to put it together. Speaking of putting the car around, I, I, I spot, whoa! All right. Well, we might have to have a quick call to the fire crew. We, uh, that bumper is melted immediately as the media staff is letting him know, hey, you need to calm down a little bit there. He might be here in here. We're uh, definitely got some fire in the back. He, uh, I'm hoping that's just old tire. <laughs> Gotta do it for the gram, right? Round of applause for Adam LZ putting on the biggest show to wrap up qualifying as the fire crews come out. What what's an Adam LZ event without a fire crew? At least one. Looks like we're all right. It's a a little bit leftover accelerators that uh, decided to spontaneously combust, but I do think we're going to need a new bumper. So let's take a look at this run again. Adam lighting the tires off right out of the gate. Big gangster initiation there. Transitioning the car around. First outside zone, second outside zone. Could have been a little bit deeper through those, so maybe, you know, the, the judges may pull some points back just for that section. But right here, full lock using everything in that FDF angle kit and able to get the car back around and transition. Wow, I, I think so many drivers would have spun out at that point and then keeping it going and then this is it right here. You see him pop off, the bumper immediately starts burning. I'm not sure there's paper bumpers apparently. But everything looks all right other than, you know, we wasted one bumper. All right, we're gonna throw it down to the ground, get a quick interview, maybe Adam's got some insight, but uh, what a crazy run, what a crazy way to uh, wrap, up, wrap up qualifying. I think Dave's, Dave's teleported down there already. Not yet. We're live. We're like, Adam, what happened? Does anyone in the audience have a spare E36 rear bumper? <laughs> we were supposed to come out here and give things away to them, not ask them for stuff for you. So you did your qualifying run, the car went on fire, but it seems to be okay, right? But it's a lot, the track is a lot of fun, right? Yeah, no, it's super fun. Um, I thought everyone was just cheering on my burnout. I kept looking at them, and then I saw Mike's mouth go, fire, fire. I was like, oh, man. That happens when you do, when you do big burnouts. Things catch on fire. This happens when you fix cars and make them pretty. You and Sean Booth today came with pretty cars. They're not pretty anymore, but now they're ready for battle. Guys, once again, if you're in California, give it up for Adam LZ! Now, we are out here because we're, this is kind of halfway through the show. We wanted to thank everybody for coming out. We really appreciate you guys supporting events like this. We love doing them because, as you can see, it's such a mix of personality, characters, cars, everything involved. And Adam, this is your brainchild, and these people are hyped on it. So once again, a big round of applause for Adam LZ for putting all this together. And this is our first West Coast event, right? So we've done events all over the world now. We've been in Ireland, Australia, Canada. We've been everywhere. But people told me that everybody on the West Coast is a little wilder than the people on the East Coast. And I'm going to try and test that out. So I'm going to give you guys one shot to make some noise. California, three, two, one, make some noise! They're, they're pumped. So, Adam, 
One of the people we want to thank this weekend is Tire Streets. They've done something no one else has done in drifting, giving all the drivers tires. As a driver, what does that mean to you? Well, first off, I just want to apologize. My words are a little jumbled up. I'm still getting over the fact that I was just on fire in my E36. But um, it's amazing. Tire Streets came on board and was down to help all these drivers out so we can all run the same exact tire, which makes for the most epic competition. You know exactly what the person you're driving with has. You know that your speed's going to be similar, so you can drive at your limit. You can push your... All right, so we're having a couple of small technical difficulties. Don't worry, we'll get some more info from Dave and from Adam. We'll get this interview done for you because uh, I, I want to know. I want to know what happened here. But we will, uh, we will check in here. Don't worry, we'll get this sorted for everybody. One, two, one, two. Wait, we have a microphone back. Just worked out, just worked out. California, make some noise! It's live TV, live TV, ladies and gentlemen. Adam, we were just saying, before you were really interrupted by 20 minutes of silence, that Tire Street's coming out here giving everybody these tires. This is a game changer for drifting. Yes. All the drivers being on the same tire, getting to push our machines, push our skills to the limit. Tire Streets did something that's unheard of in drifting. I'm so appreciative for it. I know all the drivers are, and I want to get a massive round of applause going for Tire Streets. So what we're going to do is we're going to give away some tires, right? Because these people have tires and they're often on streets and tire street said maybe we should give tire streets away a, a set of tires to somebody who's watching it at home or here in attendance right all right so i got a really easy thing for you guys to do i need you to take out your phones all right first thing i need you to do is take a selfie i'm just kidding you don't need to do that uh follow at the lz world tour follow tire streets on your phone on instagram and one lucky winner is going to be picked and we're going to announce it during the top 16 come I want to give a massive thank you to Tire Streets again for supplying all the drivers with tires, and one of you guys will get luckily uh, picked to win a set during the top 16. We are giving one of you guys a set of tires, which is pretty good. You guys have wasted enough of them. They deserve some as well. And we also have a very special prize. These are the tires. In case you don't know what tires look like, this is what they look like. Black and round. We also have something else we want to give away, which is a special edition MPI steering wheel. And I am going to say that what we should do is give this away to the wildest fan in Bakersfield. So what we're going to do is we're going to get everybody here to stand up. Everybody stand up in the whole stand up. And we're going to have a look at who the wildest fan. This is a limited edition steering wheel. This is, so hold on, on the count of three, we want you to go what? Three, two, one, let me hear you. What about over here? Over here? Or over here? Or maybe over here? Oh, that kid right there was swinging his shirt. Right there. We have a winner. We have a winner. He was, he was, you with the shirt off. It's you, bud. <laughs> he was the craziest from the beginning before he even took his shirt off. So, well deserved. I'll get it over to you somehow, but I'm not going to throw it. 
I'm just thinking that no matter where we go in the world, there's always someone with their shirt off that gets the win. So I'm just saying we, we are all uh, basic in that sense. You guys having a good time? I think we should do something a bit more special for you guys because I'll be honest, we weren't going to do this till tomorrow. But how many of you guys are here today and not tomorrow? Hands up. Yeah, right. So we did a man of peer pressure. So if we get enough of a cheer, he can't say no. We're live also, so he can't say no. So one more time, California, make some noise! Do you guys want to see a drift Lamborghini? Where is Damon? So Damon said he wasn't driving today, but I feel like we might be able to convince him. Adam's car went on fire. We got a drift Lamborghini on track, and the kid took his shirt off. That's all you've ever wanted from an event. And we were watching a thumbnail. In a, everybody stand up for the thumbnail. Everybody up in the grandstand. California, make some noise! And we have a Lamborghini on track, and I have no idea what's happening, and it doesn't matter, and it doesn't make sense. Here we go. Everybody give it up for Damon Fryer from DDE. for David from TDE! One more time, guys. Give it up for Daily Driven Exotics, bringing the Lambo out for your entertainment. And we're just getting warmed up. We're just getting warmed up. We're only finished qualifying. We're heading to the last chance, top 16 miles, very, very shortly. You guys having a good time? We are back in about 30 minutes' time. Get yourself some refreshments. Step out, grab some merch from LZMFG, Drift, HQ, and all the rest. We're back in 30 minutes. Guys at home, don't go anywhere. we got Drift Lamborghinis, E36 is on fire, and we're only getting warmed up. We'll see you soon. Take care.
Sony ECU, internal wideband, e throttle control, all the motorsport functions. You can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer, which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those features I have thanks to Link ECU. That's all he needs. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely big shout out to Link ECU. Tire Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tires, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com. episode in the saga of the E36 bound for Europe for Driftmasters. She's running, we're picking up where we left off in the last video, about to pull it inside, hop on the dyno, and see what kind of numbers we can put out of this thing, but man, it is so cool seeing this thing on the ground. It's been a long time coming, but uh, it's cool. I can't wait to drive this thing. All right, before we get on the dyno, I want to give a formal welcome back to none other than Freddie. How's it going? It's been cool watching Freddie on the sidelines. He's progressed his tuning a ton. This car is very important to me to have the absolute highest level of everything possible. But I do want to address the elephant in the room. It's been a while. We, we kind of had a falling out. And uh, rather than just like ignoring it completely, I thought we'd give you a little bit of a backstory. So what, uh, what happened? Oh, man. <laughs> Life happened. I was starting my tuning career at one point and um, I met Adam, we became friends. I, I wanted to like, join his team full time, but uh, honestly though, like the stress was pretty huge to take on. I moved my entire life. I ended up living with Adam for about four months in his guest bedroom. <laughs> and then I moved to the compound and the, and the house here. And it was just a lot to take on. Uh, it just like really wasn't for me, but I had a fun time with everyone, the guys, 
uh, we always look back and we like laugh about all the good times we had. Yeah, I think on both sides, like communication probably could have been better. And uh, again, I feel like this is probably, it's hard to do in real life to, to squash beef, right? It's even harder to do it on YouTube. And we're doing it to like, this, like to hold the camera and talk about a situation yeah. like this is not an easy thing. But I think it's important just for you guys, obviously, like in life, your shit, shit happens and you could either get over it and make amends or you could not. And we did, we did the latter. So I'm yeah. stoked to have you back. I always say an EC is only as good as your tuner. And I, you've definitely leveled up even more than you already were before. So I'm very excited for you to put your hands on the, the new E36. Yeah. And this is super awkward to do on camera, right? Like in person, we're <laughs> hanging out, we're friends, we're hanging out, we can crack jokes, no problem. Do we squash this a while ago? And like even yesterday, it was awkward filming you just because I'm like, man, I don't want the comment people to, to attack or make assumptions or whatever. So we put it out there. The elephant in the room is dead. Yeah. It's been over a year since we started kind of hanging out and talking. Uh, Adam has helped me indirectly with my clients and or friends. And I have indirectly helped Adam with some of his builds um, by helping Johan or Sean with details about stuff. We've been like silent supporters. Yeah, we've <laughs> been kind of hanging out. And then one day we're just like, hey, what's up? And then we, uh, we figured it out from there. But yeah, this is awkward. Uh, on camera, everything's fine. Don't mind me. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, you are always a little awkward. I'm always a little awkward, man. But if you can help my audience learn more about tuning and teach me more too, yeah. we'll deal with awkwardness. Yeah. I'll try. All right. Uh-oh. Oh, jeez. First pull, and now you guys are in the machinery room. <laughs> Can't take the builder out the engine builder. Gotta do something, you know? The other big changes for this year is that this car is running all link electronics, ECU, sensors, dash, keypad. You guys know that I've been familiarizing myself on the other cars, other builds, trying to understand the software more, getting to know and be familiar so that I could take a car like this across the seas and go compete and feel 100% confident in what we got. So I would say for the most part, this car has all your average sensors that you would see in any build, but some of the things that are different on a car of this caliber, you might see we have individual EGT probes and what that does is it measures the temperature at each exhaust runner and allows you to trim the fueling per cylinder to ensure that all the cylinders are within spec. You can make sure that they are correct temperatures and in that you can also prevent damage if you have an issue with an injector. It lets you kind of identify the problem before it becomes a problem. Also another useful tuning tool, you see we have a bung in the collector. This goes through a little diffusion thingy bobber, and then this tells you what the back pressure is which helps you Freddie, explain back pressure really quick. 30 second explanation. Uh, you, you would like your back pressure to be the same as your inlet manifold pressure. Keep the engine as efficient as possible. If your back pressure goes higher than your intake manifold pressure, the engine is essentially a smaller engine. It thinks it's smaller, it flows less, temperatures go up, detonation goes up. It's not happy. It actually gets quieter Interesting. the higher the back pressure goes up. Really, really useful tool, especially when you're choosing uh, which AR you want to run for a turbo. We already know because we've done this before with a very similar engine that we're running a 121 Garrett housing. Um, however, it's still useful with tuning. There are differences with heads and differences with exhaust where you can spot stuff a little bit sooner and you can decide where you want to leave boost at, um, where like he said, the back pressure is happiest. Now you can go past that, but it's a law of diminishing returns and then that's, that's where you would uh, call it the, the danger to manifold tune. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe no danger to manifold, but no, no, we um, got the burst plate so we're good. If you have too much back pressure, what's the usually the weak point? Is it the head gasket? Is it the head? Head gasket or pistons? Got it. All right. Well, oh, another belt. That uh, that's been the uh, the issue so Third. far. What's going on with the belt, Johan? We don't have a water pump, so we cannot run the same system as the. Or the E36 when it comes to that pulley that a drift HQ sells. So I added an idler down here and rerouted the belt in a way where we could use the that um, water pump delete and just do all the tensioning at the water pump delete. So we adjust the tension with that alternator. Um, but unfortunately, we are running into an issue with the belt. It's flying off back to the same blue 36 problems. 
Uh, we wanted to keep things just like the other car where we worked out, worked out all the kinks with the belt and all the issues. These are coming back, so now we're trying to figure out what can we do to misalign it before we start pretty much talking about switching to maybe an electric pump or rerouting, relocating the alternator to the opposite side. But then that means that we got to relocate the oil filter. And as you probably saw, this side of the engine is getting pretty busy. We're gonna use this! Shrimp So we're gonna test and finish tuning the engine with just the alternator, given that the alternator has the adjustment. We're deleting everything else, tune the engine, let my jig, Freddy, do his thing, and then figure out the belt stuff for the fire steering down the road. Hey, Johan, guess what time it is? Oh, Dinner time? Comida. Oh, chicken masala. Chicken masala. <laughs> Sean's favorite. Mud. <laughs> Holy God. We've got a, a wide variety of tastes when it comes to Indian food, and all of them are chicken tikka masala. Hell yeah. But um, your first chicken tikka masala, Armando. Yep. Oh, you're gonna love it. Oh, you gotta tell Sean he's missing out. Compared to the other 3-4, it's coming in a little bit later and softer, so the guys are going to go ahead and try to retard the exhaust cam a little bit to move that power band sooner. It'll be cool to see kind of what difference that makes. One interesting difference between the E36 that had the 3-4, the blue car, and this one, the plenum on this one, we went to a forward-facing plasma man, and you can see there's a little trade-off here. I've heard of it before, but I didn't realize it would actually be that big of a difference. It holds much better up top, the airflow is good, but there's a little bit of a sacrifice in the mid-range. So the old engine made a bit more power sooner and rolled off harder up top with a new one power comes in a little bit later but it holds better up top there may be some other variables but I think the uh, the plenum difference is probably the most responsible thing um, and it's interesting to see because I've heard it but I've never seen it actually hand in hand because we've never wanted to delete the brake booster and put a forward facing plenum on the other car So I do want to add a little bit of a correction. Uh, we were doing pulls without an alternator on it just because we were having some belt issues. With the alternator back on, it did pick up a bit in the mid-range, so instead of seeing that large of a difference, still like a 50, 60 wheel difference between intake manifolds, but it's a direct trade-off for up top. We are able to rev it a little bit higher without it really rolling over at all. Um, so this is probably more accurate comparison than that graph I showed you before of stock intake manifold versus forward-facing plasma man and the trade-off of a little bit of mid-range for a little bit of up top. All right, it is officially the last day and it's gonna be a long one. I don't know if this is gonna get broken up into two videos or one, but essentially the first thing that we gotta really focus on is getting this car testing. Um, we had a successful night on the dyno, a couple issues with the belt slipping off, but our buddy Mike was able to actually make this on our lathe to keep the belt in place. So today, there's a lot of like little fit and finish buttoning up. I'm a little bit bummed uh, due to timeline and everything. I wanted to get the car revealed yesterday, but the fitment was way off, the ride height was way off. So we're gonna get that dialed in before we test. That way, hopefully you can leave it low and looking cool and also driving well. Um, other than that, I mean, you guys will see. There's a, there's a lot. My favorite thing though, Johan's beautiful vibrant titanium downpipe. Now that it's got a little bit of color in it. Mm -hmm. Make sure you appreciate it now because once it gets past a certain temperature, titanium actually goes the other way and then you lose the beautiful color. So when it gets really hot, what does it turn like the gold issue? Yeah, it starts turning dull, or like gold, dull, gold. Mm -hmm. It's just like, doesn't look that good. Yeah. So you can appreciate it for now. Um, I'm excited to see how it's going to feel. It will probably be the lightest. I don't want to say the lightest drift car, but one of the lightest drift cars I've ever driven. Because that, uh, that 86 I drove, I think, was pretty light. I've driven some other light stuff. But power to weight, this will probably be the craziest car I've ever driven.
As with any drift car, how you set up the rear suspension is very important. In this case, we are running a BC Racing 2A separate spring and shock setup. Uh, kind of a commonly debated topic. The main reason why we go with the separate spring and shock, it's easier to change springs if you need to make a change, and I'll show you just what I mean by how easy it is. You don't even need a jack, really. You can just get away with going like so. Drop that down. Boom, spring out, ready for a change. Um, the other cool thing, because the spring is farther in the chassis, other than like if it were out here, uh, you actually get, uh, I think it's about a two to one ratio. So you wind up with more spring resolution. And what I mean by that is an 8K spring will really feel more like a 4K. So when you go down to let's say like a seven, now you're doing half steps and you're going down to like a three and a half K spring. Um, so rather than making big jumps, you can make a lot smaller jumps to kind of dial everything in. But the really important thing, um, kind of how I was explaining with the safari car is setting your bump stops. So what you'll essentially do, you'll put a jack underneath this and you'll bring this all the way up until you have a comfortable amount of gap between the uh, spring bucket and the chassis. And you'll set the bump stop so you hit the bump stop and fully compress that before this makes contact with the chassis. Um, in the case of springs, using a barrel spring like this from BC allows you to uh, have less chance of spring bind just because of kind of how the coil stacks. But um, yeah, a little, little, little nerd out on the suspension on the rear of the E36. I'm actually putting shorter springs in it right now just to get the ride height a little bit lower. Cutting a little bit of bumper stuff and um, trying to get this thing looking good before I go test it. Baseline, this car is starting with very similar alignment specs to the other car. Uh, only difference is we have a little bit more rear weight bias than we have in the other car. It still is technically heavier in the front than the back. Uh, for drift masters, that's actually a really good thing because a lot of those guys struggle with front grip due to the tracks and some of the other limitations. Front's going to be corner balanced, put the rest of the body panels on, and then we should be good to go out there and test. Chelsea's here teaching me how to work on my car. That's right. I got him wrenching. <laughs> I'm fine tuning my inoculars right now. That's good. This, uh, the FDF, uh, what are these called? I always forget what they're called. This is literally the best invention in the world. Lollipops, you usually have to like unbolt it from the chassis, like spin them, double lock it down. Nightmare. But this is um, smooth ball. Nope. Smooth brain. Smooth brain. <laughs> it's killing me that I don't remember, but it's something that comes with all their kits now, and it's literally the easiest thing in the world to adjust. All right, how are we looking? More or less? That's probably good. Do you have another one? All right. No. Caster on uh, these cars is really, really important. That's what's going to make it feel good. And we're both choosing to start with more caster versus less. It's really a wheelbase you're adjusting right now more than the caster, but it does affect it. Technically, we're adding caster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, look at that exhaust. Phew! Titanium. Is that what they're calling it? Titanium? Titanium. Titanium and aluminium. <laughs> Mike, you gotta get a uh, get a shot of my beautiful new headlights that James has been working on. Oh yeah, they're pretty Dude, sick. They're so cool. Big headlight cool. builder. <laughs> There's a debate because we have uh, Mr. BMW. You got clears on over here. Mr. Now? BMW Pierce oh, himself is here. Really? So. The clears look so much better. Even with the headlights being darker. Yeah. Dude. The Just to get an idea. Do <laughs> you think I should change the headlight or leave the headlight? No, the clears are in it. The clears are definitely in it. Yeah, now that I see it next to each other. I think you need to brighten this up, dude. Well, you see, that's I know, a picture of photo, I understand. so I need to go turn the brightness up. Hey, should we should we you wrap should a headlight on for the photo, too? Chelsea, should we put a headlight where the duct that. is? Put a what? Should we put a headlight where the duct is? You do whatever you please. That's what I'm saying. I'm gonna tell him to put a headlight in, and then his IATs are gonna be too hot, and then it's to know if it's no, problem. No, 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 I'm in the headlight <laughs> sticker. Oh, like put a sticker around that. Oh, into the duct? Yeah. The oh. drive. I don't think that, that I don't think that uh, James would be happy if you told him to wrap that. I've said it a couple times now. I think that there needs to be like eyes, but like cross-eyed. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That's what I said. I think the headlight needs to be on, yeah. too. That way it takes away in photos to it. Oh, there's no way it's real. Look at it, how bright it is. Right. 
What if we cut a little slit right in the middle, like you said, Mike, and there's a little laser coming out at it? Yeah. yeah. Freaking laser beam. Freaking li laser beam. Trip Masters has all the fireworks and right. all that shit. It looked cool when the they tire do. smoke. They do. Well, I, I like how there's a little orange in the clear. Yeah, the amber yeah. shows. Yeah. Yeah. You could just do amber ones. That's I thought about that. <laughs> I thought about that. I like how the headlight that you used is like a properly worn E36 <laughs> headlight. <laughs> it's not like a brand new one. Got to go a little scuffs here. It's like, Adam, you build a brand new car, you couldn't afford for new headlights. <laughs> They're all yellow faded. Yeah, so we spent about uh, half a day um, doing headlights. The car's been ready to test. Uh, no. <laughs> Imagine. Just been waiting on headlights. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this. Chelsea's here today. He's going to help with some initial setup, testing. I'm going to make him drive the car and make sure everything feels kosher. We have very, very limited time with the car. Um, it needs to be loaded. To drive it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather you break it than me. Then I can just blame you. <laughs> the car needs to leave here at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, and uh, daylight is crunching, so every lap needs to really count. So, um, so even. Let me drive it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But even something as simple as like the, the sway bar. Um, Chelsea noticed we have an M3 sway bar, not a 328 one. It's a little bit softer. We're not gonna be able to do the things we need to do with it, so we're swapping that out, getting a stiffer one on. Uh, you pretty much live, eat, and breathe these cars, so. Not so much anymore, but I have done that with these cars. Yeah, you used too small of a bar for how much wheel spacer you got in the back. I didn't show them yet, did I? What, the wheel spacer? Yeah. I think I got a clip or two of them going yeah, on. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, there's some spicy spaces. People are going to be like, why don't you buy the right spec wheels? It'd because be negative 40. Well, they just don't exist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, first off, SLs are discontinued. Second off, that is the most aggressive offset I could get in a 9.5. <laughs> and a no, 22. No worries. Just have a slew of discontinued TEs to drift on. Yeah, but they're... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just how it bounces around. What do you think? This looks, gearing looks a little long for that first ship in. 
He'll probably need to go more track right so he has a little bit more time to light off going across the track at least. Everything's good. The biggest thing right now is like when I went to enter, I couldn't even do anything with the brakes because I'm full straight leg before it does anything. That's It'll be fine. We can but check the bias really quick. I'm going to drive, but okay. I, that's the only thing so far. I think it checked the belt. Oh. Yeah. He didn't even give it a second because he had already reached the normal speed that he got there. And like, as you do it by speed if you have a million laps at your place. But it lit off, got to speed, and then he was too short on everything else because <laughs> it's so, so fast. I mean, it, it uh, felt good. It definitely, it feels like it lacks a little bit up. of mid-range compared to the other motor. Yeah. This, the chassis Gear. feels amazing, though. Yeah, I think you're gearing to stick off what you're trying to do right now. No, I agree. Yeah. But also, Just go more track right when you enter. I mean. <laughs> It's a brand new car, give me a break, Dad. No, no, I'm just saying, it'll just give you more room, safer yeah, yeah. that way. No, it, it, I mean, it feels like everything feels extremely intuitive. It felt fast, it power everything felt good. Everything happens quick. Uh, everything happens quick. That's good. But it just, as soon as I got into the drop, I lost power steering. Mm. Oh, the belt. It, it is a crimp on the line, yeah, on the high pressure line, yeah. Oh, that's why there's smoke? We need to go more on the crimp. Yeah. We follow the, like, the measurements and it measures out to what they, they call it for the specking. Like the tolerance. You just gotta fix the line? Yeah. Okay. You should probably do the other one. So we think this crimp is not crimp enough. Well, according to this, uh, if you follow here, we've got dash six, eight through 20, different Scott type of uh, line. And then when you follow the crimp process, there's a minimum and maximum sizing for the crimp once it's crimped. Based on what we have for the calibration or the tolerances, it checks out. But I questioned this from the beginning because it didn't seem like it was uh, crimp enough comparing to other lines that I've seen. Now, there's many different line manufacturers, so but it can be that many because they'll use the same type of uh, collar and slash uh, fitting. So, so we'll see now when we do it again, we're gonna see if we either calibrate this or just set it at a tighter um, crimp to get the desired crimp. Look, Lawrence, you're in an Adam LZ video now. That's We're just you... bleeding the brakes. It ran out of brake fluid. It's not YouTube friendly. Oh Let's my see. god, this clutch. Holy shnikes. Is that all your cars are? What about it? How hard is it to push this clutch? I don't feel like it is. You skip leg day, bro? No, I drive cars all the time. This is so <laughs> stiff. <laughs> really? Yes, really. I mean, I guess, I guess we got different versions of stiff. This is way stiffer than the Mustang clutch. Is it? Is it? Are you British now? Think <laughs> about that issue you're having with your yard. Um, I'm looking into it. I had someone drive by. Uh, the marks weren't that large, so I, I understand where your concern's coming from. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that it's worth dropping everything to handle right now. Uh, I've got one more specialist I'm going to call to see what they can do. Uh, I just need you to send me a little bit more information so you can uh, either drop it off in the mailbox or shoot me a text. This is good. Um, and remind Bob, you need to run by the laundromat and pick up uh, 
<laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? What is wrong with you? That was pretty serious. Yeah, okay, yeah. when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking, is he actually meaning to get like call someone else about this? No, like, so what's I, he talking I was about? Like, at first, I was like, he thinks he's talking to somebody else. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, it's so f***ed up that there's, he's f***ing with me. And, I, and then you're like, Adam has this weird, it's not a dry humor, it's an unexplained humor. <laughs> That he doesn't even know how he's, what he's saying. I just like, I just, the most he just keeps going shit. with it like he's talking to himself. My humor is derived from, I think in my head, like something, something that a stupid person would think. I'll be like, <laughs> they would probably believe this. And then I go, I'm going to say that and see if someone believes it. And if they don't, they're going to think I'm stupid <laughs> and that's going to be funny. His issue is he thinks of that stuff and goes with it. And, and then keeps while going. he's doing it, he's like, how deep can I go yeah, with oh, yeah. this? <laughs> Okay. It's not like a, I think of a 10 second thing. It's like, like while you're doing that 10 seconds, but, it's like, oh, I can get this better. But like, like also, oh, yeah, at the end, uh, tell Bob to go to the laundry <laughs> man, pick up his clothes. Like, you're like, Adam, what are you talking about? You're hurting my brain right now. I wish I could have seen Chelsea's reaction to that. Well, because she's listening like, what's going on? <laughs> and I'm, so I'm also now like kind of Invested. feeding it because it's funny. To see what she says, because I've already listened to it twice now, and I realize, oh, this is a joke, you know. And she's like, "What an hole!" And I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Oh, your yard is really bad, but I don't have enough time to deal with that right now." <laughs> but that's what you're emailing me or leaving a voice message about, telling me, "You." And I, I, it is a problem, but you. Well, I also completely forgot that I left that message. And then you saw me, and you're like, "Yo," Days and, and later. you're like, "You for leaving those marks in my yard?" And I'm yeah, like, "What are you talking like, about? Like, did you get by the?" laundry mat yet and you're like what <laughs> <laughs> I like the voicemail he's like he's already forgotten it well yeah, that that whole concept started because my dad has like different secretaries yeah, all the time and I just I call and I just <laughs> with them because they don't know me they don't know my name so I call and, I'll, and they'll be like I'll be like hey is Joel there who's my dad and then they're like uh no no he's he's out right now like all right well tell him his dog's in my lawn he better go f Get it right now. <laughs> like, I'm sick of this. His dog's eating my wife's planners. And then, and then hold on one second. And then my dad comes, comes on, hello, who's this? And then I'm like, hey, dad. <laughs> so good. My favorite. <laughs> are fixed now. We also did the gear change. The gearing was a little bit long, so I think that's going to help the car a lot. You should be able to hear a difference on video. Um, we got the Safari GTR on the side-by-side -side lighting up the property. I'm excited though. Vibe's good. We just had a bunch of pizza. Um, car fell so intuitive right up rip. I'm just hoping I can really, you know, push the limits of the motor so I can see uh, if there are any weak points.
my foot onto the brake pedal and then pushing it far down enough, it's just a little bit too late. So for like left foot braking, for making adjustments, it's almost as if it's not there. The power is good though, like especially if I'm up in the RPM van, it's it like sounds good. It's it's spicy. Yeah, it is. It's a good motor. What do you think about the car? I can take more grip. You want more grip? Let's Instant do it. or long term? Everywhere. Everywhere? Everywhere. Okay. FDF go, baby. That thing is f***ing In the artsy B-roll of the smoke, Davis. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why not yeah. snipe me like that, bro? Don't be looking at my B-roll, dude. I got the shot. I don't know about your shot, but my shot. I'm getting some inspiration. No, look, yo, at look at that. The slow motion take, smoke. I want to see. Hold up. Take notes, all right? Got. Oh wait, wait. Don't take notes on that. Yo, look at this. He coming back. That right there. Money. Yeah, you got me beat. Money. <laughs> Yo, why is your camera so much more clear than mine? That's not cool. Wait. <laughs> no, no, go back. We're, you got to get the best part. It's at the end. Double nice. cheek dog. <laughs> <laughs> so. There's easy ways to add some side. I don't want to go that much more in the back because you have so, the spring is really probably just too soft. Yeah. For in the rear, because we're locking it down so hard with the shock right now. I don't think I've ever had a new build that's so easy to drive. It's good. Like it's, I feel like I could roll up to a competition right now and it would like. This is also like not version 4.0 of this True. chassis and you've only made improvements. So, so it's gonna be better. And to be fair, this is my favorite engine setup and my yeah. favorite chassis and my right. favorite gearbox. It's got all the good stuff. And you spent, so always like, spent yeah. all the time to make it what you wanted it to be. Yeah. How's the steering feel like in general? 
Zoom feels really good. I feel like it could maybe use a little bit more caster just for like return. Right now I'm I'm really wheeling it, but it's not, it's second nature, maybe because I'm used to it from other cars. So it's not a prohibitive thing for driving right now, but I know that it could probably be a little bit better. IATs is one issue that we're yeah, fighting right now. The PWR intercooler is gangster, but the problem is usually you would have a radiator that's pulling some air, so you have some airflow, and I don't have any of that. So we might end up sticking some fans on it. It, it cools down goes, instantly once I drive. It goes down while you're drifting. Yeah. So it's doing its job. For sure. It's just static sitting, like you need a fan or something. It's really good. I just can't believe how easy it is to drive. That's the big thing for me. It's square, it's tight, it's everything, and we're making the tire do the work. The only negative news so far is that we may need to pull out some rear wheel spacer to get a little bit of side back. And well, I'm adding more right now without that. Okay, cool. Because having good fitment is really important to me. The Driftmasters cars look really cool. So I can't be rocking up with my, my little monster truck looking like he skipped leg day. But, but if you win... I mean, he's the champ. You heard it here. I mean, if you win, what does it matter? Yeah, true. Who cares if I skip leg day? I always just say, like, when you park your car or you do whatever, you can put the spacers on and make it look sick. True. When you're out there whooping everybody's ass, that's way cooler looking than losing. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put like two 15s on the rear with like a plus 48 offset, and I'm gonna put a little sticker on the rear bumper to where like the drone cameras go in the beginning of drift match and say, Chelsea Dunofa made me do it. And it's gonna have like a little photo of like a big dude with tiny little legs. Skip legs eh? Yeah. I'll, it'll be like, a, it'll be like, a, just if you make fun of yourself, it's okay. Yeah. So when I when I take this off, I'll put like a magnet on the back that says, yes, I skipped leg day. So no one else can say it. It's what's important, it's what matters. <laughs> Doing the, the most important job of the whole shop here. I've been sticking on my wheels. I think we're gonna do a separate video, or I'm gonna do a separate video, I should say. Uh, it's gonna be extremely late by the time we have everything laid out for the uh, the container. But a couple people want to know, like all that we're bringing, spares and all that. It's a lot, and we can probably do like a quick walkthrough and we get everything loaded. Um, but yeah, wheels are a big part of it. So I'm getting all these dressed up, and then we're gonna see if we can find some boxes to throw these things in. That way they're safe in the container. It's pretty late, it's 12.30. This happens probably once a year, um, and our neighbors are usually pretty understanding. One of them's in a race car himself, and he, he gets the rush when we got an event coming up. I feel guilty, we got four more tires to burn, uh, made a bunch of setup changes. The car's got a little bit different Ackerman, a little bit more side bite now, so I should be able to stay flat foot through some of the corners. A little bit bigger tire in the rear. See what happens. <laughs> You got a whole crowd this, watching you. This is when you spin. I only do this once a year. I was on the dyno at 2 a.m. last night. What? We just got a that's crew. different than driving. Oh, is it? You're right. It's more pulls. I've never in my life had to have a car ready to get shipped where we have a hard deadline. So it, I feel okay about this one. Fair disclaimer. Like two nights ago, 1 a.m., semi-automatic rifles going off. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was away. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Fully automatic. Yeah, yeah. Guns going off at 1.30 in the morning. Jordan just going by at 1 in the morning, just just in the morning to crack crack everybody all up. day, dude. He's like, oh, Adam moved back onto the compound. Ba 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 ba.
bumps on something now and it kind of caught and grabbed the car. So we're just adjusting the bump stops a little bit because sometimes things flex and you can't see on ground until you start drifting. Stop. You hear that bump stop sound? What's a bump stop? I don't know. Something that stops bumps. At maximum. I'm starting to lose it. Booth is starting to lose it. You hear that? Sounds why, like why a. Why you hear Booth that's yelling like that up that's there? That's the monkey. <laughs> no, that's the monkey. finishing up the car, Duarte actually took lead on getting everything palletized and getting the trailer packed up with the rest of the crew, saved us a bunch of time and got us all situated for success. That's tire streets for you. Power steering still feels great, no issues. You got an anchor. Yeah, the, the biggest issue is it's like it's like 15 degrees west angle in the first setup. I'm gonna still drive around and just put more heat in it. Okay. Um, it feels good. It Picturesque, I think that's, Jeez, that's the word, right? Bro, it's like a scary movie, you know, like the fog movie. Silent Hill. Silent right, Hill. So. At the compound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, 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 no listen. No. Listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Drop to the ground so it starts dragging me by my feet. Mike, Mike, Mike <laughs> cut gonna that. Eat this shit, bro. that. <laughs> Mike's gonna just go through all this shit and be like, what the f yeah. They all lost their minds. I know. Welcome to the show, Mike. Is, are these like sappy, sticky trees, or like can you like kind of? These are like... really pointy, getting your skin and never fall out. Really? Things. I was yeah, thinking like I could hug hey. it, like no, pump bro. Up it. accomplished a lot of things. I'm gonna put the Aquaman back where I had it before. We're a little bit more angle limited and it's a little bit harder to drive the car at big lock, but it's so fast. It's crazy. And I'm, I figured out that I can run a bigger tire than I thought I'd be able to. 
It's good. It's really good. I think I'm gonna probably end up closing the video tomorrow, just because I'll be a little bit less brain dead. You guys won't see the car anymore though, so enjoy your last look at it for now. It's a new day and I finally feel like my brain is in the position where I can form a coherent sentence. The boys brought the car to the port at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. It's out of our hands now and it's off to Europe. I'm really, really happy with the car on many fronts. It's special, it's good. But I think what I'm even happier about, what I'm really proud of and what I'm so stoked about, the vibes from last night, or I should say this morning, absolutely unmatched. Uh, the whole racing thing produces a lot of nights like that, a lot of moments, and honestly, those are some of the memories that I'll remember forever. The vibes, everyone just going to town on the car, seeing the smoke settle, the noises, like it is It is definitely a memory of a lifetime and I cannot thank everyone enough. There are so many countless hours that had to be put in that last stretch with the car. Obviously we wanted to be a little bit more ahead of schedule, situations out of our control, put us in a bind where we had to do what we had to do. The LZMFG team, the Drift HQ team, Freddie, Engine Mike, Jay-Z Raps, Armando, literally every single person that stepped foot on the car compound played some sort of role in helping get that car to where it was and they did it with a smile on their face like it is it is the coolest thing seeing the team dump it is the coolest thing seeing the team come together and make magic happen like they did a lot of time that last minute SEMA crunch that last minute crunch before formula drift it's some of the worst and some of the most stressful times but let me tell you if that's going to be the worst moment of the season we're off to an amazing start because that was it was special it was a good time and I'm stoked to share it with you guys as well as many more of the moments that are here to come I guess I am still a little in coherent with my brain slept on the couch I woke up at like two the team the homies of course all my amazing partners none of this would be possible without them and I'm really stoked for what this year holds we still got some more exciting news we got a weekend with uh, quite a bit more work ahead of us we're through the thick of it we're coming out swinging I'll see you guys soon when you say Tire Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tire, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com. Top of the line ECU, internal wide band, e throttle control, all the motorsport functions, you can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer. Which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those things that I have thanks to the Link ECU. That's all he needs. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely big shout out to Link ECU.
Bass on that Able Pimpin' Bang. What's up guys and welcome back to stop one of the LZ World Tour here in sunny California. We had an amazing qualifying session where it really mixed things up on the scoreboard and now we're about to head to the first set of competitive twin battles or tandems as they say here in the USA of the weekend. We're going to see everybody try and claim those remaining three podium steps to get back in the main event tomorrow. Top 13 qualifiers, they're already in. Yep. They're just chilling, they're just relaxing, watching the action. But this is where it gets tense because if you don't get to that podium, you ain't going into the main event tomorrow. Jacob, this track has proved a little bit more technical than we originally thought. Looks like a simple figure eight, but it's a lot of elevation changes, a lot of guys dropping wheels. It's going to be a real war of attrition here. Yeah, it's a lot of stop and go. You've got to change speed. You have to adapt. And then now that we're getting into the tandem part of this, everything you thought you knew in qualifying, I mean, it's still going to work, but not really. Now we're having to chase. You're going to have to time things a little bit differently. And the nice thing is, as you've already seen, there's a nice spread between high horsepower, low horsepower. And just because you have one particular level of horsepower doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do well. No, and so. a lot of big names now having to fight their way out of the bottom bracket here to get back in the main event tomorrow as well, which I absolutely love to see. Oh. I love the way it mixes it up. It's going to be difficult. You got guys with high horsepower trying to chase, you know, amateur drivers with very little horsepower. It's a different game for them than if they went to a Formula Drift event or so. They've got to actually, everyone's kind of on the same playing field. Now yeah. it's all very mixed up and it's going to be all for your entertainment over the next two hours or so. Adam LZ was out on track. Damon from DDE was on track in the break, pumping up the crowd. The crowd here in Bakersfield ready for some action. We're ready for some action. So you know what? Let's send it. Let's go to our last chapter. So now we head to our Last Chance Top 16, which, Jacob, I'm looking forward to because it's got a real mix of car riders in there, real mix of cars in there. Remind everybody from earlier on that I will be acting as judge and as announcer, so you're going to be able to hear some thoughts that I have throughout the run. I'm obviously sitting here beside Sean and Jason, who have been watching all of the runs today. We've been having a good time. We've been enjoying it. Some real mix-ups. I think these battles are going to be very interesting between different cars, drivers, experience levels. We've got Formula Drift drivers in there against amateurs. We've got a lot going on. You don't see it anywhere else in the world, Jacob, this kind of a mix-up. As we said, it is the fantastic to see series. It's all about stuff you would never see anywhere else. And we don't take it too seriously, so you shouldn't either. No, we've already got car swapping. We won't say who it is yet. We'll, 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 we'll let that ride for a minute, but we've already had people changing cars, people in new cars, cars in 
different places and yeah, it's great. Uh, the the bracket right now, the build out looks amazing. I'm a big fan of just staring at the bracket and going, "What if? What if this person did that? What if that person yeah. did this?" And th and that's this entire event is just what if. And there's some scenarios here that would probably be 25 million to one that would yeah. ever that if someone was to win. So there's a lot of interesting things happening. We're going to be moving towards the battles very soon. We're getting the cars warmed up, and here's how it works. Each driver will take turn at lead and chase, and after both, we'll basically be able to decide after two runs who is the better driver, and they go through. That's the simple part. The most difficult part is we're, how are we judging the lead in the chase? Well, what we're doing is we're looking for that lead driver to run that as close to as possible 100 point lead run. So we're watching the lead car saying, are they being smooth? Are they being fluid? Are they collecting all the clipping zones? And that's what they need to do. The chase driver, well, they got to get as close as possible without making contact. And that's the simplest way of looking at it. Staying on good angle, matching their angle, matching their speed and matching their transitions. However, if the lead car deviates from that qualifying line, they're going to be deducted. If the chase car gets washy in the inside and loses proximity, or dives across the track. We don't want to see that either. So we're going to be getting, you know what? You don't need to know it all. We're going to tell you as we go how these decisions are being made. And we're going to be very transparent about everything. We're going to tell you as we're thinking it and what decisions we're making. So it's a little bit, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, which also the drivers don't. Neither does the weather and neither does anybody in attendance. But that's what it's all about, unpredictability. And we got our first set of battles coming up, which will be Dustin Farrell against Randy Trong. Randy's struggling a little bit with that OR34 four-door at the moment, fresh build. It looks to me like Dustin Farrell got his stuff together at the end of qualifying. So this is going to be an uphill battle I think for Randy in this one. Yeah, and and Dustin really, you know, he, he showed how good he is. Randy obviously having some struggles in that R34, as you said. Now that being said, at some point, Dustin still gotta chase him. So, yeah. you know, it's it, it, there is something to be said about a car that is slower, maybe having some mechanical. You can win by having a car that's just hard to yes. chase. Yes, and of course, <laughs> I am judging. I'm going to give you my opinions, but obviously I am a minority vote as I have two other very talented judges beside me and Sean Jason, and they're going to be talking through stuff as well. So we're going to keep you guys up to date as we go through. Nick Swan just getting the last bit of information. Our start line marshal, the legend of the game, oh, Nick Swan, man. on the start line, just making sure it looks intimidating. One of the He's, he's a teddy bear, really. He's, 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 he's there for everybody on the grid. He is always trying to encourage everybody, make sure everybody's as comfortable as possible. Possible. And it means a lot when you're a driver. You get that little bit of a friendly face on the star line, can calm the nerves. You can see Randy, he's all <laughs> smiles, he's enthusiastic. He has absolutely no idea what's about to happen next, but he's going to take off the line. And he's going to be chasing Dustin. Dustin's got definitely got more sauce in that uh, S14.9. So this is going to be tough for Randy to stay with him. But we are off and running here at the last chance, top 16. Dustin out and Randy, oh, I mean, he's doing his best, but Dustin out in the lead, absolutely putting on a clinic, but. That R34 in the chase is just struggling to be in the show and struggling to even make it in frame. But Dustin throwing a ton of smoke. This might be some of the most smoke we've seen so far, especially out of this car. He's made some changes in the uh, in the downtime, but is going pretty wide there. So that might be a factor in this. But all uh, things, yeah. yeah. I think I think you know what this is a uh, judging 101. If we can't get this one this one right, we're going to be in trouble for the Law day. Lob ball to start. Yeah. So basically, Randy just he's, he's zeroing out there. He yeah. loses complete uh, drift when he comes through the the first corner. And it's again, it looks like to me there's a gearing issue with that car. It just can't seem to spin the wheels. So he did more driving than drifting, which is going to be a major deduction. Dustin doing a pretty good job in the lead, but he's not under major pressure because the chase car is making such big errors. So this is not going to work all the time. He does make some wobbles and errors here, but he's definitely tidying up his runs every single time we see him on track. And this is where this last chance top 16 can become a big advantage to some of these drivers going into tomorrow, because yeah. if they get to the podium today, they've done so much battle practice. They've done so much high pressure, you know, uh, runs that they actually have an advantage. So we're going to switch him around. This time it will be Randy in the lead. Dustin's got a big decision to make next. If you've got a spotter on the radio, they're going to be saying, hey, this guy's a little wayward. He's not really, you know, he's already got the car moving properly. Don't overcommit and double zero, you know, and, and end up in it one more time. Dustin's got to play this very calculated. It's not the most exciting drifting we're going to see, but it's also a clever way of getting yourself into the top eight. Let's see how he handles it. Yeah, here's hoping that uh, Randy's not just playing possum here and, uh, you know, doesn't just light up the tires, but you never know. So we'll see, the R34 does go into initiation, definitely struggling over rotates, and I think that's, that's going to be wrote. it. That's, that's all she wrote. Be. And that's one of those moments where I don't need to discuss with my FPC judges, because we, sure? we always had that one. You know, obviously two zeros from Randy there. It's a pretty easy decision for us here in the tower. And Dustin, you know what? You could see he held back on the initiation. He wasn't too sure. And when he didn't see Randy initiate really at all, he just <laughs> kind of said, you know what? Let's see how this one plays out. Yeah. So um, Dustin will get the win and go through to our top eight. It's a pretty obvious decision for anyone watching drifting at any level. But you know what? We're not uh, we're not infallible up here. We're, we're going to be uh, speaking our mind. You guys, of course, it's a subjective sport. People have different opinions. And you're going to have a little bias towards your favorite driver out there. But if 
unfortunately for Randy, this one is going to be probably all she wrote for the weekend for him. But he's smiling already. He's yeah. always smiling. He's going to be out here having fun in the practice sessions. Everyone gets to drive again in the practice tomorrow, so he'll still get that. We'll get a decision in. What a beautiful set of cars, too. And there you have it. Dustin Farrell getting the win and going through. Dustin Farrell in that very shiny, beautiful S14.9 represented 2F. You know what? Didn't get tested too much there, but did the right thing. If he'd gone in a little too close in the chase position, he could have caused you know himself to spin out, and that gives Randy another opportunity. Randy gives a big thumbs up to the grandstand. Guys, get it for Randy Trong in the four-door R34. Man, from these parts. Yeah. And you know, he's done a lot for the scene around these places, and a really, really fun person to be around. We've we spent a lot of time in Japan with Randy, and he, there is no off switch. It's no. just, he, it's entertainment from the minute he wakes up to the minute he goes to sleep, and I'm there for it. So Dustin gets the win and goes through, and we'll move on to our next battle. And this might be, and I've been commentating and announcing on drifting for <laughs> over 10 years, and this will be the toughest battle I have ever announced, because the two names are pretty, pretty difficult. Oh, sir. There is a lot of constants. There's, in this battle. There's a lot of letters. There's a, yeah. there's a lot of letters. I don't think I'm going to pronounce most of them. Do you guys know the show Countdown? No. No. So they have a show called Countdown in the UK, and basically it's a jumbled up word, and you've got to try and figure out what it is. Okay. And this looks like that on its hardest difficulty. So we have got Majerus. Mar Mar Margaritas. <laughs> Margaritas. Margaritas. Sand I know that drink. It's Cat very close. Sandys. Against uh, Timofey? Timofey, yeah. Timofey. We're not going to go into the second name. Kishan, we, we, we don't want to insult our families and everybody involved with them because we are not uh, educated enough to be able to negotiate that. I guess, I guess I'm a little more bold than you are. I, just, I go for it. And I, I find if you say it with yeah. confidence, they usually just correct you politely later. We can also go with LS Doctor versus the Monte Carlo. There we go. Yeah, that sounds more... The Monte Carlo. I never thought I'd ever say Monte, the J's at X Carlo. Ah. The Monty yeah. Chaser, the Monty yeah, Chaser, because, that could work too. Yeah, I would like anybody. Anybody's thinking a good name. Go to join in. Go to join in at home. Yeah, it's a JZX 100 chassis with a two JZ. So technically, the engine from a Supra on a JZX in a Monte Carlo body, and that's real life. I wonder if he's running like a 48.8 rear end too. This just for fun. At this point in time, nothing surprises. Yeah, exactly. But this has been a, this has been two guys that you know in qualifying had moments of brilliance, but had some struggles as well. We, we can see. Uh, Margaritas, he had more, I'd say, of a smooth food line. He's in the lead first, that's why he's the higher qualifier. And we've had some spins out from Timofey, but you know, we'll, you never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know in this situation. So we're going to send them off the line. This will be the first half of the battle. We will see Margaritas in the lead, Timofey in the Monte Carlo in the chase. And this is just a battle of insanity already. Here we go. Margaritas to see how he initiates. Big initiation for Margaritas. Timofey just doing his best to keep up right now, but uh, Martin is weak. I'm just going to go with Mark for now. Trying to see if he can get to all the outside zones just by going faster doesn't mean you're going to win. But Timofey spinning out. Whoa, it was a little tight there. But Mark now going way offline. The Greek doctor having some problems in surgery while Timofey's just making sure he's making it in the show, keeping it interesting. But uh, Margarita's able to get through. Yeah, it's a messy one. It was it's messy. It's a messy one from start messy. to finish. There was a mistake from both drivers in the same zone, one kind of worse than the other, and I'm only giving my honest opinion here. Of course, the other judges will see it their own way. It looked like maybe the Margaritas went in too fast into Klemperin zone one, had to come way off the throttle. At this point, as you can see in the chase position, Timofey goes in, but he's on a shallow line. So if he was on the same line, you could probably look at it and say, okay, he might be in a situation where, you know, the lead car has caused that issue. But he was cutting the track so badly at that point that he was picking up so much pace. So um, from that point on, yeah, not a perfect lead, not yeah. a perfect chase. It's, uh, it's two people dancing to two different songs. That's what it looks <laughs> very, like. Very yeah. good way of putting yeah. it. One of those silent discos, you know, you've got two completely different tracks yeah. going on. From my opinion, it's still a bigger mistake from Timofey just because it was exaggerated by a, a poor yeah. lead line, but he, he really dove in and didn't have anywhere to go. But he was lucky, Margaritas, because he did make a mistake also. So, yeah, this is going to be coming down to the second half of the ballot. It could all switch the other way. Yeah, Mar I mean, Margaritas could spin out. Timofey could put down an absolutely crush run, and we'll see how it all plays out as they come off the line. Timofey, God, I just love seeing that car go sideways is incredible, but... Margaret's giving him lots of space, knowing what could happen, but you want to be inactive. Oh! Yeah, and again, you know, it's one of those things where there was nothing too spectacularly good for Margaritas, but he didn't really have to because the other car was sealing his own fate a lot of the time. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta sometimes give people just to, you know enough space to, right, I think, to make the problem happen. So as they uh, come back up, they can burn off some of those extra tires. I mean, at this point, you know, everybody's running the same tires. The tires are all donated. Why not? Why not? Why not just, you know, use them up, right? 
It's a big stack of them sitting there. Everyone's running through them, and we'll go to the yeah, judges' decision. There you go. We have a decision in, and it is going to be Margaritas getting the win. So we just had a little discussion on the first run there, just to give you guys an insight. There was mistakes for Margaritas in the lead position, and if it was another car closer to him, he probably would have caused an incident there. But because Timofey was so far back, he wasn't really affected, then he dove across the track, and he kind of caused himself that spin. Second run, obviously, he's in the lead position, he spins, that's an automatic zero. So two double zeros, while Margaritas will have to step it up a little bit, I think, in the top eight to be a bit smoother. He could have been punished more, but in that particular case, he got away with it. So an easy call in many ways. And I'm, an, I'm a little annoyed that Monte Carlo's gone out, but, I know. you know. We'll see it more. We gotta be fair, apparently, yeah. up here. We can't just put the cool cars through, so I don't know what <laughs> drifting's become, but... Um, yeah, that was a, a two battles that we weren't too tested on just yet. We move on to our next pair of drivers. It's going to be Trevor Jameson against Hurt. So Hurt is driving Luke Fink's blue Corvette. Doesn't have to make sense. And he's got a borrowed car, never driven a lap in this car before. Nope. He's still in the fight against Trevor Jameson, who's very familiar with his S14 with the one Jay-Z. And I'll be honest with you when I say that this is going to be a tough game for Hurt here because new car, no idea what's about to happen. Not sure if he's even ever drifted a Corvette before, but here we go. We're about to send him. Trevor out front there in that black and green S chassis. Obviously hurt behind in the Corvette. Very whoa, hurt diving in hard. He is uh, he's definitely harnessing his like inner Luke Fink, driving for for somebody who's never driven this chassis before. This looks incredible from Hurt diving in real tight there. Trevor on the outside line, putting down a great lead run right now, making it a little bit easier for Hurt, making some big corrections just to get back in the chase, but. We get a bit of a connection there. No, I think that's a, that, that, that's a, that's a, some mechanical issue with Trevor Jameson. Oh. And you know, just from this is an, my instant reaction to this, because yeah. generally you don't hear anything about judging until the end. To me, Trevor Jameson's lying through the first corner. Watch this, wasn't really that wide. He misses that inner zone, he's on the inside of the track, and this isn't really giving Hurt a good chance to catch up, because he's kind of cutting the course. So at this point, I was thinking, Hurt's doing a pretty good job of catching up. He is a little bit aggressive at times when he shouldn't be, but this is where this battle is going to be decided. As they transition through, Trevor Jameson comes to the outside. It looks to me like we get a complete shutdown of power there. Ooh. And it looks something happened, a misshift or an axle broke or something. But that's going to give all the advantage to Hurt in that run because even though he had some wobbly sort of moments of brilliance, he did stay on the track. So to me, that looks like Hurt is getting an advantage. We have Trevor Jameson on the track right now, not moving. So either something stuck on, a brake, or he's lost gears or something. So that was definitely going to be... It was, but even despite that, it was still quite in the balance for me because of just a little shortcutting of the track. Trevor Jameson and not on a huge amount of angle in the lead position. And if you're on very shallow angle, you're not giving the chase car a door to get up onto because right. you're kind of just giving him the rear bumper. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on right now. We probably will see maybe a five minute call from Trevor Jameson or maybe that car sorted itself out. But for her, I mean, what about her? I mean, I would have thought. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Sean, one of our judges was saying that it looks to me like it like might be an axle. He said there was just one wheel spinning on, on Trevor James' car. But Hurt, I mean, I think Hurt drives borrowed cars far better than his own because he knows he doesn't <laughs> have to fix them after the event. So he can go straight in there. And again, Luke Fink is not going to tell him, well, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. So Luke's like, go for it, give it a big spin. So Luke gave him the car. He did as much, especially for somebody who's never driven that chassis before, very aggressive driving. Didn't want to just, you know, roll over and wave to the fans. So Hurt doing a good job. He's in, surprisingly, we would have said at the start of the battle, this is what the LZ World Tour is all about. Guy comes in in his own car, goes up against a guy who's never driven the car before, and the guy who's never driven the car has the advantage halfway through the run. Yeah, there's nothing that Hurt can do to that car that Luke Fink hasn't already done to it. So I'd be curious if, if maybe that axle was starting to go out, and that's why we saw him yeah. so shallow there. And it, you, you could be right. He, he didn't look like he was on any power whatsoever on, on the other zone. So it could be that, yeah, the car was given up on him. So yeah. I think we're going to see a five minute rule from Trevor Jameson. He's going back into the pits. Tough to change an axle in five minutes, not, but not impossible. impossible. Yeah, it depends how broken. Yeah. Yeah. Depends what's depends broken. what else is broken. Yeah. Yeah. So he's going to lines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Hurt's going to wait it out uh, until the end of the five minutes. And if it is a no return from Trevor Jameson, Hurt will get a free pass to the top eight, just complete a run. Uh, but we're moving along to our next battle. It's interesting because, again, you could be the best driver in the world. If the car doesn't work, then, you know. Doesn't matter. As we say, you can't win the Grand National, which is a horse race, without yes. a horse and a jockey. The jockey can't just run down on his own, uh, so you need the horse working too. I was misinformed then. I thought the, I thought the horse could no, just No, sometimes go. you'll see the horse running its own, yeah. but that doesn't count. Uh, okay. It's obviously much easier and, less, and lighter. <laughs> <laughs> Weight savings. You do the same thing. You can't just ghost drive the car, right? send it out there. That, you can't do that. No. So we're going to move it along. We've got some uh, more drivers warming tires. 
This will be Zendara Kennedy and Dean Carney. So a pro spec driver in Zendara Kennedy also has an amazing career in stunt driving. Um, if you get a chance, go check out her IMDb. It's actually pretty cool. And then Dean Carney, who did struggle in qualifying, probably has the least amount of track time here. Um, yeah. You know, sat in traffic all day. <laughs> he said, that doesn't help. <laughs> no, he said that he, he left in good time and he still was late. There was that much traffic. And I, you know what? I, I'm not so familiar. I'm sure you guys are a little bit more familiar with it. But there's a traffic problem here in LA. I don't know if you guys know about it. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm the first to see it, but I was like, nobody's moving anywhere yeah. after a certain hour. So I can understand that. But Dean is in the practice car. He said it's, it's just kind of a stock Viper. With, and it runs the angle kit that he ran in like 2011. Oh, so wow. It's a real old school setup. So he said it's like going back 10 years in time driving the car. I, do, do we even know what Ackerman was back then? Like, no. do, was that we, something we were accounting for? We couldn't for at even that point? spell Ackerman back then. <laughs> now we all know about it. But this oh. is an old school car, and then you got a 350Z with a V8, which is a good solid car. Yeah. So this is going to be a little closer than you think. I, I, I'd imagine, looking at the qualifying scores, this is going to be very close. And, and Zendara in her prospect car drives with a 2J. So like, you'll watch her drive this more like a 2J than an LS. <laughs> You know by how much rev limiter has been yeah. used that someone has a 2J somewhere, tucked away somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> because they drive them pretty aggressively. So we're off the line, is going to be Zendara in the lead, Dean Carney in the chase. Zendara, the straight line initiation getting in there. Dean not giving her a bunch of space, especially in that transition. Zendara looks like she missed a bit of the first outside zone and very shallow in the second outside zone. But Dean Carney doing a great job in the chase. Zendara pushing up to the third zone in transition. Slow transition, but Dean Carney Timed that out quite well. I'm sure those front bumpers are not cheap in those Vipers, and he wants to keep it on there. But Zendara cleaning things up quite a lot in our last set of outside you know, it's, zones. It's funny. We spoke about in qualifying Zendara, how smooth she was around the track. Nothing to her. He gave Dean Carney everything to work yeah. with there. But boy, did he grab it with two hands because he went out there and said he literally wanted to be on the door the whole way around. And I actually didn't expect it from him because he didn't show that in qualifying. But again, he's very experienced in the chassis, and that was an excellent chase run from start to finish. Even to the point here where I thought he was going to throw it away by being too aggressive, he managed that. And um, yeah, pretty good lead run, not perfect. The chase run, I think, is as good as you could get. I would say pretty small advantage or to Dean Carney after the first half of that run. Uh, but again, all to play for in the second. You can't get too carried away. Yeah, and I mean, I was just looking at horsepower-wise. I don't think they're that far off. All no, I'd, I'd imagine pretty similar. Yeah. Difference, difference in cylinders, that's for sure. There's definitely a difference <laughs> in cylinders. Two, two different. So uh, Carney will be in the lead, and Zandara in the chase. So this is where Zandara's got to be aggressive here from the off. Going to throw this one away if she doesn't get as close as possible. Carney on a pretty of a straight line there. A very dodgy first corner from uh, Dean Carney, and it's thrown Zandara way off. Yeah, it was, a, it was a very strange initiation that we saw there, and I do agree that it, it kind of threw Zandara for a bit of a loop. I'll have to see in the replay exactly how that all played out, but Zendara's basically just been playing catch-up. The nice thing is with this track, there are a couple of spots that you can, although it just didn't seem like she was able to get in the groove. So, got to take a look at uh, how this all worked. So, Dean way out to the wall, kind of wide, and then cutting it in much shallower. And then Zendara just, at the, at the end, basically just had to almost shut it down in the, in the next set of sections. So... Definitely a tough one there as we look through the rest of this replay. All right, in this last zone, yeah. A couple of dives just to see what she can do at that point, but Dean did get a better uh, final outside zone. It just just wasn't quite enough. So going to the judges' decisions, and many be able to hear Dave here's thoughts bleeding through into the microphone. It's not an easy call, not an easy call at all, because you have to look. You have to look, Is it was this the lead car's fault that caused a poor chase? Because we did see in the opposite that Zendara had a great lead and it, it caused a great chase. Yeah, so decision is about to drop in. I mean, a little discussion on this one, I'll be able to explain it. And the win goes to Dean Carney. Dean Carney gets the win and goes through. So, pretty simple one um, until the second run. So the first run, Dean has the advantage. All is easy there, right? Second run, Dean has a very poor initiation. And it's a dodgy one and it's kind of a bit <laughs> sketchy, right? Dodgy. Yeah, but dodgy, I get it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the problem was that for Zendara, she actually just reacts really badly to it. Not even that, yes, Dean wasn't perfect, but she shot onto the inside of the track and yeah. it just got her in a really bad position. If she had got closer to Dean and checked up or was on the same line or even on the chase line, we could have given her more of an excuse, but she exaggerated the problem a little bit. So even though it's closer than it seems and Dean got a big disadvantage for that, 
she could have made a lot more of it in, by being a little closer, a bit behind him. So just, it, to just, me, just falling back. Yeah, she yeah. she just got into a really weird position on the inside of the track, which gave her no recovery time for the rest of the run. So Dean Carney, not a confident victory, but a slight victory, and I mean very very close. So it looks like we are going to see Nima Voss up next, and unfortunately Nick Collier. Not able to make it to the line, yeah, so... Yeah, we, we saw him jump in Sean Booth's car to try and get into qualifying, but it looks like uh, Sean's car is also <laughs> having some issues. So Nick's run, running out of friends there in the paddock. So if, we're you, if, if you've got a, a Z, you know, in the parking lot yeah. with a welded diff, I might know somebody who needs it right yeah, now. Yeah, just don't give it to them because they break everything <laughs> out there. So we're going to see uh, Nima Voss just do a run of the course as a by run. So um, it's going to be obviously an automatic win and through to the top eight. Um, yeah, just to bring you back to that Carney decision, so it's, it, that's the problem with the lead in the chase. The lead can make a mistake, and that would have been a huge advantage to uh, Zendara. Huge. Yeah. But she also made a big mistake that wasn't really forced by the lead car. They weren't door to door. Yeah. There was time to react. There was time to look ahead and pull the handbrake and do something. So um, it's a tough one. When you're a judge like that, you've got to kind of play all the odds. And to me, it looked like big mistakes from both. But and he had the better chase on the lead run, so so it was. Uh, he was lucky. He was lucky he had it in the in the locker. So um, an interesting, uh, you know, these are the, the battles, especially when you put a lot of different chassis together, a lot of different styles. It can be a little bit messy sometimes because you're used to at the top level seeing those cars dialed in over over so many years. But the upside with it is we get some crazy things that happen, right? Exactly. The more variables that we add in, the more you know, chassis, horsepower, driver experience, whatever. Yep. You know, YouTube <laughs> YouTube subscriber yeah. count. It, it just changes how this all plays out. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. We're trying to be really transparent with the way we think and how we, you know, most most series you won't hear these kind of conversations. They'll just be a decision. But we're trying to keep it open so that you guys learn a little bit about how we think about things, how we make those decisions. And there's subjective decisions as always. You're, you're, you're put in a position to make the decision. And a lot of people online can say, I would have made that decision, but there's no consequence to a comment. There's no consequence to those things. So that's why even if you're a judge, and I've been a judge in many series, as long as you believe it's the right call, an unbiased, fair call in your opinion, that's all you can do. It's, it's going to have a million different other people thinking different things, but as long as you're happy with the call, that's all you can do. So we're moving on to this about I've watched from the bracket coming out going, this is going to be fireworks. Yeah. We've got Micah Diaz going up against Sean Booth. So this is going to be two guys that definitely do not know how to back down <laughs> or not go 110%. So we're going to have to keep our eyes peeled for this one. Don't be surprised if we see a little contact here, I would imagine. This is, this is going to be spicy. You've got two very, very aggressive drivers going to head, or head to head. So Sean Booth out front in the S chassis. BMW of Mike Diaz behind, and Mike Diaz not giving him a ton of space there on initiation, but Sean Booth getting out nice and wide there in the first, second outside zone, up into the wall, and Mike Diaz not giving him a ton of space, but definitely giving him more than I think he should. Would want to see him suck back in a little bit, and there we go. That's when it happens. Mike Diaz transitioning a little bit early and kind of forcing Sean Booth's hand to really push that car wide. So, Mike Diaz, it's, it's an interesting thing. You have to kind of predict when the driver is going to do it and sometimes you can almost force them to initiate by doing it a little bit before them kind of catching them off guard yeah i think the problem was uh, micah just went in too hot on the first corner and he had yeah. to delay his transition so he couldn't transition because sean booth was there and by the time he had look at the course it's all about momentum once you lose that momentum on that first transition he's having to struggle to get back into the fight and he does by cutting the course and again there sean goes a little wide here at the end i'm not a big fan of this but it wasn't a major mistake that upset micah at that point so to me it was micah doing the right thing of trying to be close on entry but he got two close and then he had to delay his transition leaving Sean to just put the foot down and leave him for dead for a little while so maybe small advantage to Sean Booth after the first run but it's still in the balance Sean's gonna have to go hard here because we don't want to see anybody playing possum or not getting close I don't think we'll have a problem with that with Sean no, Booth. No, I think, <laughs> I think we think, got the opposite I think issue. He's gonna, it's gonna be like uh, blood in the water now. I think there's gonna be more red on that Mike Diaz card than there was previously. So let's see now that we swap him around Mike Diaz out front Sean Booth obviously chasing is there, is there much of an advantage here with the right-hand drive car? But to kind of I'm not sure. dig into that a little bit more. But Mike Diaz on that initiation more or less just powers into it. Sean Booth not giving him a lot of space, diving in real deep and then sinking the car in. It's basically sacrificing the first outside zone to start pushing Mike Diaz around the track. What a great sacrifice to make. And now Mike Diaz stretching the legs on that BMW chassis. Sean Booth keeping it shallow. That's a pro move from, from Sean Booth there. Wow, that was super smart. He knew that car is going to slingshot through there, pulled a bit of angle out of the car, and just dove into the pocket. So let's take a look here at 
our replay. Sean Booth, yeah, right here. Basically just gives up on that zone so he can sink through the rest of it and then just gets right on the door of Micah Diaz. I think he, he might have tapped him just a bit. And then same thing here, really pulls out so he can dive in again at this section and, and through these last couple outside zones. Oh, there was some, there was contact. Sean Booth with a nice little body check there, getting them across the line. So it's be interesting. Judge is definitely discussing it going through. My counterpart, obviously playing judge as well as announcer. So hopefully we'll get his thoughts on this after. Sean Adriano, bring up his points. What do you guys think? Give it up for, uh, give it up for Sean Booth. Do you think Sean Booth's got this? Wasn't bad. What about Mike Diaz? Ooh, okay. I mean, Sean did hit Mike Diaz. So we have a decision. We've had a little conversation on this one and going through to the top eight is Sean Booth. Sean wow. Booth gets the win. Goes through to the top eight. Had a little discussion on it. Funny, very mirror mistake. So they both went too aggressive on the inside of the first corner. They both lost momentum with that with late early transitions. However, Sean gets much closer on proximity straight away. So where Micah took almost half the track to get back in the fight, Sean was right there thread. Micah has a little check up as he gets to clipping zone three, which again, and then Sean has a little mistake here where he goes too heavy. And this is actually goes to show the character of Micah Diaz because, you know, I'm not saying some people would, but you could throw a lot more of a, a football injury in there and spin out. But he stayed on it. He stayed honest till the end. And Sean Booth takes the win. But again, two great drivers yeah. doing a great job. They both actually were so aggressive, they messed themselves up, which is strange. But that's what we'd rather see that than safe driving. So impressive stuff from both. But Sean gets the call from us. We to see Luke Fink outside of his car. That can only mean one thing. Hurt going for his buy run. Yeah, so this is just weird. So you see Luke just look at that hurt in his car now. I've given my car to Hurt in the past, and, and Hurt is an apt name for that man because there's not many things he doesn't hurt. And uh, Luke Fink, though, of all things, has, if there's a stress tester before him, it has to be Luke Fink, right? Yeah. Yeah, if, if, it can, if it can survive Luke Fink, it can basically take on anything. Hurt now just, just getting some lap time in, get some seat time in, so uh, he can prepare for his next battle, which is going to be against Dean Carney, so that is not going to be easy. But Well, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that Hurt signed up to the event in a 240, arrived in a Pontiac GTO, and is now into the top eight in a Corvette. What's so that's, next? that's interesting. I mean, what's next? I mean, he might be in Damon Fryer's Lamborghini I, by the top four. We don't know what's going to happen. I going to say Daily Driven Exotics. Hide your keys, because <laughs> Hurt's coming for him. Yeah, we got a new crossover channel. Daily Broken Exotics with Hurt <laughs> and Damon Fryer. That would be a good, that'd be a good crossover. So we got Carney and Hurt. <laughs> And uh, uh, yeah, this is going to be, we got Carnage versus Hurt in the top eight, so uh, that's going to be fun. It can only end one way. <laughs> it's, it's With tow trucks. Yeah, I think Luke should pull the car at this point. Yeah. This, this, would be, this would be enough. Well, sir, this has been fun. Find exactly. another ride. So here we have the first ever competitive battle of Grammy Award winner T-Pain. It still sounds insane to say it, but he has gone up against RJ uh, Contreras, who's got a lot more experience in the BMW E46. E46. And this is going to be T-Pain's first time ever competitively chasing a lead car. So you're witnessing history in the making of a guy that's, I think, going to be in the sport for a long time. Has yeah. a super amount of passion, but has absolutely zero experience. So this is going to be a big uphill battle for him. I'm excited for him to somehow get Big Duck Club into a line of a lyric. Because he, he, he rhymed Wisconsin, so Big Duck Club has got to be The easy. problem is what it rhymes with, we can't say on the on the live stream. So hey. that's... The <laughs> That's for that's for T Pain to take. That's care of. for him to take care yeah. of, not for us. He has <laughs> he has a lot more. He can go riskier than we can. Yeah. So this is gonna be interesting. We got Mustang versus E46. Nick Swan's giving them the word. They're coming off the start line. Who knows what happens next? But you guys are in as much as we are. To see what it is, what goes down. All right. Off the lines of BMW. Big faint initiation. And T Pain. I think he get a little spooked by that. But I mean, hey, this is his first competition. Let's see what happens. That big Duck Club BMW. Doing a great job out in the lead. Could, could have got a little deeper in the first couple of zones and t pain along for the ride. And it's it's tough. I mean, it's super tough. It, it, any competition is not going to be easy. It doesn't matter who you are or how much driving experience you've got. But you know what? At the end of the day, t pains still here. Made it around the track. It's a good run. You know what? 
didn't uh, fold under the pressure, didn't no. spin out, just got in there. The only thing you got to look at here is that we got two very different machines on track two. T Pain's right. car is still like a full weight Mustang. It's more of a practice car to learn how to drift. He's going up against pretty much a competition car. So there's a huge amount of difference between those two. And, and weight counts for quite a bit. So yeah. uh, T Pain's got a heavier car, probably less grip in the car than uh, Orje has, but still doing a good job and doing the best he can. But then Orje has to chase the slower car now. So that can sometimes mess up drivers massively. So like RJ was out in the lead, he did a decent run. He's going to have an advantage, obviously, here because T-Pain is just not in the mix in, right. in the proximity. However, now in the chase position, RJ, all his power and his grip is going to have to adapt to a slower car, and that can also mess people up. So you never know what happens in the second half of these battles, but hopefully RJ can keep his composure. T-Pain can put in a good lead run. We've got a good clean battle. And here's hoping T-Pain turns off the air conditioning, gets an extra 10 horsepower, and just cranks it. So let's see. Good initiation from T-Pain. RJ playing way back, playing it safe. Knowing that there's some struggles there. Oh, oh. oh RJ. There you I go. This is it. T Pain finished his first run. RJ not able to finish his first run. He spun out. If T Pain finishes this, the plot gets real thick. So let's just see. I no. can't believe what I'm seeing. I right can't now. believe it either. Let's go, T Pain. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you know what? Drifting, right? Drifting, <laughs> drifting, drifting. What is drifting, Dave? There is no is sense. You know, I'm 10 years doing this, and I still go, every morning I wake up going, today <laughs> is the day I have it figured out. And we really, really don't have this fear. I'm going to have a little talk with the judges yeah. about boat runs, and we're going to get back to you guys with a decision. You, uh, yeah, you mute your mic there for a second. You chat with them, because this is incredible. Uh, I, I can't believe how, how excited T-Pin must be right now. I mean, he, he already left the track. He forgot. He was so pumped. He's like, yeah, I'm out. But let's, let's check out this replay and see how this all played out. So, right here, T-Pain still in line. Big break there. And then RJ just goes way offline, full straighten, reinitiate. So we might have to check to make sure T-Pain's chase run was a complete chase run that he didn't zero at some point in time. But if he did, I mean, RJ definitely zeroed very, very early on. T-Pain out, you know, not a great line. Got a couple of zones, but I don't know. Judge's decision on this one. We do have a decision, and going through to the top eight is T-Pain. Yes. T-Pain goes through uh. to the top eight, winning his first ever competitive battle. There's not too many drivers that have won their first ever competitive battle, I can be honest. Yeah. And here's the situation. Orge zeroes out. He comes in, he leaves T-Pain way too much room, and then when he transitions, he almost, well, he pretty much over-rotates, then straightens out, and even if you had a doubt about it, he also straightens up before the finish line as well. T-Pain, nothing perfect on either run, but he's drifted the whole track, and that's not a zero. So He, he finished. He, he finished the run. You know, his lead run wasn't bad. No. So, for example, in that situation, and I, it's just as crazy as it sounds, It's T-Pain <laughs> wins his battle goes to the top eight. Oh my god. That's this, is great. On, this is only day one. This, of this. this is only day one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be, yeah. To be fair, if you went home and told everyone who did you lose to and they like, went T Pain, it's like, oh no, but seriously. Grammy Award winning. Yeah. <laughs> what, like, no, T Pain, the rapper actually beat me at drifting and you're like, yeah. he's really good. And I'm like, what yeah. a world. In basically a stock car, I it's got It's basically beat. a stock Mustang. Yeah. So incredible I've carbon stuff. fiber dash. Shout out to T Pain. Mustang. That is a phenomenal moment for drifting. I think I'll always oh, remember. This is great. Then we move on to TJ Hunt and Jeff Jones. So TJ in a stock 370Z and Jeff Jones, former D driver. So again, bit of a mismatch. But we've been watching it be unpredictable all day, and I'm having fun Ooh. with it right now. So let's see what Saw happens. Some nitrous coming yeah, out of there. nitrous coming out there. So we got a 370 versus 350. A lot more power in Jeff Jones' car. In we go. All right, good initiation there. And Jeff Jones got to be careful because we obviously know TJ doesn't have nearly the horsepower that Jeff Jones does. But let's see how these chassis handle as they come around. Very, I mean, basically identical-looking cars minus you know everything else. But let's see how they handle through this. Just. TJ is, is making the best of the horsepower he's got, and Jeff Jones giving him enough space. Well, not anymore. He's giving him no space. He's going to push him around, make sure he stays at angle through that last zone. You know what? That's an excellent lead on Chase. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, great. there's a little waiver, a little waiver at the first corner from both. Jeff comes a little bit off throttle. TJ uh, has a little bit of a checkup as they come onto the bank. But, you know, for, for all in all, like, I mean, TJ's right on the zones where he needs to be. This is probably the little checkup just here. Watch this a little off throttle when he right hits there. the bank. And Jeff adapts really well to it. Jeff doing a good job in the chase position of not over committing at any point. And then I think Jeff knows at this point, if he's Steadies the car, 
He gets back on the door. Nice finish. TJ just washing a little bit wide there. But you got to say, from both drivers, it's a pretty smooth lead and chase. Jeff, I think for me, taking an advantage just from the proximity. But TJ did a good job in the lead. Um, you come down to the finest of details when it's a run like that, the little check up here, the little waiver there. You've got to be a little bit more critical, but I think it's still in the balance. But TJ is going to struggle now to keep with Jeff Jones. That's what I would imagine. So he's got to be clever here and play the proximity game, not the angle game in the chase, and be right on the door because that's the only way he's going to win this one. Knowing Jeff Jones, though, he will – he will. I wouldn't say, like, sandbag at all, but he's going to throw a bunch of angle at this. He's not going to just want to run away with it. No, I, I think so. But at, at the same time, TJ's got, you know, he's got one move here, which is close. Yeah. Close yeah, and low angle. He's got to do it. So TJ almost jumping the start a little bit. Jeff Jones, what just happened there? Yeah, that's that. The, to me, I think that looks like an impeding initiation okay. from TJ Hunt. He got it looked to me an initial. I'm gonna look at it back on the replay, but it looked to me like he didn't give the lead car enough room to initiate. I'm gonna have a little check of it here, just in live time. You're hearing my thoughts, but it looked to me like Jeff freaks out because TJ is on the inside of the course. But then, could he just have kept going? So I'm gonna have another look at that one. Yeah, when you see that a few times, I think Jeff could have initiated. It didn't look like he was completely impeding. He definitely did not give him a ton of room. Yeah, it, can, we, gonna, can we mulligan? I think we're going to have to have a look at this. No false starts here, so we're going to have a look what happens. So TJ is right up, he is alongside the lead car, but that yeah. to me looks like Jeff Jones has a problem. Okay. So I think, you know, we're going to have a little discussion on this one. So I just give us a minute. We're going to have a little chat about this one off air, but I think uh, this one is the one that's going to be interesting, I think, because we've got two issues here. One, could a driver have initiated? And did he feel the other car was impeding him? But was it impeding him is what we're going to decide. And, I mean, in TJ's defense, he's going to he's gonna want to get as close as he can because he knows that the moment that Jeff lights off those tires, he's going to take off. And you can see Jeff basically just stand on the brake because he, he was worried. It looked like he was worried. TJ was right next to him. The question is, like, in the moment you make that call, but whether or not you're actually going to hit him. So... We'll see here. Judges are having a discussion. Nick Swan's having a discussion. Basically, everybody is talking to somebody else except for me. I'm talking to everybody here. You guys enjoying the battle so far? So the judges are taking a look and understanding what is going on here to make their call. You know, Jeff obviously concerned. He doesn't want to just run into uh, run into TJ there. El Jefe making the call early. You can see right there, as he initiates, he basically looks right into TJ's window, and you can see him directly next to him. So watch right here. He initiates and then pulls out of it. So almost, almost on that feigned initiation as well, Jeff had to pull out of it early because TJ was right there. And we don't have a blend line, but we are going to get a decision to understand what we need to do next. So we have a decision, Jacob. All right. Um, just, you know, what we do sometimes is we have a good feeling on something, and then we look at the replays a couple of times just to make sure that. And we've watched this a couple of times, and we've come up with a decision. And that decision is that going through to the top eight will be Jeff Jones, Jeff Jones gets the win and goes through to our top eight. Jeff Jones gets the win, and we're going to explain why that is. All so, right. naturally in drifting, you want to initiate no further than the rear wheel of the lead car. So what happened on that run, and this is totally understandable from TJ, he knows he's at a disadvantage for horsepower, so he's trying to gun right up to the door. The problem is that when Jeff initiates, TJ has not initiated at all. So he's just driving straight up beside Jeff Jones, and Jeff is looking at it going, I'm going to hit him when I go through. So basically, he's impeding the lead car. He's blocking his path. You can see Jeff goes to initiate. He looks and sees TJ there, and TJ hasn't initiated. And at that point, he still hasn't initiated, so Jeff just says, I'm going to hit. You can see it from the front angle yeah. even better. You can see Jeff So, so Jeff could have just initiated, but he thought he was going to crash into TJ. We call that impeding the lead car, meaning that the lead car is frightened or avoiding an incident. And I think TJ just got a little too excited. It was the right idea, but the execution was just a little bit too aggressive. Therefore, if you look at the other run, Jeff Jones has a really good chase run. He has an advantage from there. So even if we didn't zero that, which we did, it would still be a case that as that's as far as the battle went, 
Jeff would still have got the win from his chase run. So it's not what we want to see. I'm sure TJ wanted to give that all his gusto. He wanted to go in there and give him an absolute, you know, door-to-door -door run, but he just, he pushed a little too hard. And even on the run-up, he didn't give Jeff a lot of initiation space when he went to weight transfer as well. So it's a technicality. It's not what we want to call all the time, but it's definitely in our rule book that we say, you can't impede the lead car, you can't bully the lead car, you can't. And what happens and why we do this is if you find a battle where someone has a, a, a 10-0 advantage, the other car will sometimes try and drive into the lead car. Not that this happened, but just to basically get him scared or get him to make a mistake. We don't want to see that. That's not what TJ intended yeah. in that case, but that's why the rule exists. No, it wasn't. It, it, by no means was intentional. TJ no. was trying to make sure that he could keep up with him. He yeah. knew horsepower wise. He knew once Jeff something. went on the throttle, he was in trouble, so he had to be there. And I think if TJ had initiated early and dove across the track on the shallow line, yeah. it would have been a little cleverer than trying to play Jeff at his own game on the wide line. Well, you can also just touch in behind him yeah. and you, you you come back and the moment he initiates you just dive in on the throttle exactly. and then initiate behind. it would have been easier for yeah yeah even if he was at rear wheel yeah. at the back bumper but right up on the front wheel right up on the door you're too far ahead and that's something that we, we you know yeah. it, it's unless he could have he could have just backed a little bit off and he, the problem is TJ hadn't initiated so it wasn't like he was diving up on his door on angle he was just driving when Jeff was drifting so right and Jeff doesn't know what's gonna happen Jeff right? might think that's just a torpedo going straight for Could him be. on the initiation yeah. or maybe TJ has a problem or whatever so Jeff obviously being an experienced driver felt and he doesn't get intimidated he felt that there was going to be an impact he avoided it we spoke with him and uh, our decision was kind of made up at that point anyway by watching the replay so just to give you guys a little insight not what we want to see all the time, but drifting doesn't play out like a comic book story and all this, you know, sometimes these weird things happen. So in one moment, you have T-Pain winning his first battle, and the next we've got a no start from Jeff Jones and TJ Hunt. So that's the LZ World Tour, baby. Just, yeah, for the, that's everything showbiz, happens. baby. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. So yeah. if you want, you put all this unpredictability together, guess what you get? Unpredictability. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just, you add more variables and more crazy things happen, so. Got, I mean, top eight is, is shaping up to be pretty crazy. Yeah, so we're going to move straight to uh, one of our battles between Hurt and Dean Carney. So this Let's is... Uh, that one, huh? Hurt and Dean Carney, but Hurt is in a Corvette. It's an all-American battle with an Irish guy thrown into one of the cars. Yeah. Well, like Makes a sense. Corvette versus Viper. I mean, this is as... This is as... Uh, this is like, yeah, this is like a bold, Motor Trend magazine article. Get, right? As yeah. you say over here. This is as... Uh, this is uh, all... America. This, yeah. We got uh, 18 cylinders about to head to the line. And uh, two, I would say, drivers sitting almost over the rear wheels in both of these cars. Proper sports cars, uh, very lightweight, almost tube frame chassis cars. And, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a Corvette. They're quite small inside. And, and I feel like, you know, Large gentlemen drive Corvettes, like we've got Josiah Flays, we've got Luke <laughs> Fink. He's like seven feet yeah, tall, like, too. They're, they're, you know, there is, they're quite a small car in there. Yeah. And uh, Dean, I, I said I looked in Dean's car when I was in his workshop two days ago, and half of his body is like between the A and B pillar. Like he's sitting out almost like a sidecar, and mm. there's so little room. Well, it's going to be interesting to see these two guys shake it up. I mean, at the moment, Nappy Boy Automotive looking pretty strong. Two right. guys into the top eight. But uh, Dean Carney is not going to, you know, he's a big fan of Hart and they're all good friends behind the scenes, but he's not going to want to go out here. No, I, I have a feeling Dean's Dean's going to start pushing people now. Yeah, but you know, look at Dean making a big error in his lead run, you know, yeah. just, just about scraped through in his battle against Sandara Kennedy, so he's got to tidy that up massively here. This is an interesting move, Dave. Uh, you know, Hurt is in the, the wrong position. <laughs> so let's take a look and see I, I mean I'm, I'm very curious to see how this is going to end up playing out obviously Dean Carney taking the lead on this one just with the uh, the qualifying and then hurt just in a car that he's never really driven before and see how it all plays out Nick Swan checking it with the drivers letting everybody know what's going on and then we'll get this underway here in a few minutes well probably in less than a few minutes but Okay, so we were just having a conversation about um, the Jeff Jones and TJ Hunt battle. And really? They, both guys said they'd like to run it again, and we said, well, hold on, this isn't a real series. We could just run it again, so we might just run it again. We're having wow. a little conversation, because I kind of felt a bit, you know, that it wasn't a good way of doing it. So if it was a normal series, we'd have done it that way, but Adam LZ runs the show around here, and if he wants to see somebody and I want to see somebody else, we can just make it happen. That's the great thing. And now here we are with a Viper and a Corvette on the start line and another 
this is going to be a top force position up for grabs. So this is getting close to getting back into the main event. So this is going to mean a lot to both of these guys. We got Hurt and Dean Carney. It'll be Dean Carney in the lead position. Hurt in the chase. And Hurt is coming out swinging here. Let's see here. Big initiation there from Dean. Putting on the Jets, but Hurt not letting him get too far away. Getting back on throttle. He's, I mean, he's keeping up with them. Horsepower wise, there is a bit of a discrepancy, but you could not tell. Hurt is driving this car like he was born in it. Dean Carney trying to get away from Hurt, but he is not letting him. Dean with a really good lead run out front, but Hurt, I mean, not a ton of proximity. He's not on his door, but he is no. definitely in the conversation. I'm seeing an orange Corvette in the future. An, an orange <laughs> Corvette with big old chromey boy big wheels. Big Johnny's. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, to me it looks like for Dean again, he's having trouble on this first transition So Hurt actually loses a lot of ground, but Dean actually lets him back into this one And Dean doesn't have a great line here in the lead. He's kind of on the inside of the track He misses two of the zones more or less So even though Hurt isn't on great proximity from where I'm sitting Dean's not giving him a great opportunity as well because he's kind of shortcutting the track a little bit um, Not the cleanest of leads or chases, but no proximity from Hurt, but no major mistakes Dean does you know that lead run needs a little bit of work especially through the first corner through the first arc so um, definitely this one's going to come down to the second run now we watched Dean in his previous battle put on a clinic when it comes to the chase runs and that's what he's going to have to do here because I'm not convinced after that first run either way to be honest I'm sure the judges are the same it wasn't yeah. we would call it wishy-washy wishy-washy wishy -washy. it's like kind of meh like it was okay in the lead okay in the chase but we want to see somebody win it and not somebody lose it more you know what i mean so yeah. this is what we want to see in the second half of the battle well hurt wasn't super close but he was consistent in his yeah and then also you know sometimes when people aren't close it's very easy with your eye to look at them and go oh he's nowhere near but then when you watch dean cutting the course he's he's making it faster so yeah. it's not giving him that opportunity by being on that perfect lead line Here's the thing, 10 years ago, you would have looked at that and like, they were on door on door. It's yes. amazing, like, that's how, how far drifting how has come. How critical we are of drifting compared right? to 10 years ago. That would have been the best battle you've ever seen in your life 10 years ago. Yeah. Go back and watch battles from 10 years ago, oh, and then oh, come back and realize yeah. how good we have it now. Second half of the battle underway. It's going to be Fink's car on the lead, but it's hurt behind the wheel, Carney in the chase. Let's see here, Dean diving in. Hurt getting out to that outside line. Dean not giving him much space, but shallowing a ton to get that proximity giving up a lot of angle to get in nice and tight, but as Hurt gets through our transition section, he's doing quite well, and Dean, not your car, not my problem, <laughs> as he pushes the car through the rest That's of the zones. That is ridiculous. It's so silly. It's so ridiculous. It's so silly. Oh my God. So, so you can't be mad, it's not even your car. He's just ruined Luke Fink's car. <laughs> ruined it. Uh, uh, and, and Luke Fink not even in the battle. No. Here's how I see it straight off the bat. Um, to be honest, again, similar mistake from Hurt here that Dean had. It took him ages to settle here. He's over the track, he's slowing down. Dean almost makes contact, and again, Hurt not on the correct line, kind of halfway between it. This is where it gets interesting. As Dean dives through the smoke here, he picks up a lot of pace, and as he transitions back, he very much dives in. Hurt should be on thrall here, but he's late <laughs> on thrall, and then Dean kind of says, just go, 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 and he kind of pushes Hurt through the last section of the course. Very exciting to watch. It's like the kid on the slide that doesn't want to go down, so you just push him. <laughs> but obviously right. hurt Got having a good time are we live are we doing this all right Therese, hurt <laughs> we, bro we, you look we throwing way it down? too comfortable out there and i mean that in the best way possible he was literally flirting with them his hand was out the window like come and freaking get it how are you feeling stop smiling i dare you dude this is crazy this is my first time ever driving a corvette shout out shout out luke fink for letting me continue um it's a crazy situation to be battling someone like dean kearney and a 1,400 horsepower Dodge Viper. I'm just happy to be here. Shout out LZ for throwing the world tour. Shout out to all you guys for being here and everyone watching on the live stream. We love you guys. Give it up, guys. Let's go. Shout out to the LZ World Tour rules. That was such a good show. We're going to go check in with Dean. Dean. You are one of the most fun drivers to watch. You always put on a good show. You have hurt driving in this car for the first time ever. You were on his door. How did you feel about him flirting with you a little bit and really asking for you to give it to him? Oh, it's a blast. The, the, the two of us are friends for 15 years, so it's just such a good time at these events to be able to come out and do this with your friends. And, like, slapping and banging off each other is exactly what I think all of these events are about, you know? And that's what gets the fans excited. That's what gets me excited, and that's why I love doing this shit. I think we all had butterflies watching that whole thing go down. That was such an entertaining run. Thank you so much for the show. Everybody give it up for these two drivers.
Thank you, Cerise. And uh, you know what? We have a decision dropping in, and this will be going through to the final four today of the Last Chance Top 16. Winner is Dean Carney. Dean Carney gets the win and goes through. Guys, give it up for Hurt, though. Borrowed car, <laughs> and I don't know, we're going to have a serious conversation with Luke Fink when he gets back to the paddock with how many panels have been punched in in the last two battles. But an amazing effort from Hurt as he goes. Guys, give him a round of applause from the grandstands. Didn't want to give up on you guys, borrowed a car, came out there and put on a good show. And from the judging position, it just, again, Carney and the chase. I mean, his lead run was, everyone's lead run was a little sketchy in that one, but Carney, incredible job in the chase. Actually, Hurt checks up, washes wide, and Carney literally carries him to the finish, just pushes him to the finish line. And, you know, this is what this fun event is all about, going on doors and, and two very honest drivers. And we're going to go back to this which is Jeff Jones and TJ Hunt. So we kind of made a call. We felt bad about it. Yeah. So I was kind of thinking, I don't know if that's the way we want to do this event. That's the way we might do a real pro event, and it would just be cut and dry, and we would agree with that decision against. But Jeff and TJ were like, is there any chance we could run it again? Normally, you wouldn't. But now we're like, you know what? We're having what? fun this weekend. Yeah. There's no point in TJ Hunt going home on a technicality like that. Let's do it better. Jeff Jones and TJ Hunt are now going to be going on the second half of the battle. So the first is in the books. We know Jeff has a little advantage from being a good chase on TJ Hunt. But now we're going to run the second half of the battle. And Jeff Jones is uh, going to be in the lead position. So let's hope TJ has learned from maybe that little mistake. And again, TJ, a new driver to competition. Uh, we've all done these things learning along the way so this is very rarely you get to call a mulligan and just do it again but that's what we've decided we didn't it didn't sit well with us so no. for you guys at home for you guys in attendance here we go again jeff jones in the lead tj in the chase much cleaner initiation this time yeah jeff able to initiate tj definitely held back and now he is diving in he's going to try and figure out the speed and horsepower wars a little bit jeff staying nice and wide a little bit shallow there in outside zone three but tj doing a good job i mean considering the horsepower difference i couldn't tell and there we go, Jeff Jones getting into those outside zones. Oh, there he goes, he loops it. Well, <laughs> this is just one of those days, Jacob. Just one of thickens. those days. You, I tell you, if you wrote a script for this drift event today, you wouldn't believe it. You'd say that's too uh, fictional. We need to yeah. be a little bit more realistic. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> sure, like this, I mean, I've got to say, can we get a huge round of applause for Jeff Jones who wanted to run this again? Jeff Jones said, no, I want to do it clean. I want to do it again. We all agreed. And it might just be to his detriment because we're going to have a little discussion on that one. But it looks to me like there was some mistakes made. Yeah, I mean, Jeff wasn't perfect in the outside zone. I don't know if maybe he was struggling with something at that point in time, but. Well, we got Cerise down there on track with TJ. Talk us through it, Cerise. What happened? All right, TJ, we have some questions for you. Give us a little bit of inside perspective as to what was going on with you, what was going on with the car. How are you feeling? Uh, feeling good. Uh, obviously, a lot of energy in me right now. Uh, we're doing the best we can with a car that's severely underpowered. We're, so we're using every tactic we can to win these battles. So when going against Jones, we're trying to jump the line and we're trying to use every ounce of momentum going into initiation. And uh, you know, sometimes stuff happens. Jeff thought he was going to write me off. I totally get that. And uh, call didn't go our way. So I'm really happy that. Everyone in the stands started throwing a fit. I saw over on live stream, um, so I appreciate that. It, it got us to like rally up, and uh, LZ hopped in the group chat. He was like, "Yo, can you guys run it back, Jeff?" I mean, I have to give hats off to Jeff for just being like, "Yeah, of course I don't want to win that way." So big respect and honor, and uh, you know, not the way I like to win, just like that. But uh, I'm happy to move on. I think that was a really, really good response. And I, I overheard you talking, Jeff, to Nick Swan. You were like, no, dude, I don't want to go out like that. We want this to be a fun battle. It's all for you guys. It's all for you guys watching at home. Jeff, how are you feeling about the turn of events here? Uh, this is a great event. I'm really stoked to be here. And of course, we want to win like men driving badass. That was just a really weird thing. And maybe I'm just so used to being in Formula D to where I know I have the right of way to let my car do what it is. And then when they said I got the win, I was like, there's freaking no way. Like, this is no, no way I want to win like that at all, period. So I'm glad we were able to pull that out. And uh, that was fully my mistake right there. So good stuff. Kick ass. Adam, thank you so much for hopping in the chat and giving these gentlemen an opportunity to give you the show that you really wanted. Now, is there anything that you would have done differently? No. Yeah. I think I would have. Again, I'm just using everything we can in, in our toolbox. And uh, it's, again, it's an honor to be driving with these guys. So I'm giving it 110. These boys are in love. It's so cute. I love to see it. Boys, thank you so much for the sportsmanship. Thank you so much for the show. Okay, give it a go. Everybody, give it up for these two drivers. Thank you, Adam. 
Well, there you have it. We have a decision in at the end of the two runs between Jeff Jones and TJ Hunt going through to the final four at the last chance top 16 is TJ Hunt. TJ Hunt gets the win and goes through. And, and you know what? It's one of those things where obviously when we run series around the world, there's oh, everything's black and white. That's the way sport has to be. But this event is not black and white. This is about personality. This is about the show. And of course, we make a decision, which is by our rule book. But once the drivers agree, and I mean, you got to give it up for Jeff Jones. He yeah. eliminated himself from the competition because he essentially gave TJ a chance back in and then made his own mistake. So that does not, you try and say that at Long Beach to Jeff Jones, he ain't going to give you that. But to this, this weekend, he'll give it to you. So good, good show from Jeff Jones. TJ moves into the top four. He's moving forward towards a closer to getting back into that last chance top 16. And we're moving on to our next battle, which we'll see Dustin Farrell. Go up against Margaritas. So this is going to be, this again, it, like an interesting one. Two guys getting better and better every run. So hopefully they can tidy this one up. It's been a little bit scrappy. What I like, it's been very scrappy but very entertaining, mm -hmm. which is good. I like a bit of entertainment too. But we, we need some clean runs in here at some point. And they've driven together. I mean, they both uh, run through hot pit. I don't know the stats on this, who's beat who more. But uh, definitely this will be a talking point co uh, going forward. But Dustin out front, Margaritas following behind. Dustin lighting up the tires right away. Margaritas almost going a little bit too much angle there on initiation, having to dive back in to get back on Pharrell. And we'll see how they're able to hold things together. A lot of angle there from Dustin. Oh no, lost in the sauce early on, but Margaritas and Dustin able to hang on to it. Margaritas having to pull back a little bit, just not knowing what Dustin was gonna do. But then Margaritas over rotates. That's tough. Like, this is, again, when you're judging this stuff, you go, okay, Dustin's made a big mistake there. That looks like it's all cut and dry. And then another yep. bigger mistake at the end of the run. So we got to look at this one on the replay. It's going through the replay. We can see this is it right here. We just over rotate. I mean, he pulled it together, but definitely goes past where he should be considering. The judges are obviously discussing that as one main point as we continue on through the replay right here. Margaritas dives in, isn't able to scrub enough speed, and then almost, I wouldn't say it has to reinitiate, but definitely has to get back into drift. So they're gonna swap it back around, you know, big mistakes for both drivers, lead and chase. Yeah, maybe it'll sort itself out. Maybe it'll sort itself out in this run, but uh, there was definitely some problems in that previous one. So we're gonna get both these drivers up here running again. Yeah, we were just having a little, little discussion on that one. A little chit chat. And, and yes, it's because I was obviously watching with you, and then we, I spoke to Sean and Jason. We all had the same opinion on that one. So it looked at us like Dustin um, had basically stalled up and almost straightened out, causing a lot of the issues in that battle. But we'll get back to it at the end of it. Here we go in second run. Could all switch around just as quick. Margarita's putting on the Jets. And getting out there, but Dustin not letting him get away from Margaret's pulling a bit of angle out of the car, but Dustin riding his door. He knows, I've made a mistake. I've got to drive this hard. Not a lot of room there through that transition. Margaritas has learned from his mistakes. We'll see. Dustin just tucking back a little bit too far. Did Margaritas over-rotate in that section? Was that a lead problem? Was that a chase problem? This is what's going to go into the judges. You know, we would hope that maybe this battle could kind of help decide it, but honestly, it just complicates the decision even more. So a couple of small mistakes here. Margaritas is shallow through these zones, but Dustin able to stay on him, throwing a bit more angle. Margaritas throws a little bit more angle after that. The transition looks great. And then as they start to push through this section, we need to see, is there any more mistakes? Dustin transitioning a little bit late, but also Margaritas almost parked the car on that section. So a lot of these small mistakes, whether or not it's adding up to all of it, the judge is going to have to get to it, but uh, Therese is going to find out what, uh, what's going through their heads. Oh, All right, we live? We good? All right, guys. Uh, that was a significantly different second run compared to your first run. What was going on with you and the car? It felt a little snappy. Explain to me what was going on. Yeah, so we have a big problem with blowing in deck uh, all the practice today. And we do some adjustments because we try to learn the Accelera tires, which I'm pretty exciting. And thank you, Accelera, to help us to do this event. And we don't have enough practice before the qualified, so we actually uh, practice the car on the qualified. So I try to figure it out, what's going on with the car. And uh, I think my lead was way more better. So are the judges, so are the people. We try my best. But yeah, the car is back 100%. And I hope you guys like the show. 
the, the, your lead run was very, very smooth in comparison. Now let's go ahead and check in with Lil Webby over here. Problem, so I have to stay a little bit back. He tell me he have a problem, so I have to stay a little bit back because I'm, I, we don't want to hit our cars. We are very good friends, and he's an awesome driver. When I'm driving with him, I'm always going 100%. So, you know. Let's go see if he shares the same sentiment. Great job out there. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What I was just saying to him is that first run was significantly different than the second run. What was going on with your car? How do you feel about the two compared? Uh, just having a little bit of issues with the car, trying to get it dialed in. I basically have zero brakes and or having steering issues. So chucked the belt, took out a sensor, and now we're sitting here trying to make the car run. And it took it a little bit, but it's kind of sketchy. So. Well, it was a very good show. I love a little bit of drama. Okay, so give it up for these two drivers, eh? All right, a little louder. Come on! Thank you so much. Great job. Let's see what the judges have to say. Thanks, Reese. And uh, we have got a decision. We'll explain it in a moment. But this is for a spot in the final four. And decision will drop in any moment. And going through is... Margaritas gets the win and goes through to our final four. Dustin Farrell eliminated at the top eight stage. We're going to explain that. So basically, on the first run, we've got a huge straighten up from... Dustin. So he straightens up and it puts Margaritas way off. He has to back off, go on big angle. Now we did see Margaritas have a half spin sort of towards the end of the run. But what we're deducting is that he wouldn't have been in that position if he wasn't pushed so far back in the battle and trying to climb back in it because Dustin had basically stopped his chase run in the first corner. Okay. So we kind of excuse that. In the second run, I would still give a small advantage to Dustin. He had a really good run. But we're going to have to go with the zeros in the first. And we think that uh, basically Dustin had zeroed out completely on the, on the bank section. He was per perfectly straight from the angle we looked at on the replay or very close to it and messed up that battle So in reality, he didn't give a good lead run for Margaritas to chase and Margaritas had to do the big crazy dive to try and even get back in it again He didn't need to at that point. We'd already kind of decided that battle mm. So that is how it works and we're moving on to our final four It was another scrappy one another messy one. you guys are kind of hearing it as we talk it But we're moving on now to Voss versus Booth so this is going to be all of the HGK versus all of the what's left of that RB25 <laughs> S15. This is going to be an interesting one. Two very aggressive drivers on track. Voss has got a lot of pace, but the car looks a little tricky to drive. we got Sean Booth, who's very used to his car, but again, it's not the fastest out there. So this is going to be interesting. Even though they are on the same tires, two very different machines. Let's see who wins out. Voss out front with a straight line initiation, but Booth not giving him too much to work with. Now let's see if Voss can get the car dialed in. His progression throughout this weekend has been incredible, from barely able to get around the track to laying down a great set of outside zones. You can see that car slingshotting. And Booth right now has got to dive in and get in the pocket and hold it there, and that's exactly what he's doing. A little bit late to get on the throttle, and that's where that gap comes out. That, that Eurofighter, I mean, they can bite in so quickly and just make grip out of nowhere. So that's what Booth is up against. And taking a look at this replay, you can see Voss out front. Yeah, he just drops a wheel on the inside of that initiation. He does take it a little shallow, but everywhere from there, he's on a pretty good, decent lead line. Like, he's got a good pace. He's given Booth a lot to work with. Booth does well. I mean, he's not got definitely not got the pace of that uh, M2 BMW, but he's doing a great job. And he does catch up right here at the end. And as you can see, the lead car just pulls that gap. It's got that little bit more grip. Again, initiation for me was the only part that Voss just does a little error. He drops a wheel over the far side, but he's moving at pace. He's not like in any way doing anything wrong. This is still very 50-50 for me after the first run. I'm sure the other guys feel the same, but I think it's going to come down to whether or not Voss can put some proximity on here because Sean has done that. And again, it's all about that lead in the chase. Well, this is going to be Voss's first chase run. Obviously, he's got a buy run from the previous one, so he's got to see if he can get that car dialed in and not just push Booth through the rest of the run. And you can see that dive really quick. He had to pull back on it. And Booth able to get nice and wide through there. And Voss pedaling the car a little bit so he doesn't end up just firing into the back of that S15. And you can see some of the hesitation. He's not super comfortable understanding where the grip limit is in that car. But here it is. That's That was what I was waiting for. That little bit of contact. Voss getting a bit aggressive and starting to take off a little bit more of the paint on that absolutely yeah, beautiful this, this car. One's, this one's close, Jacob. We're going to yeah. have to have a little, a little look at this. So looking through, all the judges are looking for right now is going to be mistakes. So you're going to see, okay, where, where are the problems? Where is somebody going offline? Are they transitioning too soon? Are they transitioning too late? And Voss gets really, really aggressive here. Booth gets back on the throttle, but that, that Eurofighter is so fast. Oh, I thought they made contact. I was almost positive they made contact there, but not quite. 
We're gonna throw it down. Let's get Sean Boo's thoughts. All right, I am here with Sean Boo. Sean, that was actually a very impressive lead and a chase run. The proximity was insane. I mean, you kind of just like, you're like, I don't care. I'm gonna go as hard as I can this round. That's what it's coming off as. Thank you, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> How's the car feel? It feels great. Love the car, it drives itself really. But I'm having so much fun out here. Can't complain one bit. You look like you want to take a nap, my dude. He's so relaxed right now. I wish you guys could see this. All right, we're going to go check in with Voss. That was phenomenal. Good job. All right, let's go see what he has to say. Oh, my God. All right. OK, so like that was really impressive. This car is certainly set up well, but you gave this car a run for money. That was great proximity. Very consistent. How are you feeling right now? I feel amazing. I was probably one of my more confident runs I had, and I'm glad I got to have it during battle. Um, we've been kind of fighting the car all day and changing things up, so now we finally got a, a comfortable setup, and uh, that was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Booth has looked very confident in his car the whole weekend. Have you worked out any issues while you've been here? Yes, a lot of things are broken. Luckily this weekend, not as much as others, but we've been fighting steering binding issues that keep causing my steering to lock when I get to full angle. So that was a big uh, uh, battle for us. And then uh, also I've been driving on uh, other tires yesterday all day for practice. So switching into the accelerators was also a big battle. So between the both, I was trying to fight the front and the back of the car, but uh, luckily we made it work. These guys make it look so easy, but there's so many variables that go into consideration. So well done. Let's see what the judges have to say. Best of luck. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sorry, and yeah, we have a decision on this one, and uh, the winner is nobody because we're going to go <laughs> one more time, one more time between Nima Voss and Sean Booth. And you know what? It was very similar. Both runs uh, had from clipping zone one to two. Sean Booth is too shallow, and Voss is too wide. So they basically have an issue there, which messes up a little bit of proximity. Everywhere else. There was some moments of great, moments of not so great, some good proximity with moments that weren't. So there was nothing in there that I would say, you know, we would stamp down, that's right. the better driver. So we decided that in the fairness of it, that we would say, let's see them go at it again. I think there's more in the tank for both of these guys that they should be a little cleaner on their lines. So um, we're going to see that one go one more time. And next, we're going to see TJ Hunt against T-Pain. So that's normal. Uh, yeah, on, on of course. A, you know, classic Saturday drifting here. Um, so this is going to be interesting. We've got T-Pain in a pretty stock car. We've got TJ Hunt in a pretty stock car. And, uh, yeah, pace might not be a big issue here for both of these guys. TJ with a little bit more experience. But, again, you're looking at two guys that are not pro drivers. So remember this. You know, you watch <laughs> it like it's Formula Drift or Drift Masters or whatever. But these are two amateur drivers on a pretty tricky track trying to go head-to-head. -head. This is the second competitive battle in T-Pain's entire drift career. And you've watched all of his competitive drift career today. <laughs> so here we go. It's going to be TJ in the lead, T-Pain in the chase. Anything can happen. All right, TJ out with the initiation. T Pain behind. That's going to get confusing real quick. But TJ, first outside zone looks good. T Pain going a little bit wide there, getting a little squirrely. But TJ a little bit shallow, leaving a bit of an opening for T Pain to be able to dive back in. And then TJ getting through the rest of the course. But same thing, T Pain's not giving up. He's still making it through the course. He may not be on his door, but he is finishing, which. At the end of the day, this is what's got him this far. Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, look, this is going to be an obvious one for everybody watching. That TJ just comes out the blocks yeah. through the gears very fast. I mean, he's he's not letting up. It was a very a sort of tentative run up from T Pain. He's been doing that all day, just not going in over his abilities, just kind of going in smooth. But he washes too wide, trying to catch up, takes out the cones. TJ is not on the perfect lead run, but it's not bad in any way, shape, or form. And for me, this proximity gap is basically caused by commitment from TJ Hunt. He's he's going through much faster. He's being much more aggressive. And uh, T-Pain's just kind of coming a little bit on and off throttle and a little bit more tentative. So, you know, you, you don't want to give... And again, those those Zs, especially in the lead position, they, they don't have much tire smoke because they're making all the grips, so they're just moving. So at this moment in time, it looks to me like the advantage would be with TJ Hunt. But however, however, this has changed quite a few times this weekend. So now we've got T-Pain in the lead. He's going to be coming in a little bit slower. TJ's got to adapt. And we saw what happened with Jeff Jones. You know, TJ just has to be careful here that it's not over by the second quarter. He's got to be clever. He's, got to, he's probably learned that lesson massively in the last battle. And that's what these events are all about, is learning that experience. Now TJ has to be a little clever and say, I'm going to back off a little bit here and see what he does. So. Um, yeah, this is this is it's very interesting. It's like a game of chess out there, Jacob, because you, you don't want to overcommit. 
And then if you undercommit, you go home and you got a long drive home going, why did I just sit there doing nothing? I just let him win. So it's a tough game drifting. It's all down to like minutes and moments. And, and, and the best thing about drifting is you can make a mistake in a split second and talk about it for four hours after the event. That's literally what would happen. So it happens so fast. And it's not like, you know, circuit racing where you get another 20 laps to get back into it. It happens in a heartbeat. So t Payne's going to see uh, what he can do in the lead position. TJ coming in the chase and TJ playing a little cautious here. T-Pain with the initiation out going nice and wide and then getting back in so that first outside zone washing a little bit wide again on the second we saw before TJ playing it safe but he's he's still there he's keeping the proximity he's going to make sure that T-Pain gets around the track and he's not going to have the same distance and chase but T-Pain put together a pretty tidy run here as I say that cutting a little bit shallow through zones four and five we get through yeah, very professional run from TJ Hunt. Yeah. He, he basically said, I'll just see what happens in front of me here, and I'll react to that. But he wasn't a, inactive. No, and he was in the mode. He was in the zone. It was really, really good. You can see, again, T-Pain having the same issue, it looks to me, from clipping zone one to two, that he's just washing. He kind of goes on a li very little angle here, so he's not scrubbing any speed, and he just kind of washes through the track, almost putting three wheels off the circuit. But TJ adapts beautifully to that. He can see what's happening in front of him. He doesn't want to slam into the lead car. Or he's, you know, he's keeping his, uh, his nose clean, as we would say, on our side of the world just saying let's see what happens and uh, it's a very clever run from tj hunt for me well let's get the first professional interview for t-pain cerise is down there right now this is his first like drifting interview in competition Wild. it's incredible cerise what's t-pain got to say all right ladies and gentlemen let us remind you this is t-pain's first competition event that first run versus that second run how are you feeling compared i think i think i'm peeing in my shoes all right, okay, so overall the car feels good. The power difference, I mean, like you're going against TJ Hunt. This isn't his first rodeo, so. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I have my eyes closed for most of that. But, you know, everything worked out. It was it was fun. I appreciate it, you know. I'm just happy to be here, man. So, like, good. That was so good. So proud of you, dog. So you just drove against T-Pain. This was his first event. But, dude, it's, it, I'm sorry. It's T-Pain, dude. How are you feeling right now? Uh, I was just texting Sabrina. I was like, I just drove with T-Pain. That was so sick. Everybody give it up for these two drivers. Come on, get out of the car. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Oh, man. That was good. Oh. We love a good show here at the LZ World Tour. We have TJ Hart, we have T-Pain, we have two very different cars, but two very, very enthusiastic drivers. Judges. Who wins this one? Yeah, we got a decision coming in. We should have a new, new group called TJ Payne. That's what we could call it. <laughs> So it is going to be a decision from us. Um, TJ Payne, we could have the crossover of the century here. <laughs> I'm going to have to agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. Decision coming through. Winning the battle is TJ Hunt. TJ Hunt gets the win, and he goes through to our final. Oh, man. That was oh, great. Oh, sorry. Time. Semifinal. 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 Get, Get ahead, ahead of yourself out. here. Yeah, so it is going to be into the final four for TJ Hunt. He's been battling through the whole day. California makes some noise for TJ Hunt and give it up one time for T Pain. First competitive event ever. What a phenomenal performance from him. He won his first battle, and you know what that means. You're now sucked into the misery of drifting forever, where you believe it's going to be as good as that forever, and your car breaks, and you got to spend so much money, and there's no getting out. It's just no getting out. So he's going to be uh, definitely pumped for the next. So we're going to be back very shortly with our semi final here at Kern Raceway. California, having fun tonight. Yes, that's what we want to hear. We're back with the final four. Remember, four drivers will remain, but only three will go back into the main event tomorrow. We're back after these small ad breaks. Don't go anywhere. The action is just getting started.
uh, an ECU. Internal live band, ethyl control, all the motorsport functions. You can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer. Which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those features I have thanks to Link ECU. That's all he needs. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely a big shout out to Link ECU. Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tires, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here in Current Raceway. It's been a fun day so far. If you're just joining us, remember this is the last chance top 16. So these are the drivers that qualified from 14th down to 29. So basically they're battling it out for three positions to go into the main event tomorrow. Our top qualifiers are all in there already. And we've had an amazing day. You know, we've seen T-Pain win his first battle. He was once on a boat. He's definitely now in a car because that's where he needs to be. The boat wasn't working in a car. I'm, I'm just... I really just want him to become further and deeper into the addiction of drifting now. I feel he's gotten one, a taste. The, you know what? You win one battle in That's drifting, it. and you go, I am now all the greatest in. drifter of all time. Yeah. I just need more practice. And then you get sucked into 10 years of it, and you question your life choices. But that's fine. Because if you've got people like us encouraging you to do it, that's great. So basically, we're going to move into our last couple of battles. We've got a rerun now between uh, Nima Voss and... Sean Boots, this was a one more time. This was great too battle. close to call for us. It was a great battle. Some errors between clipping zone one and two for both drivers, sort of balancing each other out, which means that they didn't really give each other the best opportunity to be on the door for the whole run. So we're going to see him go back at it again. We wanted to see it go again because it was just too close to call. And again, this is a fun event. You can watch it like you're watching any other competitive event, but you're watching it too seriously. This is fun. Yeah. It's all about personality, people jumping in different cars. We got a Euro fighter against a guy's kind of amateur practice car. Yeah. This doesn't happen in anywhere else in the world. And these guys are going one more time to see what happens. So Voss out front, Booth behind. Voss really getting that car dialed in, but Booth not giving him much room, getting that dive in and getting the car settled. He's going to start marking his territory here any minute. We're going to see some red on all that yellow. But Voss laying down a great run, getting that car settled, really taking a lot of grip out of it, making it look really smooth. And Sean Booth sitting in behind him, tucking in. It's a good run. It's just a yeah. This just, is a good fun run. And, and the trouble for us as judges is we only have one one more time, so we're getting a little nervous right. after that one. The only thing I can notice on that is it's a much cleaner lead run from Voss. Sean has to dial out a ton of angle to stay on proximity. You can see it here. Voss doesn't wash wide this time. He stays right to the track just to barely say, Sean again has to dial off the angle. Doesn't have the pace in the car, and he's doing a great job of staying in the fight here. And again, you can see just when they get to those poles, Voss has that little bit of legs in the car to get away from him. This is a bit where Voss makes a mistake. He goes way too deep and just has to back off a little bit, but Sean deals with it very, very well. So again, it's, it's right in the balance. It's not a very easy decision for us at the moment because Voss has sort of cleaned up a little bit of the mistakes he's done in the first run, but Sean has brought much more proximity than he did on the first run. So they're both stepping up at the moment. Well, and the great part is they're all on these, the, the the exact same tire. They're all in the Acceleras, you know, they're 200 tread wear. They're, they're, it's, it's amazing to see what the drivers have been able to do on them, the speed that they're getting out of them, and it, it's really just even the playing field. So let's see here with Sean out front. Can Voss dial that car back in as we're getting sparks off of Sean Booth's car already? 
Not sure what that came off of, but Sean Booth really getting, he's, he's driving a little more angry. He's a little more aggressive. He's getting more speed, more sparks. Voss diving in a little bit late there. We'll see, and you can see now he's diving in a bit early. So Voss looks like he's almost in panic mode, where Sean Booth is just, just driving. He's out with the boys. That's what's going on. So now, just a quick reminder, as all the judges have to uh, watch this replay about six more times, they've used their one more time. That's it. They have to make a call now. So they got to go through all these runs as you watch these replays. They're looking for small mistakes, but there wasn't many. It was, uh, it was a great set of battles. And uh, we're going to throw it down to Cerise to chat with Booth and see, is he a little more excited? Is he a little more energetic? Or is he just as relaxed as when we saw him last? Cerise? All right, I'm gonna get in the car with Booth here because it's nice and warm. It's getting cold out here. <laughs> so um, that was really incredible. Watching the way that you were so quick to adjust whenever he was either on you or just like getting on your line was really impressive. So again, you're looking really confident. You're so happy, dude. I love it. How are you having feeling? Having a blast, having a blast. That was a lot of fun. Stoked to go one more time with the Eurofighter. That was a lot of fun. All right, cool, guys. Well, let's go check in with him. Honestly, both runs very consistent. Good job. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, let's go see what Voss has to say. All right, buddy, so it seems as though the adjustments that you've made to this car are working in your favor. Both of those runs were very consistent, very entertaining to watch. Again, how are you feeling? How's the car? So far, so good. I think we're smoking out the hood right now, so i got to figure out what that is. But uh, that felt great. I mean, I, I think the last run I did a little better. I definitely didn't chase him as good on the one more time, but uh, it was fun. Um, but a lot to learn still and try to figure out this car and why it keeps smoking on me. Yeah, Booth has a little bit more driving experience than you, but you still gave him a run for your money and his money. Sorry, his money. Great job. Guys, let's see what the judges have to say. Once again, give it up for these two drivers, please, and thank you. Thank you, Cerise. We have a decision, and this will be for a spot in the Final Four. Sean Booth gets the win. Sean Booth goes through to the final four. And just to explain that one, so it was a close one. You guys watched it, it was really close. Now here's where we were thinking. Sean is doing every single thing he can with a slower car to get aggressive proximity in the chase. The leads are pretty similar. They make errors in both areas, front and back of the track, but however, Voss has the pace in the car, and he doesn't get that proximity, so he is sort of playing it a little safer. So even though it was super close, again, we cannot go one more time again, Basically, what we got it down to was the aggression that Sean Boot. Sean Boot was not going to do that battle without being on the door. Voss sort of played it a little safer in the chase, meaning that throughout the run, he could have taken a bigger risk. He didn't take a bigger risk. It's close, very close, but that little bit of aggression from Sean Booth, especially through the first turn, just about pipped it for him. It's, it's all it comes down to at this point, right? It's what you can do with the equipment you have, how you can handle that car, how you can get it through the course, and then the proximity that goes with it. But... Yeah, Sean Booth did make a couple of sacrifices here and there, but it was for the greater good of the run. Whereas, yeah, and again, yeah. you know, it's, it's, he didn't, he knew he wasn't going to win by just being a car length behind. Right. He wasn't waiting for the other driver to make an error. He was putting himself in the danger zone that he could have made an error, and he didn't, and he stayed with him throughout the course. So it's very close, and it comes down to those fine margins, but Sean showing that tenacity that he wasn't going to back down, even though he had the slower car, shows that he almost showed up Voss more by having the faster car and not showing that aggression. Right. So it just exaggerated it a little bit because, you know, if you have a pro competition everybody's kind of at a similar pace at that point here we have to deal as judges with two very different machines there and we have to give them credit where it's due if they're driving a more difficult run which sean did because it's harder to stay close to a faster car so that's where the decision was again great driving from voss great driving from booth and it's a, it's a small margin but it was just enough to get booth into the top four yeah not easy i think you guys were just about to resort to rock paper scissors to make that call we were getting so. close we were getting, getting close. close but i think if you even heard the interview at voss he knew himself he could have done more he he probably got to the end of the course and said, oh, I've left this very late. I've left it very late to make a move here, yeah. and I've left it open. So he probably expected that to be the case. As we move on now to our first top four battle, this is the interesting part. If you win your next battle, you're going through to the main event tomorrow. So we will have a podium on the last chance tonight. However, getting through the final, whether it's going to be Margaritas or Carney, they're going to automatically, whether they finish first or second tonight, be in the main event tomorrow. So this is a very high pressure situation for both of these guys after battling through many battles today. Yeah, it's, uh, 
I mean, this, we're, we're into bragging rights territory at this point. Oh, for sure. And again, you got Margarita. As you said, he's, a, he's not a, a full-on Formula Drift pro guy. No. Going up against one of the guys that's been in Formula Drift for, what, 10 years now, 15 years? Very long time Dean Carney's been a pro. But he's also in his practice car, not his Formula <laughs> Drift car. So in this particular case, Margarita has more machinery than Carney. Yeah. Oh, we got a five-minute rule called already, and this is from Carney. So Dean Carney running back into the pits, having an issue with his car. So uh, we're going to call five. a problem? No. It sounds unusual, right? Really weird. He could be down two cylinders, though, and we're still in a fair matchup. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Dean running back into the pit area. Something up with that car. We'll keep you guys posted as best we can with the information we have. Yeah, but strangely, the Formula D driver goes into this battle with the lesser car. So this is what makes the LZ World Tour very interesting. A lot of these guys are used to their, you know, Dean has probably the highest horsepower car in Formula Drift, probably. 1,200, uh, yeah. 1,300 horsepower. And allegedly. Le allegedly. And... Uh, <laughs> he, might, he might even have more than that. And then it comes back to a situation where he now has to go into a battle against a guy who has more horsepower than him, which wouldn't happen ever in Dean's Formula Drift career. But Dean is very comfortable. He's a very, you know, as a legend of the, of the sport. So he's going to be using that experience. But it looks to me like if you look at the, we try and, you know, as, as announcers, even as judges, start to look at the way these guys are driving throughout the competition now that you get to this stage. So we start thinking that what have these guys done in the previous runs that we need to watch out for in this, where it might not have been an issue, it could be an issue now. For example, Carl Carney's initiation and transition to the first clip has been sketchy through a couple of uh, a couple of the runs. Margarita is the same. He's making a similar mistake. So this battle, if you watch the initiation to the first clipping zone, this is where both of these guys have been making all of their mistakes all day, and everything else has been pretty tidy and clean. Dean has been bringing a clinic in the chase position, but his leads haven't been strong. And Margarita hasn't had that proximity in the chase, but his leads have been pretty strong from clipping zone two onwards. So that's kind of the game we're playing now. You guys here can start to kind of maybe predict what's going to happen um, if we see any. But again, it looks to me like both of these cars very hooked up, struggling with the transition and the pace they're building from the initiation to clipping zone one. So let's hope they can sort that out at this stage. They've had enough runs now to figure that out. We won't be giving them any more excuses from the judging side because we know they can't just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So there's a spot in the final up for grads. Whoever wins this is going to be in the main event tomorrow and going for a podium tonight. So uh, I, I bet Dean has gone in there just to make sure everything is 100%. But it looks like he's good to go and he's staggering the start little bit too here so definitely an old an old pro game here you can tell that Dean knows he doesn't have as much pace as the other car so he's going to try and leave a little bit early and get that pace into the first corner expect it to be Dean doesn't want to lose that BMW through the first two clipping zones because I don't think he'll catch it again so this is going to be very interesting yeah this is a, an, an old dog and old trick staggering out like that lets you have a bit of a run-up but let's see if Margarita's out front Dean Making the right call on that staging setup, able to get back into that car. Big dive from J from Dean. Almost called him James Dean. Just with the dive, and then Margaritas getting out to those zones. But Dean Carney starting to paint the side of the car. He's he's in there. He's he knows he needs to keep that proximity. He's been chasing super well. And there we go. A little hip check. Margarita stays in and puts his foot down. Let's go. We're here to party. No spin outs. I don't think Dean Carney's not hit someone in any of the battles. And for some reason, he is, he's almost like a crutch for a lot of these guys to get through the last corner. Yeah. They go, oh, should I go back in the throttle? Dean's like, yes, you're going back in the throttle. <laughs> so I got to say, from Margarita's point of view there, that was a pretty big hit. And it was, I'm not sure, was he off throttle? We'll watch this on the replay. Through the first corner, Margarita does a a lot of slowing into that clip one. That's why Dean sucks up so close to him. And as they come up the hill, you can see this is a good lead run at the moment for Margarita. Dean is so close, though. And this is dangerous for him. He's really in the pocket. He's, he's giving the Margarita makes any error here. Dean's into the side of him. And right here, it looks to me like Margarita doesn't come on throttle until very late, meaning Dean just pushes him onto throttle. So we expect the driver to be on throttle as they get to the clipping zone. It looked to me like Margarita's gone on throttle just after the clipping zone, which would be a mistake on his part. But Dean was basically saying that whether you stop or go, I'm just going to go through you anyway so I, I feel like you know there's a lot of guys around the world but mostly in, in the US on a Saturday polishing their Viper yes. you know doing that third of using the Grios getting that like a little bit of polish and shine and Dean is out there just hitting everybody with his car so um, an interesting one and Margarita's I think is calling a five-minute rule that I would imagine is down to that contact just to make so. sure that the rear wheel is okay that the alignment is okay yeah and um, validating know, Dean Carney's yeah, well, insurance they, well they, you know they, we nicknamed, nicknamed him Carnage in Ireland a long time ago. Ah, and, so that uh, came over with it him. Did, it didn't come out of nowhere. Okay. It wasn't okay. like a name that just rhymed with his name. It was very apt. So, uh, yeah. But again, he's here this weekend. This is not a Formula Drift event. This is a fun event, and he's putting on a show for the fans. And that is exactly what we all want to see, is someone pushing people around, hitting the doors, you know, 
putting a, this is not just a little demo this is about showing that you will take a risk and do all that stuff and I, I think it's great to see it's been a really entertaining and fun weekend so far we obviously go to the main event tomorrow but um, both of these guys are going to be in the bands. Maybe Margaritas thinks Dean hit me really hard. Maybe he thinks that he's got the advantage. Maybe Dean thinks he's got a disadvantage. They're not going to know, and we're not going to say it right, right, but it looks to me like those guys are going to be in a situation where they still have to push 100% on the second half of the battle. Yeah, there's no givens at this point in time. And, and watching that contact, you know, Dean steered into it and then throttled into it. Like, realize that Margaritas is just going to keep driving. Is that, a, is that called rad -bilance? That That would be a, a rad, rad yeah. yeah. Well, it's when you're low on rad. So you need a, a, an injection of Rad. It's it's funny. That's the the same uh, vehicle that Rad Dan was built in. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's put together with pieces of Rad. Facts. Yeah. These are the facts that you yeah. come here for. He's like the six million dollar man, but like yeah. the six. They million. found all of the Rad they could, yeah. and then they just made a man out of it. Yeah. You, just, um, you, you put a Rad net in the in the Florida River, and then that's what you make. So now I'm gonna look at the rear end of the car just to make sure everything is okay. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a heavy hit. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's Dean definitely made contact. They both finished the run, so they're jacking up the car just to make sure everything's okay. I'm not sure if, if it could be a D bead, could be a wheel Ooh, broken, good call. could be an arm at it. You know, so it could be. A, and again, we have to look back at that on the replay. And we, it did look to me like Margaritas he kind of overshot the corner, had to come off throttle quite. And you see. That's okay if you're a car like they're two behind in Carney's case, because you can adapt to that. But right. he was so close on the door, anything that Margaritas did, Carney was going to hit him. And again, that's the risk reward. So we'll, we'll, we're not we're not full over with this battle at all. So we can switch back the other way, but we'll probably have a quick look back at that again towards the end. But um, you can see that this was a beautiful piece of tarmac when we started. It was. Now it is definitely. Yeah, it uh, spoiled. I would say it's better. Yeah, but you it's know more what? personality. I absolutely love it because this is a new track. <laughs> this is current raceway. It's been refurbished. It's a beautiful facility. I want to thank all the staff here for allowing us to come here this weekend and put on a show because it's a beautiful facility. Everywhere we walk around, it's it's a beautiful place to kind of hold a drift event. Everyone's got a great view of the track. All the fans can see every single corner. And um, looking back at it, you can see this is like what it's all about, right? Door on oh, door on no. door. No backing down. This is what we signed up for for drift. This is why we love this sport. Is like how many other you know racing series can you just do that and you get out and you like hug the guy and like dude that was so sick you just doored me. Yeah, so like, good. like this. Looking back on this replay, you can see Carney doing a great job of being. On. This is as much proximity anybody's done on this track so far. But he's in a no, sort of a real risk reward situation when he comes back. Watch the rear wheels of Mark oh. car. He's not pluming smoke at that point. So he's transitioned late and he's transitioned sort of on the clipping point. Right. So what we explain to the drivers in briefing is we want them to transition and be on power that they go through the clipping point on power. It looked to me like he washed through the clipping point and then went on power. So Carney's expecting him to go and he's not going. And Carney at that point, you know, from a driver's perspective, doesn't really know where he is on the track. He's just watching the lead car. So he's expecting him to go. So. You know, it could be six of one half dozen of the other. and It might not even come down to that by the end of the battle, but this is just me, my initial gut reaction. And sometimes you kind of just have to, you know, in your head say, that's kind of how I feel about this run. Um, but at the same time, it could switch right back around because Carney's Lee's run have been a bit sketchy today. Yep. So we could see this switch up very quickly. But remember, whoever wins this battle gets an automatic place tomorrow in the main event and also goes to the final for the bragging rights in the last the top 60 and has had so much more battle of practice than anybody else that's the, that's the best point i mean these these drivers that are whoever wins this is going to go into competition tomorrow with a huge leg up and that's what it's about because yeah. you, you want everyone to go in there even keel tomorrow so let's see what happens carney's going to be in the lead position margarita's in the chase second half of this one with the final on the line margarita's gives him a bit of space to let carney initiate probably watch his runs and margarita's a big dive before we get into outside zone one margarita straightens Ooh, maybe there was more of a mechanical issue than what he first thought, but he gets back into drift. Let's see what the rest of the run looks like, because there could still be errors from Dean Carney that could swap the tides. That's why I keep drifting, but Margaritas, I think, has a rear alignment issue. The way that car is moving right now is not healthy. Yes, yeah, something something has not gone right with the rear end of that car. And then from us, we're going to take a moment to discuss this. So if we decide that that car is broken then it comes down to whose fault was it that it was broken was it margarita's or carney and it might look like carney's initially or it might look like margarita's initially but we have to kind of have a look back at that and see what we think yeah could go either way but uh we're gonna get some initial thoughts here obviously and uh cerise is gonna sit down with uh, dean carney and see how things are going see how he's feeling and uh, what his luck is like this night so cerise how's everything going down there All right, now we were given a little bit of inside information that you were given the nickname of Carnage.
by your Irish gentleman not long ago. Sorry, very long time ago. Very long time, very long time ago. So you had a little bit of impact out there. You took a five minute. What did you discover when you went back into the pit? Uh, we took the five minute before the start of competition. I forgot to turn on the fans in the burnout box, actually. So when I pulled up on the line, it was at a 260. So that was the only reason why I called the competition five. Um, I, think, I think the impact happened on the last corner because I was waiting for him to pick the throttle up and... Uh, I decided if he wasn't going to pick it up, I'd pick it up for him. So, let's go. <laughs> but you came out with vengeance. That was insanely fun to watch. Well done out there. Thank you very much. That was a blast. All right, let's go check in with the doctor himself. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. When you went back into the pits, did you discover anything crazy? There was a little bit of impact with Mr. Carnage himself. What did you discover? So we have a little bit more toe, uh, mechanical grip from Dean Carney, my buddy here, pro driver, you know, it's awesome to drive with such a good drivers, but something happened with my throttle, so we need to go and see what's going on with the car and fix this. That's why my initiation was a little bit weird, it was stuck in 4,000 RPM, so I'm so sorry, but I try my best. Okay, we love the humility. That was still really aggressive driving. You're still driving with one of the most powerful cars out here today. Well done. Everybody give it a round of applause. Well, we have a decision, and it's for a spot in the final between Margaritas and Dean Carney. And going through to the final from our decision is... A little bit of tension. A little You're bit of tension. You're killing me here, man. And the winner is... Dean Carney. Dean <laughs> Carney gets the win and goes through to the final. Guys, give him a round of applause. So, got to explain that one pretty quickly. So, it looks like Dean Carney hits Margaritas. Margaritas has an issue with the car, and that sort of costs him an issue on the second run. Right. So, what we have to go back to is go, right, we go back to that impact of what happened. And Dean alluded to it a little bit. And obviously, from his opinion, is what happened. But from our watching of the replay, Margaritas comes too fast through the in inside of the track. He's on big pace. When he transitions back, he knows he's going to wash off the edge of the track. So he comes off throttle to let the back of the car grip as much as it can. And as it's gripping, he should be on throttle. He should be on throttle before that zone. That's what we explained in the driver's briefing. But he's completely shut off. Therefore, Dean is expecting him to go on throttle to get up on the door, put on a show. He doesn't move. Dean hits him. And Dean's momentum, actually pushes him back onto throttle. <laughs> so basically, Margarita's at fault for the, the for the hit. It's right in front of us. You can see it straight as, straight as an arrow. And Dean, obviously, they both get across the line. It's fine. But Margarita's, whatever issue he had with the car, was caused by his own slowing in that position. So if Dean was at fault, we would have had a look at it differently. But we definitely thought Margarita's just had slowed up a little too much. Nothing sinister, nothing too crazy. He just had a little checkup. If Dean was two car lengths behind, he would have got away with it. But because he was on his door, Dean went straight into him. So that's the decision on that one. And we move to our next final four battle. Carney's in the final. And we've got Sean Booth against TJ Hunt. I know there's a lot of people here that are looking forward to this one. Yeah, no, this is going to be good. And this is really the first time that uh, Booth has been driving against a car that has less power than he does. So it's going to be a bit of a change up for him. He's going to have to change tactics a little bit, but should be good. It'll be a fun little rivalry going on here with TJ out front, Booth behind him. So let's just see. Good initiation from TJ, nothing crazy there, but Sean Booth starting to reel him in, starting to dive in, closing that proximity. TJ on a really nice wide line, using every single horsepower that he has got in that car. And Sean Booth, I was expecting him to be right on his door at this point. Let's see what he does in the last zone. There it is. Sean Booth, a quick little tap, adding a little red to that white livery. And not bad, not bad. It's a good run. I mean, this again, mostly with judging, you, you have a time to consider your thoughts, but I'm announcing, so I say them as I think them. But it, to me, it looked like you're right in what you said, it, that I would expect Sean having the horsepower advantage to be much more aggressive. I mean, he won his last battle by being aggressive, but this gap of two, three car lengths with TJ is almost inexcusable for Sean at this point because TJ is on the correct line. Now, TJ's not on a massive amount of angle and he's kind of barely on those zones in the lead position at times, but Sean takes all the way to this point of the track to actually get in the mix and get up on his door. So Sean does claw back some points for me here of getting aggressive towards the end. But uh, TJ doing everything he can do in the lead position. The question is, does TJ have the pace at all to stay with Sean Booth? And if he does have that pace, he's going to have to sacrifice some angle. So if he is going to sacrifice angle here, TJ, he's got to be really close to do it. Otherwise, it's a deduction from us. So let's see which way it goes. Right now, it looks to me like it's very in the balance. Sean not taking advantage of the situation. So let's see what happens. Nick Swan's going to give him a word and we are looking for another finalist. Sean Booth really swinging the back end out there on launch. 
Solid initiation with TJ struggling a little bit there, but able to use the momentum of the car to swing it back around. Really expert move in driving a lower horsepower car. Sean Booth starting to stretch the legs of that RB and separate out. And then TJ using the timing a little bit better to suck back in. TJ is playing this really smart. When it comes to chasing in a lower horsepower car, this is it's a pretty good example as to what you need to do. You need to time things a little bit differently. You need to be a little bit later. So whether or not that is enough in the judges' eyes to bring this through and give TJ the win, I'm not entirely sure of because Sean had a decent lead run. He did miss a couple of sections there. He goes a little bit wide and then he goes a little bit shallow and he's kind of inconsistent throughout the zones. And TJ basically just using any spot where there's a transition to dive back in and get the proximity back together. So Sean does have a really nice little ending there. We get the fist bump out the window, waiting for the door taps. And uh, Cerise, how did uh, how TJ feel about that run? All right, everybody, and we're back with TJ. And TJ, you stayed in the competition this far. This is not the day that you wanted. You wanted to be out here in your Supra. You're out here in your Z. It's kind of like ebb and flow, but like you've had some really fire moments today. What's going on? Yeah, uh, you know, like I said earlier, this is uh, stock car. So we're just giving it everything we have. Uh, and I've driven tons and tons with Booth. He's an amazing driver. He's fast. He's quick. He has big commitment. So we were talking there before them. We're like, hey, whoever wins this is going on to the next battle. Whoever loses has one more chance. So let's just bring it to him and bring a good show. Your energy is so contagious right now. I'm just smiling listening to you talk because you have such great energy and you're having a great time. That's what matters, right? Let's go check in with Booth and see how he's feeling, okay? All right, Booth. I'm coming back in because it's it's getting cold out here and this is nice. Okay, so you've known TJ for a very long time, yeah? Yeah, a couple of years now. Like two, three years. Okay, you've had a pretty consistent event and you're still in this. One of you gets one more time. One of you goes to tomorrow. How are you feeling right now? Anything different? No, just chilling. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Sorry for hitting you, Teej. <laughs> it's like light work for this man. Okay, I'm going to let you get your heat back. Let's go see what the judges have to say. Thanks, Cerise. We have a decision locked in for this battle, and the decision is it's a one more time. One more time between TJ Hunt and Sean Booth. A one more time between both of these guys. So they get back in the car, and they go back at it again. We don't have a finalist left, so it's a one more time. So from our perspective, we looked at both runs, and the zones missed in the lead run from Sean. The zones missed in the lead run from at TJ, and then in the chase position, not a huge amount of proximity consistently through the track from either driver. I would say that Sean maybe not taking advantage of the fact that he has a little bit more go in the car, but doing TJ not doing any more than him either. So I think we're going to see them go one more time. I think it's the fair call. Our gut feeling was there was nothing stand out from lead or chase for both drivers that would be comfortable for us to say that's the best thing we've seen from those two runs. So, yeah, we've seen better leads and chases from both of these guys throughout the competition. That was in their finest moments. So I think giving them a fair chance to go back at it again, prove their worth and give an honest uh, finalist would be the way I'd look at it. So that's kind of what we thought about it. Um, you know, we're being very casual in our expectations, our explanations today. But yeah, sometimes you watch him run and you go, I didn't like that lead. I didn't also like that lead. And the two chases weren't that spectacular. So Sean had a moment where he got really good proximity towards the end of the run. But then he lost so much proximity at the start of the run that it kind of balanced itself off. That TJ had the same kind of pr proximity the whole way through, but nothing spectacular. So yeah, happy to see these guys go back at it again. The legendary Nick Swan taking a break. Sitting on his feet all day. I, I get it, but... Yeah, if you're here in uh, current Raceway, can we get a big round of applause for Nick Swan on the start line? He's been out there since this morning keeping this track running. Give him a big shout-out. <laughs> Nick Swan just taking his first sit-down for the whole day. Also, a big shout-out to all of our marshals, our fire crew, EMPs, everybody that's here keeping the track moving, safe. Every single cone that's been knocked over all day. These guys have been running since this morning. So give them all a big round of applause. These are the unsung heroes of these events. And... Uh, I want to also thank everybody in the production team making yeah. all this live stream happen, guys. It's a tough gig. These guys take it very seriously, and it isn't easy. You know, you come to a new venue. They've never seen this place before yesterday, and they've got to make a full production and make it look as professional as possible. And if you guys are watching on the stream, I'm pretty happy that uh, you guys are going to know that this is high-quality stuff. And these guys are just throwing this together, looking for extension yeah. needs, looking for There's power. wires yeah, everywhere. Just, it is. 
built on tape and cable ties, this entire production. I, everything here on the ta table is just tape, so <laughs> pretty good. As I said, and our, uh, big thank you to our judges, Sean and Jason, as well. I've been watching the action all the way through the day, and it's a, we've had a tough day as judges, I think, guys. We, it's not been easy. There's been a lot of weird stuff happening on track, and we've got to react in the fairest way possible to situations that aren't. And a lot of the time, when you're judging two drivers that are very similar and the runs are very similar, that's an easier way to judge than when there's big mistakes because you're trying to weigh which is a bigger mistake. And again, we've had a couple of one more time moments just today where we've seen opposite, you know, drivers doing the opposite mistakes and you're trying to weigh it up. It's like a big seesaw. But um, we're pretty happy that we think the fair call won. And again, what's nice about this is that we don't take it too seriously. So when we as judges and the rule books say Jeff Jones is impeded, Jeff Jones can decide that he wants to run it again and he can. That's the beauty of it. We can just fantasy ballot and keep going and you don't get that, you know, that awful feeling at the end of the day when something didn't work out the way you wanted it to work out. So this is all about showcasing the sport to new fans and keeping it fun and mixing a bunch of characters in that pit area that would never be pitted beside each other. And for some guys this weekend, it's been a dream to just get up, wake up, get in your car, have a look across. So there's Adam LZ, there's TJ Hunt, there's T-Pain, there's Hurt. This is, you know, for guys starting off in the sport, a yeah. huge moment for them, like life changing. So it's awesome to see it happen and everybody's smiling all day and everybody in the crowd smiling all day. And we're only halfway through. We're not even at the final today, but tomorrow is the main event. We've got some fantasy battles. We can basically make up yeah. what we want to see at a drift event. I would we love don't to, have know. to be like, wouldn't it be cool if we just do that? We don't have, and nobody tells us any, like we can't do it. I we, think I think we just leave it to the comment section. I mean, I think if you guys, yeah, what do yeah. you guys think? Like honestly, like what if fantasy you, battle with this roster? What do you want to see? Yeah, you guys know who's driving here today and tomorrow, and you guys can in the comments let us know what you think, and we might just say, hey, that sounds like a that. good idea. Yeah. Let's just do that, which we would never get to do at any other event. So. Yeah. It looks like we have got Sean Booth and TJ Hunt arriving back up towards the start line for there one more time. Fresh tires, some fuel on the cars. And, uh, you know, TJ Hunt this morning, very disheartened because his Supra wasn't working, saying, oh, i got to drive to 370. There's not much I can do. The car is underpowered. I'm going to be wiped. There's Formula Drift drivers falling around all over the place. There's just so much talent in the pits. And it goes to show, you know, what's, it, what's the phrase he uses? Don't stop moving or keep moving forward? Keep Something moving like forward. That. And he's like, well, he's kept moving forward through the whole bracket. So yeah. you can come here in a stock 370Z, and if you've got the willpower and you've got the, I suppose, the mindset, you can get your way all into the main event. And Sean Booth in a very similar position. You can see him. He doesn't even want to get out of the car. He's so yeah. chilled. He's like, ah, oh, such effort to get out of the car. I'll just chill here and just relax, and it's fine. So you've got two guys here that are, you know, and we know them from the content, but when it comes to actual straight-up competition, they're well able for it. They've got the right mindset. And hopefully in this set of battles, we see these two guys give us what we want, which is good, clean drift and a little bit more aggression. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. I mean, they, they got their notes. You know, they obviously heard what you guys said, and we're going to see if they can change tack a little bit and see what turns into this battle. So TJ out front, Sean Booth following in behind. Let's see as they dive in. There we go. Sean Booth getting a lot more aggressive right off the bat. Took those notes and running with it. TJ getting out to those zones. We talk about low horsepower, but whoa, Sean Booth timed that one nicely. Almost took his front bumper off to match the rear. And TJ just, just putting in a solid lead run. Could have been a little bit deeper in a few zones, but yeah. John Booth is like, you want aggressive? You know, Let me show you. When you give the judges a moment of woe, you're, you're on a good thing. Yeah. And that was a moment of woe from Sean Booth. So we were expecting this from the first battle they had. Sean has got the pace. He's got the aggression. And TJ does a great job. This is actually a much better lead run from TJ, allowing Sean to get much more aggressive. This transition right here is absolutely incredible. He actually, halfway through the transition, hits the front brake to just push <laughs> the nose back. That is something you won't see some of the best drivers in the world be able to do. Yeah. So that is an incredible move. And TJ gave him everything to work with. And TJ, you know, to be honest, that's the best lead run he's done all day. So, to be honest, where we're sitting right now, big advantage to Sean Booth, even though TJ was spot on. However, TJ's got to be sensational. He's got to throw caution to the wind. He's up against it here. So if TJ wants to win this battle, he's got to probably throw every bit of his common sense out the window. They got still one more battle after this as well. So winner moves on. Loser still gets to battle for a spot. So. TJ doing his best there, but Sean Booth is just throwing it down. He knows. He knows what he's got to do to win, and TJ is able to reel in the see for what he does here. Uses the transition to suck back in, going front wheel to rear wheel, and then again, TJ getting real aggressive. All the limiter. I don't know if you know what car is oh, on the limiter. And contact across the There we the go. Line. 
Do you know what? We're so oh. happy up here that we called that as a one more time because regardless who wins or loses here, that's what they wanted to show all day. That was the best lead in chase we've seen throughout the entire day. And TJ, at this point, I thought, oh, it's all over its curtains. But he does everything he can with the lesser horsepower to get back in the mix. But Sean Booth's lead run was pretty sensational, too. I, I, to prove how stock this is, you can see he's still got the dash and the doubled-in display going. He's probably watching Tokyo drift at the same time. But look at that. TJ, you can see how pumped he is. And then little little kiss goodbye. Awesome driving. Oh, awesome. I love it. Awesome driving from both these guys. Cerise, they must be pumped after that one. That was definitely the battle of the day so far. That was absolutely insane driving. I noticed that Booth has a little decoration on his door now. Bro, I, I know that this car, you're like, you're talking shit about this car, but it's a great car for you. You look really... Man. Give it a go, guys! Woo! I'm hyped. I'm hyped. Like I said, Booth is like... We go head to head all the time, and uh, I, I mean, I'm just so stoked to get here and just like have a chance to put it on his door. And he got one on me, so I return the favor, baby. Let's go, baby, let's go. You're not making it easy for these judges. I mean, that one more time, all of us in the center here were like, I don't fucking, I don't, I don't know. Wow, well, thanks, boys, for that call. <laughs> all right, let's go check in with Booth. Well done, man. Booth off track. He's right here. All right, we got a little drip bitch happening. We'll figure that out later, dude. Oh my god. I was just telling TJ, like, okay, first of all, I love the little decoration. I think you kind of like it, too. Yeah, I do. Okay, good. No, honestly, you guys did it one more time. You're not making it easy for these judges. I mean, you're really showing some close proximity, really consistent driving, at least in my opinion. All of us were like, dude, I don't even know. So. That's what it's all about, trying to drive as hard and consistent and as cool as it looks, you know? I got to be honest, seeing you, like, get out here and progress from last year to this year to everything has been one of my favorite stories, and I just have so much fun watching you. So, well done. TJ is exceptionally proud of you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Of course. All right, guys. Let's go see what the judges have to say. Let's get this over with. All right? Let's go. Yeah, so we got a decision. Three, I mean, these guys are pumped up. One of the best battles we've witnessed this weekend. But we have got a decision, and going through to the final to take on Dean Carney will be... And the loser will go up against Margarita's third and fourth. And the winner is Sean Booth. Sean Booth gets the win, goes through to the final to take on Dean Carney. And I think if you're a Drift fan and you watch that, you'll know why. That aggression on the chase run, he just gave us all that wow moment. He took a risk. It paid off. He had incredible proximity. Got to give hats off to TJ Hunt. You can't have a good chase without a good lead. And that's what TJ gave him. So, you know, uh, TJ did a great job. He'll go up against Margaritas again. I mean, it's pretty common for TJ to be in the underpowered car. And then Booth will go up against Carney. So you got a Formula D driver against an amateur driver <laughs> in the final. That's what it's all about here at the LZ World Tour. Yeah, what a great set of battles that we're going to see next. Yeah, Dean Carney, Sean Booth, love it. Love two very aggressive drivers, great chase drivers. They're, like it's it's there's going to be contact, and then. But the, but the thing is, we we know Booth and Carney are without doubt, regardless of who wins that battle in tomorrow's main right. event. So but it's however, just bragging rights. Yeah, Margaritas and TJ. Only one of those two are going to go through. So that's the most important battle in a way of who gets through. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some tires, we're going to get some fuel, we're going to take a breather because by, by two minutes, three minutes time, we're back with the last two battles of the top 16, last chance, because we got the final between Carney and Booth, and we got third and fourth between TJ and Margaritas. Don't go anywhere. Here's some words from our partners. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you in a few.
top of the line ECU, internal wideband, deep throttle control, all the motorsport functions, you can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer. Which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those features I have thanks to Link ECU. That's all I need. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely a big shout out to Link ECU. Tire Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tires, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back live here at Kern Raceway. It's been an amazing day so far. We got two battles left, and I'll tell you what, right now, carrying the hot streak into this, we got a final coming up between Dean Carney and Sean Booth. And to me, Sean Booth is the one on fire right now. His last run was incredible. We were kind of waiting for it all day because we watched it in practice, but he brought it when he needed to bring it. Took out TJ Hunt, and TJ will go back up against Margaritas in a third and fourth place playoff. Now, the winner of that will go through to the main event. The loser will unfortunately exit the competition. So even though we've got a final for bragging rights, the third and fourth is just as important because that could be the end of the weekend for one of those drivers. Yeah, it's arguably more important. I mean, bragging rights are one thing, but getting to drive again tomorrow. Yeah, <clears throat> and everybody who's been knocked out, because it's an LZ World Tour, everybody jumps in in, tr in, the, in the practice session and the fantasy battles tomorrow. So even exactly. if you get knocked out, you guys in the comments on YouTube, we've been checking them out. Some people want to see, see some. We see you. We want to see some battles. You guys are putting some names up there. We're taking note of what we want to see, because that's the beauty of this. We make it up as we go along. This isn't a professional series. This is just for fun, yeah. and that's what it's all about. So you can take it seriously if you want, but you're missing the point. It's all about having a good time, and you can see the smiles on faces both in the audience and on the you know every driver here is having a good time whether they win or lose it's been an amazing experience cool track and this is a new track for drifting so it's opened up some doors locally for this track and how events run and again this track layout you never know could be used for a lot of local events in the future so trying to bring that love to to the west coast a little bit and of course not too many circuits right in the middle of la but everything's out you know it makes sense right you, yeah. if you have a race circuit you see what it's like around the world now everybody's giving out about race circuits but it's nice when they're in the countryside a little bit far out for everybody to travel but you get to do awesome stuff there because you know you don't have all the nosy neighbors giving out all the time right only neighbors here are like you know they have wings orange and they trees. fly around and the orange yeah. trees and no orange tree has complained at all this weekend Not that I've heard. although margaritas's car probably shook a few oranges off the tree <laughs> it's got that much noise in it but tj is warming up his tires in the burnout box margaritas is going to come with a lot more horsepower but then you got to look at tj hunt he's been very consistent he's not been making big errors and he's had a really tough battle with Sean Booth, which he gave it everything he got. And Sean Booth going up against Carney in the final. And I'm, I'm thinking, you got to look at Dean Carney and say, you know, he's been kind of scraping through a couple of these. He's been doing it in the right way. He's been being really aggressive in the chase. Right. But when Booth turns it on in the chase, they're very evenly matched. So I think that's going to be a really good final. And it's amazing to see, you know, an amateur driver like Sean Booth, who's got all the talent in the world, and he doesn't always have all the power in the world. But I don't think it's going to matter with Carney in his practice car. That's going to be a very even bout. Dean, though, a constant pro, which means that even if he's not having his best day, he can do enough to win. And that's what a lot of the big name drivers will do. They might not have the perfect setup, the car not, it might not be working, but they still somehow edge their way through. 
and it's uh, you know when in soccer terms it's the one nils. So you just enough mm. to win, the, just enough to win the match. You don't win seven nil, you just win one nil. But I think if Carney goes up against Booth, the way Booth is driving, he's not going to be able to do that. Booth looks like he's on fire right now, so I'm looking forward to it. It's hard to beat a guy that's that relaxed, right? When somebody's that calm, having fun, banging doors with their buddies, like. It's, it's hard to beat a guy like well, that. Well, you got to also look at it from another perspective. Carney's got a reputation here of being a pro driver. Booth right. doesn't care no. at all. He's just having fun. So it does actually have an advantage for Sean. When he, if he loses, everyone expects him to lose. Right, because If he Dean wins, Carney. he's a hero. Where Dean losing, it's a bit of an upset. So that can play into your mind a little bit when you can make mistakes, unforced errors because of that stress. But we're on to the start line. Third and fourth place playoff. As I said, one of these drivers going through to the main event. One getting eliminated. It will be TJ Hunt in the stock 370 as the high higher qualifier, which is interesting. So Margaritas has got to get into that chase position right away, and here we go. All right, TJ at the gate. Margaritas has got to be very careful not to get too aggressive and plow into the side of him. TJ, I think he turned up the nitrous because that is the quickest we've seen him come out of the gates and out to the line, and Margaritas dialing in slowly, being very, very calculated on how he wants to do this through the transition, surges again forward. TJ doing a great job out in the lead. Margaritas has struggled in this sector a few times now, but cuts out that zone so he can get door to door. Now, Ooh. this is going to be interesting All because right. I'm, going to, I'm going to have to look at this on the replay, but from an instant, he's hitting TJ aggressively. Does Margaritas' rear wheels pass the finish line before his front wheels? That's the initial reaction for me. I'm judging, so I shouldn't be saying it out loud. But to me, TJ does a great job. Now, Margaritas has a faster car here, so to not be up on the door, at this point, he's probably thinking, I haven't done enough at this point. But it's all going to come down to this last corner. TJ does a good job in the lead position. Margaritas transitions behind. Now, Margaritas starts to force the areas on the inside of the track. Watch the contact. There's one, two, three here. One hits the front wheel, then he hits the front wheel again. And there, to me, it looks like the back wheels may go across the finish line before the front wheels, which if we look at that again later on, to me, from a different angle, that could be the tail of the tape here. So that was just my initial reaction when I watched it. I would blame Margaritas for the impact there. Yeah, He's definitely hitting the front wheel, which is a no-no in drifting. So TJ is trying to hold on to the steering wheel, and Margaritas has hit him. So second run to go. They're going to throw it down, but we're going to come back and have a look at that afterwards. Make your own judgment decisions in the meantime. Here we go. Bit of a jump there from TJ. Great idea, great move. Let's see, he knows he's got a little bit of an advantage, but he can't just get walked away. Margaritas is gonna get super aggressive with this, and TJ, using that momentum and floating the car into that first outside zone. Phenomenal move there, where Margaritas now needs to get on the throttle. He needs to start walking away, and he's not gonna do that with left foot. Brago and a great transition from TJ. That timing was phenomenal. Wow, what an that expert is, move. That is a man that has no regard for Holy. that car. That was He's got insane. all night to fix it. That was insane. Wow. That transition was absolutely insane. And, and I, I thought just as he was coming to the transition, he's got this wrong. And I don't know how he got away with it, but it was phenomenal. So this is strange. You can see TJ has better proximity at this point of the track than Margarita's had the other way around. And TJ now really starts to force the issue on the transition. Watch the left foot breaking for Margarita's. Sucks TJ in and he transitions just <laughs> on the bumper and <laughs> makes it work. So that is a phenomenal move from TJ Hunt. Um, Wow. Incredible, incredible. And you know, I'm gonna have a little talk with my judges about it, but let me let me see what we come up with a decision. Sirius, can you just tell us how TJ did that? Can you teach us? I need a YouTube how-to on, on how to transition like that. All right, TJ, that was a fantastic use of momentum out there. Now you're going against Margaret, who has a pretty significantly more powerful car. You were talking about how you were giving it everything that you had, pulling out all the stops. I think you've kind of done that. I don't know how many times more we can do this interaction I here. Either. I don't know. Yeah, um, giving it everything and uh, just trying to put on a show and hopefully it can bring us to the end here. Okay, cool. yeah. If we have to do one more of these, I'm having you do like a knock knock joke or something because we got to break this up. No more, no more. I'm so tired. He's so tired. All right, let's go check in with the doctor again one more time. Come on, guys. Everybody give it up for these two drivers. All right, now, Margaret, is, I was just telling. TJ, now you have a significantly more power car. I was a little bit more surprised that you weren't in closer proximity when you were chasing. Now, how are you feeling about the car? Uh, we know with TJ, we have drive so much. He's fucking incredible driver. Like, sorry for my English, but he's so good. Like, I mean, my 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 guy, he's like, you need to go very close. Like, he's very consistent. He's very good. I'm so proud of you. Like, like sorry, that's your will for a little bit. <laughs> that was awesome. 
was it was it was it was very good. Like I can do that all day with him. Like we we can drive so much, and he knows this car. He I think he mastered it. So thank you guys for staying so late. We appreciate all of you. Everyone, this has been a very long day. Thank you for being here. I agree, dude. We can't keep doing this, guys. Please, are you putting us out of our misery? Or what are we doing? What are we doing? Oh my God! So oh, we no have got time. a decision. Let's get this done. We have a decision. Taking third place here today at the Last Chance Top 16 is TJ Hunt. TJ Hunt takes third place, goes through to the main event tomorrow. And you know what's funny? We were having a good look at that, whether the rear wheels went across in front. How are you feeling? Good? Yeah, this is why, this is why I love it. Uh, it's like, you know, there's just incredible drivers out here. Everywhere, everyone here I look up to as a driver, I'm watching everyone since I was a kid, and they come out here and not the car we wanted, but to still just like giving it our all and being able to pull it through and just trying to push every ounce out of it and to get it done is just like it's just, it's everything. It's like why you waste so much of your energy into this sport. I'm just so stoked. And now I get to talk to you even more tomorrow. Oh God, oh. against FD cars, yeah. Okay, well done. Get back in your car. Get out there. Bye, guys. Thanks, Cerise. A big reaction from TJ Hunt. Give it up for TJ Hunt to take a third step on the podium here today. And Margarita's taking fourth valiant effort from him as well. And yeah, we were just looking back on it. It definitely was a zero out for rear wheels pass. But even at that point, we didn't know. It re like, if we didn't have that decision, TJ still would have got the win, no matter what happened at the end of the run. That was probably one of the best chase runs we've seen all day. And I think if you look at Sean Boots' chase run and his transitions and TJ's showing that you don't need a ton of horsepower. You just need a ton of bravery to win battles. And that's what this is all about. And I mean, I don't know where they find uh, the cojones to do this stuff on track, but uh, it's good to watch, and that's what it's all about. So we have one more battle left. It is our final battle of the day. Dean Carnage Carney against Sean Booth. You never would hear these statements no. if it wasn't for this series, but uh, now we're about to see what happens. If an amateur driver in an S15 with an Orbi can take on a V10 Viper, and that's just the real world we live in now, ladies and gentlemen. And we are going to have a set of battles, see who takes home the win. Both of these guys will be back tomorrow. You know, whether they win or lose, right? Yeah. They're going to be back tomorrow in the main event. So will TJ Hunt. And I think it's been well deserved from him. He drove his heart out today. And I, that's why I love this last chance top 16. It gives, it's exactly that. It gives you a chance to go. And even if you're not up against the top top that day, you get to build the confidence. So TJ's going in there with all that confidence tomorrow going, well, I took down a ton of guys with power. I can take him down again. Yeah, it's he, the, the amount of confidence he's going to roll in with is absolutely incredible. And then same thing with these two drivers. I mean, win or lose, the confidence is going to be incredible. And that's it's such a powerful tool in competition, just to have that confidence feel to come in and be like, yeah, I just beat everybody, so let me do it again. Exactly. Well, we go to the star line. You can see Dean Carnage Kearney taking that staggered start again, trying to get up close and personal with Sean Booth on that first corner and here we go it's the final of the last chance top 16 who is going to get the bragging rights will it be booth in the lead carney in the chase all right let's see how this plays out carney getting real aggressive right off the bat sean booth laying it down though dean carney he is going to put that blue headlight in the side of that red s15 for the rest of this run checking the transitions more sparks into sean booth's car and there's dean carney right on him again last zone what's going to happen the classic Dean Carney, you're not going fast enough, so I'm going to make you. And all the way through the rest of the zone. Look at that. That is phenomenal. Little, little Tyler scrub right there, that right on the side of Sean Booth. You know what? I was just thinking halfway through that Sean Booth's lead run was exceptional. Carney's oh. chase was exceptional. And again, this is the closest anyone's been through the transition. Everyone's been waiting there. Carney didn't. He went straight for it from the off. Booth's on the perfect line. Look how high Booth goes on the bank here, just scrubbing along <laughs> those cones. But Carney is right there. Look at these transitions, just backing off a little bit. But Booth doing a great job. It's the best lead run Booth's done all day. It's definitely the best chase Carney's done all day. And they left all the sparks for the final. So look at this. Hand at the window. <laughs> door on door. That's what it's all about. Incredible stuff. California, you got to be loving this. This is incredible. From where we started today, well, you know, everybody a little tentative, everyone a little bit sketchy. We're now getting to the final. Remember, this is just a warm-up for I tomorrow. Know. And this is just and, round and one of we, four. Yeah, <laughs> if, we, if we have some of this tomorrow, we're going to have one hell of a show.
Well, there's one more run before we're done. It, Carney did a great job on the chase. Booth has got to bring the heat now. Got to bring the heat to the door. Got to get the proximity because Carney, while he's been sketchy in some battles, that was very solid. Now, let's see what happens. Watch Carney's lead. Watch Booth's chase. See how this one swings in the balance. Booth playing it real tricky, getting real tight, which, I mean, it worked out for him. Let's see if he can dive back in. Dean Carney, Booth hits hard. Oh, real aggressive. Oh, man. That's, that wheel is not supposed to go that way. That is, that is not how that's supposed to look. The nice thing is that at least Dean Carney's got about seven more Vipers, so quick trip back to LA. I'm sure he could have a new one, but... Oh, Booth definitely dove in there real hard. We are asking for replays now to take another look at this. If you have young children, please shy them away because that wheel is definitely crooked. So let's take a look here. Dean with a good initiation. Sean draws back a bit and then just guns it and then... No. So... What the judges are looking at right now is what happened with Dean Carney. Was he off throttle? Was he not accelerating? Was he going too slow? And then what happened with Sean Booth? I think we're going to have to, we might have to see this a few more times. Yeah. Let's see. Let's check. Oh, yeah. Just pull it straight. We're good. Fixed. Yeah. Problem solved. Good job. Yeah. So what we're looking at right now, just to give you guys an insight, is... <laughs> Dean Carney's return to throttle. So as they transition through, Booth is very committed. Did Booth go too fast or Carney go too slow? Ah, uh, that's... Dean almost looked like he was ready to over-rotate before Booth actually hit him. Look at... Ah, uh, it's so hard to say. He's definitely not on throttle. And it looks like he's almost... He's on the wrong line. Look at... He should have been deeper in there, and the car should have been a little bit more shallow. He's basically 90 degrees to the clipping point as they come across it. Yeah. So the judges right now, what they're talking about is what is happening with Dean's car. Um, it's very easy to look at this and go, oh, Sean Booth hit him. But watch what happened with Dean Carney's car. He is going, he's at too much angle. He's basically 90 degrees to the line that he needs to be on and then comes off throttle and potentially even grabs the e-brake to get the car settled back in, to get the car back online. So I don't know if this is Sean Booth's fault. This might have been Dean Carney. So the plot gets really thick here because was Sean Booth too aggressive or was Dean Carney slowing down too much? You can see Dean's wheels before they kind of fall into shadow get really slow. So now we need to decide who is at fault here, and then that will more or less figure out the final. Not how you want to end this, but Dean did find a way to get it back. I guess throwing it in reverse gets you back to the pits. So let's take a look here. Well, the judges are still back and forth as to what's going to happen. We've got some very beautifully <laughs> damaged cars. Both these cars came in this weekend looking incredible. Both of them leaving... Wrecked. Uh, a little, wrecked. a little less incredible. That's for yeah. sure. Everything's wrecked. Oh, well, Sean, Sean Booth handing, very nice of you. handing pieces of Viper back to, uh, to Dean Carnage Carney. Guys, once again, give it up for Dean Carney and Sean Booth throwing it all down on track for your entertainment. Remember that battle was just for bragging rights, ladies and gentlemen. They're both through to tomorrow, so all of that damage could have been avoided. All right, Cerise, how's everybody feeling down there? How's Dean doing? All right, I have these men exchanging car parts like party favors. That was a phenomenal end to this first day. I mean, what an incredible day one of the LZ World Tour. You, Sean's back. How do you feel? That was a little bit rough. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Sorry, Dean. <laughs> this, is, this is nothing new for you, though. Okay, you, you've done this one or two times, so your car's fine. Why, 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 did, why, why were you reversing back here? Uh, because this knuckle is broken. So it has some active toe going on at the moment, so it was easier to back it here than try to turn it around. Okay, all right, cool, cool, cool. Well, a little bit of drama didn't hurt your mama. So we're going to go ahead and hit up with the judges, see what they have to say. TJ, get over here. You're in this too. Come on. All right. Day one, all these gentlemen drove their hearts out, really. Every single one of you just overcame kind of a lot, but also kind of not really. You're just really good at driving. So judges, how are we feeling? What do we have for these gentlemen?
Okay, they're gonna take their time on this one. Actually, I understand that. This is a really hard call. As I said before, you guys have not made this easy for the judges. It's not a fun job to judge these events. You have to pick between phenomenal drivers. They're all friends with these guys at the end of the day, and these cars are really, really impressive. So I'm just killing time for you guys while you deliberate is really what's happening. We apologize, Therese. We've been we've been having a little deliberation up here about this one because it was a, it was a bit of a sticky situation to finish the event on. We want to make sure we made the right call. And we just want to give a big shout-out before we announce the winner. A big shout-out to third place, TJ Hunt. TJ Hunt taking third place here today on the Last Chance Top 16. He takes third position. And then we got the final. And it was uh, fireworks as always. So with Sean Booth and a man called Carnage, you expect it, and you got it. So that's what happened. Uh, didn't even finish the second corner, but it was uh, driving hard. And we're going to announce the winner of the last chance top 16 and that winner decided by our judging panel is sean booth sean booth gets the win and goes to our main event of bragging rights and a little explanation on that one is simply that it looked to us like dean just did not come back on throttle in as quick as he as he should have he washed a little bit sean hit him sean was full lock up on the brakes so if he's full lock up on the brakes and still hitting him we just deemed it from our side. It doesn't really matter because both can come and win the event tomorrow. But once again, a big shout out to TJ Hunt in third place. Second place for Dean Carnage Carney and the winner of the Last Chance Top 16, Sean Booth. Well, you know what? We had an amazing day, Jacob. It's oh. been awesome. And it's just the warm up for tomorrow. We want to thank everybody in attendance here in Kern Raceway. You guys have been amazing today. Hope you guys have enjoyed the action. Tomorrow, we go to our main event, Top 16. It's going to be fireworks. If today is anything to go by, we're going to have no voice. We're going to have, we're going to be lying on the ground by the end of it because these guys are pushing hard all the way from our amateurs to our celebrities to our content creators to our Formula D drivers. All in the mix tomorrow. I want to thank my judging panel of Sean and Jason. Jacob, thanks. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Happy Hope to you've had, had a lot of fun. Until tomorrow, guys, we got Fantasy Balance. we got the Top 16 main event. I've been Dave from Drift Games. We hope you've enjoyed LZ World Tour Day 1. Tomorrow we're back for Day 2. We'll see you guys bright and early.
the on ECU, internal wide band, ethyl control, all the motorsport functions, you can't beat it. So the Link PDM saved the day. So the next step was to get this thing on a proper ECU, especially with all the technology that Link has to offer. Which should give us full communication and full control over all the sensors. All those features I have thanks to Link to you. That's all he needs. Simple, cheap, easy, works, good ECU, weatherproof. It's got enough IOs too, like we're doing tons of stuff. Oil, fuel pressure, boost control. I like it. Definitely big shout out to Link ECU. Tire Streets is the official tire supplier for the LZ World Tour. And while everyone is driving on the 651 Sport this weekend, we also have tires for the trails, the track, rally, or just getting you to work on time. We get you affordable tires, fast. Plus, we offer the industry's only risk-free trial for tires. If you don't love them after 30 days, send them back no questions asked. Use code LZ for 15% off your first order only at TireStreets.com.